Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Thacker. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we are kicking off our Linux command line series. It's going to be a lot of fun. Going to learn a lot about Linux. And joining us in the studio, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizet. Don, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for coming today. Hey, thanks for having me, Daniel. And, you know, this is a really fun topic for me, you know, diving into the shell and actually getting things working. We've got a series coming up on bash scripting that's going to have a ton of really cool things that you can do that are all driven by the command line. So we need to know how to get in and interact with that shell, interact with the, the, the interface that we have to actually kind of talk right to the Linux kernel and get it to do some really neat stuff. And one of the things that I always try and remember is that in the Linux world, almost everything is developed from the command line first and then eventually gets a nice little GUI stuck on it, a graphical user interface. But if you just stick in the graphical environment, you're really limited. There's only so many things you can do. And when you pull those shackles off and you dive right into the command line, sky's the limit. So you can do so much stuff. So I'm excited to dive into it here in this episode and really the whole series to be able to see what we can do from the command line, how we can use it, and some of the neat utilities that are there that let us talk to that system. Well, Don, when we start talking about uh, terminals, right, the command line stuff, there are terminals. There's a little black box that pops up, and we type command into it, and we think, oh, that's, that's kind of vanilla, but there's a bit more to it than that, right? Yeah, you know, in, in, in the olden days, <laughs> where we had a, a mainframe or something of that nature, you would have a dummy terminal. And a dummy terminal was a keyboard and a monitor and when you sat down at it, you would just see a command prompt. You didn't have a graphical user interface. You didn't have a mouse. But on most computers these days, when you sit down at them, you actually get a graphical user interface. So that the terminal, the, the command line, is kind of hidden away behind the scenes. All right? So we need to know how to get to it. And, and fortunately, there's actually a number of different ways to get to it. Now, remember that Linux, whether it's running as a desktop or whether it's running as a server, it really is the same under the hood. There's a lot of operating systems that differentiate. You have Windows Server versus Windows Desktop, two different products. But in the Linux world, it's really the same. The big difference is that when you install Linux as a server, you normally leave the GUI off. So if you push the power button on a Linux server, on the screen you see the text-based terminal, the, the command prompt that you can jump into and start to work with. right? But if you do it on a desktop, you get a graphical user interface. Some people put a graphical user interface on a server, but you're not really supposed to, but, <laughs> uh, but you can. So either way, if we get the graphical interface, how do we get at it? Well, it's not that the text-based one is gone. The text-based one is just kind of hidden away. So let me, let me show you here on my laptop. So this is my laptop. I use it every single day, and so I have a graphical user interface on it because I, I, don't, I don't want to do everything from the command shell, although I do a surprising Quite amount a bit, of things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when I log in, it's graphical, right? So I can launch in here and I can browse my files and, and do all the different things that I need to do right here through a GUI. And that, that's great, right? But if I want to access the terminal, the, the command prompt is actually running in the background. I just don't see it, right? On most Linux distributions, you actually have usually about six text mode terminals that are running in the background that you're just not seeing. All right, they, they fire up briefly while the computer's booting up, and then the GUI loads and takes over from there. So I'm in X Windows, and uh, uh, the GNOME Window Manager is all kind of running and, and giving that GUI. If you want to see the text-based stuff, you, you can, but it's not as, as good as it used to be. And the, the main <laughs> problem with that is high-resolution monitors. So the monitor on my laptop, I forget my resolution, it's something like 3200 by 1800, something ridiculous it's like crazy. that. Crazy. <laughs> uh, and and high-resolution monitor, even, even like a 1920 by 1080 monitor these days, makes the terminal almost unreadable. It's let like a postage you. stamp on your screen. It's crazy. <laughs> it's really tiny. Yeah. Uh, so here, let me, let me pull mine up, and I, I'm just going to switch right over to one of my text mode terminals. So you're going to see my monitor blank out, and then there it is. Okay, I'm now in a text mode terminal, and it's asking me to log in. Now, how do I know that? Because if, <laughs> if you look, I mean, that is really, really small. It, I, I know for you guys in, in TV land, you're seeing this in, in the little boxed-in view. Uh, but even if you were to full screen it, it's really small. Even looking at my own monitor, it is really small. I can barely read it. And unfortunately, there's no way for me to adjust that without like really going in and re-engineering this terminal. You have to put in a giant font and all this other stuff. Uh, so it's not an easy way to do it. As a result, this is not how we normally access the terminal. If you do, if you ever want to do this, the keyboard shortcuts are um, Control-Alt-F1 
then it's usually control alt F1 through F7. And one of those will have the GUI, okay? Most operating systems today put the GUI on F1. So if I hit control alt F1, it should return me back to my GUI, all right? Some distros put it on F7 though, and you hit control alt F7 and there you go. Meanwhile, one through six or whatever ones are aren't used, those are the text-based terminals. So they're there, they're running, and you use them. If you ever lock up your graphical user interface and you're stuck, you can drop to one of those terminals and try and fix the problem. It's nice to have. If you also have a magnifying glass. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's not the normal way that we get into our, our command prompt, to get into that kind of session to talk to the Linux kernel. So instead, what we normally use is a terminal program. And there are a number of different terminal programs that are available. And what you'll find is that over time, you'll find one you really like, that you'll, you'll kind of bond with, you'll, you'll team up and be that's, buddies. That's like the Linux manifesto, right? Is do it the way you <laughs> like to do it. And there's many options on this smorgasbord of, of different things that do kind of the same stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there, there's no right or wrong answer here. Like, you need to find the one that works out the best for you. Now, uh, the best piece of advice I can give you is, don't just use what I use because, uh, yeah. you know, what I use is just what I like. Uh, and, and I get a little bit lazy sometimes. Not, not, not lazy as in I don't want to do work, but lazy as in I'm in a hurry and I want to get to a terminal as fast as I can. So there might be some flashy terminal that has a lot of bells and whistles that's awesome, but if it's not installed by default, I don't want to deal with it because I don't have time to install the terminal. I, I want to use something that's already there. So a lot of times I'll pick one that I know is not as feature rich. So. Don't, don't let me influence you. You need to find out what works for you. Or you might agree with me and say, hey, I only want to use stuff that's installed natively. I don't want to have to install extra packages to get to, to some crazy terminal. Now, when you install your Linux distro, it will have at least one terminal available. And so you can use whatever GUI you've got. If you've got Unity or um, I'm on GNOME here, or if you have KDE, when you bring up your menu and you just type in terminal, something's going to come up. Okay, now I have a number of terminals installed on my machine, so I see several choices, but you may only see one, right? It, it just depends on the distro. And the one that you'll normally have is this guy right here. He's called Xterm, right? The X Windows GUI is kind of the, the de facto standard for graphical interfaces. Now that's changing. We have a, a replacement for X Windows called, uh, or X Org is what that's actually called, uh, that's uh, slowly being replaced by a product called Mirror. And, or, sorry, not Mirror, Wayland. There we yeah, go. I'm going to get my, my managers <laughs> right. So, uh, so Wayland is kind of taking over. So you might not have Xterm in that case, in which case you have other terminals that might be available. But normally a distro will take some terminal and label it as just plain old terminal. Okay. Now, in a GNOME environment, that's actually linking to what's called the GNOME terminal. In a KDE environment, this would be linking to what's called console, which I actually have installed also, or console with a K is from KDE. But there are other terminals that are out there that you might see. All of them provide the same basic functionality, but then some of them add a lot of bells and whistles that enable you to do some really neat things. So if I were to launch into Xterm, that's the oldest one. That's the most basic terminal. And when I get into it, I see so the postage stamp. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, if I were to zoom in, I, I can read it now, right? But Xterm is really operating the same way as those text mode terminals in the background. It's just putting a, a GUI wrapper around that terminal. And I can get in and I can do some like set term commands to try and change the background color and, and other things to try and make it useful. But as far as the GUI is concerned, there's not really any options for me. There's not much of a menu here other than minimize and maximize. And even if I go up to the menu items up here, there's just quit. I don't get a lot of functionality with Xterm. This was the original graphical terminal that was made available, and so it's got a very basic set. So most of us aren't going to use that one. Most of us are going to use GNOME Term or Console if you're in KDE, but GNOME Term is, is really the most popular one. If you're running Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, uh, Red Hat, CentOS, all of those distros default to GNOME Term. Uh, Ubuntu is using the Unity window manager, but the Unity Window Manager actually uses GNOME Term as its terminal. So even though it's not GNOME, it's still using that terminal. So that's kind of the, the most popular one. And that's the one that I'm going to use for the rest of this series. So for the whole series, I'm going to be using uh, the GNOME terminal. But I want to walk you through a few of the other terminals here in this episode to give you an idea of which ones might be great or which ones might be lame. They or... get kind of fancy, don't they, Don? 
They really do. Some of them, some of them have some really impressive feature sets. So, uh, for example, let me just fire up real quick. Um, uh, just uh, we'll breeze through a few real quick, and then I'll, I'll do a deeper dive into some of them. So, for example, the the GNOME terminal. If I just fire up my terminal, this is the GNOME terminal. It's the default built one in. See, see how I got a nice big font? Well, it didn't have that by default, but I was able to change it because I've got all these menu options up here where I can tweak it. I can change the font size. I can change the colors. I can change what's being rendered. There's a lot that you can do. I love. That works out great. I love the fact that once you make those changes, a lot of these will have profiles you can create and say, "I want this to be my default profile," and that way. If I want to do different things, I can just load different profiles, and it's already preset for me. That is a fantastic option on newer style terminals like this. Yeah, and some of the other features they add really take advantage of the GUI. Like if I need more than one terminal open, I can open more than one window, right? You know, you can go up here to File and Open Terminal, and now I've got two terminal windows open, so I could run two different commands. But this one actually has tabbed terminals as well. Under that File option here, I had Open Tab, and so now I could have two tabs or three tabs, or four tabs, you just do Control-Shift-T, and I get more and more tabs. So I might run something like, uh, uh, maybe I run Midnight Commander, which I don't have installed. So let me install Midnight Commander. So I'm, I'm installing a program here, and while it's installing, I could jump over to another tab and be doing work. And then when I come back to the first tab, it finished installing, I can run Midnight Commander, so now it's running, and I can switch over to another tab and perform more work. And so I can take advantage of those tabs to do more than one thing all from right inside of the terminal. So that's kind of a nice feature to have that we didn't have in the older X term, or you definitely don't have in the, the text-based console if I do Control-Alt-F1. Although I could Control-Alt-F1, F2, F3, and, and move between them. That was the earliest form of multitasking, that you could run these full screen or locked applications that would lock your session and just switch over to another terminal and, and fire up more applications that way. So you had that functionality. Now, GNOME term is pretty powerful. But there's some things that it doesn't do that other consoles or other terminals might do that you appreciate. So, for example, um, I use one called Guake, uh, G-U-A-K-E. Guake is nice because it is built off of, it's actually modeled after the old video game Quake. Uh, in the video game Quake, it was one of the first video games that had a drop-down console. You could hit, I think it was tilde on the keyboard, and this little console would drop down from the top of the screen, and you could type in cheat codes. That was really all you ever typed. Um, for people like me that use a terminal a lot, I'm constantly going to the terminal. I don't necessarily want it to be a window that pops up like this. I would like it to just be something that I can quickly access. And if you install Guake, it's running in the background. I've actually got a little tool item, whoops, somewhere up here, uh, that shows it. Well, anyhow, it's, it's way up here, this little, little tool item. And I can hit F12 on my keyboard, and there's a, a console that pops up and I have that access. And so if I want to jump in and run something really quick, I can. And it's really handy if I'm out like browsing on the internet and I come across some tutorial, right? So uh, you know maybe I'm doing a, a Vim tutorial to learn some Vim commands. And so I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm reading about how to do something. And then I pull up that terminal. I run something real quick. I get it out of the way. And so just tied to my F12 key, I can make that pop up and come and go. So that's a neat feature. It's a different terminal, but I like it because it gives me some functionality that I don't have in the normal terminal. Right? Uh, another one that I use from time to time is Terminator. Terminator is a, a third-party terminal that's available in Ubuntu and Debian, Fedora. It's available in, in, in all of them. Uh, and it has a neat function in that it lets you split the screen. Right? In GNOME Terminal, I could do tabs. And if I had multiple tabs, I could have multiple terminals. But I couldn't see them both at the same time, right? If I wanted to see more than one thing at the same time, I could fire up Terminate. And with a simple right click, I can split horizontally or split vertically. So I'll do a vertical split. And now I've got two terminals side by side. And I could even come in and, and take one, and I could split it horizontally. And now I'm starting to lay these out where I've got all these different terminals. And that's handy because I might be running something like HTOP here. So I'm monitoring performance on my server. And then down here, maybe I'm doing a little journal CTL-F. And so I'm following my systemd logs, right? So now in the top left, I'm seeing system performance. In the bottom left, I'm seeing what's going on. And in the right, I could be doing my work. I could come in and I could say, well, you know, I, I need to restart some service. Uh, I'll restart, 
oh, I don't know, I'll restart my network stack, right? Why not? So I'll restart something, and I can see the log messages down here being generated as part of that restart, and I can see any CPU or memory activity that was you know, modified by it, and I can start to do more than one task. That's a pretty neat function, right? Being able to slice up your screen like this is, is not something I can do in GNOME, but I can easily do right here in Terminator. So that's where I go back to saying, like, when it comes to picking a terminal, there's a ton of them that are out there. And you need to find the one that you like best. These guys right here, they each have some kind of shining advantage to them, right? Terminator can split the screen, but it's not installed by default. I would have to install it if I wanted to use it, right? So if I'm in a hurry on a system, I might not want to install it. I might want to use something that's built in. But boy, slicing up the screen like this is pretty handy, right? Same thing goes for uh, Gwake. It's really nice to have that drop down from the top, but I have to install it and get it set up. It's not installed by default, so I might not want to deal with that. It's kind of a, a pros and cons type approach. You need to find out which one meets your needs. Yeah, Don, I really like the how it splits the screen for you because if you've ever tried to, and even if you come from a Windows background, you're like, oh, let me check out this Linux thing. Uh, it, you have the black screens and you're moving around. You're trying to you know, snap to this side, snap to that side, and try to get everything to look just like you like. Where if I'm just, okay, split this, split that, and it's kind of doing that for me. It takes a lot of the, the hard work out of it of, of getting everything lined up perfectly. And that kind of takes us into something else, Don, which we kind of alluded to, which was customizing these terminals. Uh, can you walk us through some of that customization? Yeah. So let me, uh, let me fire up my regular GNOME terminal again. And I want to show you guys profiles, right? Profiles, Daniel mentioned them earlier, mm -hmm. are, are a way that we can kind of customize our terminal and change the way that it appears and get it to suit our needs. The default profile for most systems is not something that I like. It's usually very small. It's, it's maybe not a font that I like. And so I usually do some customizations there that are part of my user profile. I, I bring it along with me when I sit down at a, a new system. So if I want to go in and, and take a look at that, uh, what we do is inside of GNOME, if you take a, a look at your menus up top, uh, or inside of GNOME Terminal, we can go to Edit, and under Edit, you'll see two options. There's Preferences and Profile Preferences, and that is a little bit confusing. Like, why do I have these two things that are very similar? Preferences, those are settings that affect the entire terminal, right? Uh, not just my little session inside of it. And the Profile Preferences, that's what affects my session. So let's start with Preferences and kind of see what's in there. You'll find that there's actually not a whole lot of options tucked away inside of this. So taking a quick glance at it, first I've got show menu bar by default. Well, I, I need my menu bar, that's where I have the options. But if you've memorized all the keyboard shortcuts, you might not need that menu bar. You can get a little more screen real estate. Uh, enable mnemonics, such as Alt F to open the file menu, right? Those are turned off by default because we might need to send Alt F to the program we're running inside of the terminal, right? But if you use those, you can turn it on. This is one that I usually turn off. Uh, this is on by default. Uh, enable the menu accelerator key, F10 by default, which means if you hit F10 and then the next series of keys you hit is being sent to the menu for the terminal. Well, there's a lot of programs like Midnight Commander that I ran earlier. F10 is the key to exit Midnight Commander. If it's mapped to the terminal, that's going to make it where I can't exit Midnight Commander, right? So <laughs> that'd be bad. Yeah, open another terminal and then... <laughs> yeah. You could. You find a way yeah. around it. Yeah. But it's neat that we can come in and we can change that. And then you've got, like, themes. So we can do the light theme or the dark theme. Uh, you've got shortcuts that you can define. You can override keyboard shortcuts to set them to different things. Maybe you just don't find the, the default ones very intuitive. Uh, the profiles I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and then the encodings, right? If you're here in the U.S., it usually defaults to UTF-8, which is... Probably what this one is at. Let's find out. Uh, yeah, UTF-8. But if you're in another country, if you're typing in other languages, well, UTF-8 is designed to be universal. That's what the whole U part is. Uh, but some languages still aren't perfect with that. So you'll see where there's other character sets that you can use, like Greek or Cyrillic, uh, to be able to support your alphabet and render it better on screen. So those are things that we can change. None of those settings that I just showed you have to do with font size, or, or color or performance of the, the, the console itself. So these are all just kind of general settings that apply to the terminal. Under profiles, this is where we create profiles. And you'll have one profile by, by default. It's usually called default. I've, I've renamed mine Don's Custom, but you, know, you, you call it whatever you want. Um, you can have one or more profiles, and the profiles are where all your special settings really end up. That's where the real work gets done inside of these things. So if I have a shared computer that I use alongside Daniel, 
he might have his profile and I have my own profile and we can easily switch back and forth. Now, that doesn't normally happen because normally Daniel has his own user account, I have my own user account, so we don't, don't bump heads. Right? Never the twain the shall meet, right? <laughs> yeah. But I might need some different profile based on applications that I'm running, right? I might have a certain color scheme that works well with one application and doesn't work well with another. So I can, I can come in and I can create those. But a lot of times we'll just have one. You can use the default one if you want and you can edit it to customize it how you want. Now, I went into the preferences screen and if I choose edit, it's gonna take me to the profile preferences. That's the same as if I had gone back out here and gone to edit and profile preferences. Right? The difference is this immediately takes me to the Don's custom profile versus going through the regular preferences screen, I can pick which profile I wanna edit if I have more than one profile. So that's the only difference. If I just wanna modify the profile I'm currently in, I can go to edit and profile preferences. I jump right in there. Okay. And now we can jump in and start to customize things. Now I want to show you some of the standard things that I customize. Right. Uh, the first thing, just the, the very first thing that I do is go to a custom font. Right. A lot of times the default font is set to monospace 10. And a 10 pitch font on a high resolution monitor is very, very difficult to read. Now I'm, I'm getting older, a little, <laughs> little bit older each day and it gets harder and harder for me to see. So, so I need a slightly bigger font. You might be young, you know, you're 18, you're in high school, and you can read it in microscopic fonts, and so you set the highest resolution font. Good or you're you. Mike Roderick. <laughs> yeah. One of our other hosts, he always tiny fonts. I don't understand it. But you can pick whatever font you want, and you can make that large or small. You can actually choose from a, a number of different fonts. You maybe, uh, I've seen people where they like the ones that look like cursive or, or whatever. You, know, you can get all kind of fancy pants with this stuff <laughs> if you want. And you can load custom fonts, too, if you really want to go crazy. Uh, oh, those are them, good. I like that. Some don't work as well. So, this, <laughs> <laughs> so you might not want those. You know, we're not going to pick the wingdings font or <laughs> yeah. whatever, webdings. Um, but, you know, you can customize this to, to be pleasing to you. If you're going to be working in this terminal a lot, you want it to be something that, that makes sense. But for me, it's normally the font size that impacts me the most. And I can see that right down here. I've got mine at a 16 pitch. You might need to go even larger. If you're on a super high resolution monitor, you might want it at 24 or something higher like that. But usually 10 or 11 is the default. And, and for me, that's just too small. So we can customize that. After that, there's other things we can customize, like the initial terminal size. Okay. Now, the default here, let's, let's, uh, let's do this. Let me get out of this one. And I'm going to go and I'm going to switch... I'm going to go into my preferences and profiles, all right? And I'm going to create a new profile here, right? And this is just at the default. So see how it's monospace 12, oh, slightly off on that. Uh, but the initial terminal size is 80 and 24, right? So that's kind of the, the default settings here for this unnamed profile that I've created. So I'm going to take that profile. And so we've got this unnamed profile right there. And I'm going to switch my terminal to use that. Now, you probably notice the option where I can pick the default profile that's going to be used. And right now it's going to default to Don's custom. So I'm going to choose unnamed. And the reason I'm doing that is I want it to just launch when I first launch. We can always switch when we launch a new terminal, uh, when we open one from an, a, an existing terminal. But when you open a new one, it takes that default value. And so here's the default terminal. And you'll see kind of my point, it's, it's really small. It's hard to read. It's not necessarily the ideal situation. It's also not very wide, okay? now. I can come in and hit control shift plus and make it bigger. Okay. But that's a one time thing. If I come up here and say like file open terminal and so I actually get choices now between which profile I want to use, I can open another one unnamed and see how the new one comes back small. It even does that with tabs, which is super annoying. Uh, <laughs> if I go to <laughs> open a tab and I do it unnamed, see how this tab is small? And then this tab is big. As I switch tabs, it's changing. That, that's pretty annoying, too. I feel like I'm on psychedelics watching that. Oh, what's going on here? <laughs> it's usability, right? Yeah. You know, we have to get in here and, and kind of customize this to meet our, our needs, right? That's just really the whole point of having these profiles is being able to set them to whatever it is that our, our system needs. So if I go back into my preferences, I can change that default profile back to mine. And I can edit it. Um, but I like to modify the font size. And then the width of the terminal. The terminal itself will default to 80 by 24, because that's what the old dummy terminals used. The, you know, the mainframe terminals I mentioned, they were 80 characters wide and 24 characters or lines tall, right? Um, 
that can be kind of small on our new widescreen monitors. Most people have 16 by 9 monitors these days, so it makes sense to make the terminal a little wider. I usually go 100 uh, by 24 like that is kind of my default. A few other things you can tweak the terminal bell. Terminal bell is super annoying. Uh, <laughs> any, anytime you, you know, maybe you backspace to delete characters and there's no more characters, every time you hit backspace, it goes ding, ding, ding. It, it gets annoying. Some people really like that, right? So we can leave that bell on or off. Mine's on, but I keep my laptop muted so it doesn't matter. But you might want to disable that. You can specify a command. When you first launch the terminal, what does it do? Well, the default is it drops you to command prompt. And it sits there and it waits for you to do something. But if there's a command that you run every time you launch the terminal, you can come in here and tell it, hey, I want you to run a command. Maybe I don't want it to go to a regular terminal. Maybe I want it to go to something special like Tmux. Tmux is a special kind of terminal that, uh, well, it, it's very much like Terminator that lets you slice up the screen, but it does it all with keyboard shortcuts and it does it all in one session. It's kind of it's almost borderline magic. Uh, <laughs> so, so I could say, hey, when I launch a, a shell, I, I want you to just go straight into Tmux. Don't, don't go into Bash or, or whatever my default shell happens to be. So you can override those values here. Normally we don't do that, but you could do it. The colors, the colors are kind of fun. Um, in the olden days, right, we just had white text on a black background, or, or maybe the other way around, right, a black background, or black text on a no, white black. background. Um, or your you favorite, black it. text on a black background. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's always great. It's, it's the stealth <laughs> yeah, shell, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you can change it. You'll see, like, green on black to get that true retro feel. <laughs> if you want to, you know, really go like a dummy terminal, um, you can do that. But all of these color settings can be overridden from within the terminal itself. And you'll see that pretty frequently when you're, when you're working with these terminals because uh, things get colorized. Like when I pulled up my directory listing, different files had different colors. That's being determined by the, the shell that I'm using. So, uh, so the terminal has a default color set, and that's really what you're picking here, and then the shell can override that at different places. And there's some default schemes that you can choose from. You know, see down here, mine's set to custom for some reason. I don't remember customizing it. But you can choose from some of these other uh, default color schemes to pick whatever it is that you want and get things kind of set to, to your liking. Right. Uh, the scrolling tab is kind of an important one for me. As you run commands, there's oftentimes where commands will exceed the, the top row of your screen. It'll scroll off the screen. You need to be able to scroll back and see it. Some operating systems have that scroll back buffer set really small. If it's only set to 100 lines and I do a yum update, and there's more than 50 updates, it's going to generate more than 100 lines, I'm going to lose messages that were at the top. Okay, that, that's how it works. So I need to have a scroll back buffer that's big enough to let me scroll back to see messages. Now, you don't want to go too big, because where does that scroll back buffer get stored? It's stored in RAM. So the bigger your scroll back buffer, the more RAM you're eating up. Now, this day and age, we usually have tons of RAM, so it's not that big of a deal. But you don't want to set this to be you know, millions of lines stored <laughs> in RAM. So 10,000 here is actually a really good number. That's a huge number of lines to scroll back and see, uh, but without consuming too much memory. But you might want to tweak that and change it, make it smaller, make it bigger. You certainly have that option. Well, Don, I know a lot of people like to, uh, uh, and with these newer terminals, they have the ability to increase the transparency of the terminal. Very cool stuff, uh, uh, kind of an effect thing. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of a personal thing, it, right? It is. I, I hate it. Yeah. Where, where I've that? noticed that, that you're colors? not a huge fan. No, I, I absolutely <laughs> hate it. Here it is. Transparent background. Um, if you watch a hacker movie, <laughs> you know, any, any hacker movie, any hacker movie, they love the transparent terminals. I don't know why. It's like, I've got this, this readable terminal. Let's make it less readable. Um, the transparency, right? So if I turn that on, this transparent background, what it does is it takes the background of your terminal and it makes it where you kind of see through it. And the idea behind that is if I have multiple terminals, right? So let me, let me close out of this. I'm going to open up a new terminal, right? And I'm in here and I'm doing work. Well, see how you can see my wallpaper through the terminal now? You can see the big seven I or the, Linux. the word <laughs> Linux yeah. up there. Yeah, that I'm seeing through my terminal. And if I open up another terminal window, see how I can see the old terminal through my new terminal? It gets super okay. confusing, doesn't it? Well, yeah, it, I, I, think, I think the idea was, oh, if I needed some information from the other terminal, I can see it while oh. I'm in here. But in practice, what happens is you end up with just overlapping stuff, and it becomes really confusing and difficult to read. Um, and, and this is just terminal windows, right? Maybe I've got a, a web page open, and so I'm, I'm browsing to IT Pro TV, and so I'm, I'm browsing the Internet. Uh, there we go. And so I, I fire open my terminals, 
and I can kind of see through them. And, and I've got the transparency set at 50%. That's yeah. probably a little too aggressive here. Um, if we were to tweak that down a bit, it creates a kind of artistic effect that some people like. I, I absolutely hate it. But uh, <laughs> uh, but some people, boy, they just love that stuff. So uh, if I take that transparent background and let me ratchet it down to a more reasonable level, right? Now you can still sort of see the web page behind it, but it's not totally in the way. You can get that, and it creates a nice little artistic effect. There are some distros that have this set by default. Uh, again, I, I usually just come in and disable that transparent background. Now I can read everything nice and neat. That, that's the way that I like it. Now, Don, I know we're running super short on time, but I was wondering if you could just touch on some of the, uh, one of the major things that we do inside of our computing experience, which is copy, cut, or paste. Okay. Uh, can, can we do this in the terminal, and can we go from like your web browser to the terminal? Yeah, you can, but it does get a little bit tricky, right? So normally when you're in an application, like if I'm in a web browser back here, and I want to copy, enjoy IT training courses, right? So I, I want to copy this, this little marketing slogan. I can take that and I can hit Control C on my keyboard and that copies. And then when I go up here, I can hit Control V and it pastes, right? Well, that works. Uh, and it even works in a lot of terminals, but it doesn't work in every terminal. And the main reason is that Control C is usually a breaking command. It's how you abort a command. So for example, if I start pinging some server, it's going to ping. And it's going to ping forever until I hit Control C. Control C tells it to stop, right? Control C doesn't tell it to copy. It tells it to stop. And so if I highlight some text, like with my mouse here, I'll highlight some text and hit Control C, it didn't copy. And if I do Control V, it doesn't do much of anything, right? So those traditional copy and paste don't quite work the way that, that you might expect them to. Now, you can always use your mouse, right, which is a little bit anti-Unix, but we're, we're not in Unix, right? We're right. in Linux. Uh, I can highlight with the mouse, and I can right-click, and I can choose copy, and then I can right-click, and I can choose paste, and, and there we go. It worked, right? But a lot of terminals will remap shortcuts to something that actually does work inside of a terminal. Whichever terminal you pick, you'll need to look at what its defaults are, right? Back up here in uh, Edit and Preferences, we had the shortcuts and right here was where I could define a number of shortcuts, including copy and paste. And if you take a look at the ones that are in here, it's got shift control C, shift control V. So instead of just hitting control C, I hit shift as well. And that's how it avoids sending the breaking command, right? So that'll make sure that it does that and ensures that I can copy it. So now I could come in and I could highlight something and I could hit... A, I don't usually do shift control, I usually do control shift, but uh, <laughs> control shift C to copy, and then control shift V, and there I'm pasting what I highlighted. All right. Now, in the GNOME terminal, that's the way you do it. That's the shortcut that you remember. In some terminals, though, they do what's called copy on highlight, where if you just highlight something, the moment you let go of your mouse, it copies it into the clipboard. And the moment you right-click, it immediately pastes that data. All right. The GNOME terminal doesn't do that, but there are terminals that do. And they usually just call that copy on click or, or copy on highlight. So as you dig through the options of your terminal, you may find something that indicates that. And I, I don't think I have that option here at all. Um, if we take a look at, like, even shortcuts, I'm pretty sure GNOME Terminal doesn't support that. But, uh, but like I said, your, yours might. And if you dig through your options, you may find it and see where you can turn that on or, or customize that option. So that's a, another way that we might do that. But, it, again, it does vary a bit from terminal to terminal. All right. Well, Don, we've run out of time with this episode. I know you have more to go when uh, jumping into the shells uh, area or the arena, should I say. Yeah. But it uh, looks like we'll have to wait for a part two on that. We do thank you for joining today. Is there anything you'd like to part our guests with before we go? You know, I, I certainly didn't get to every terminal in the world. There's hundreds of them, mm -hmm. and you might have a favorite one. I know I left out uh, Console, the, the one oh. from KDE. KDE's Console has a neat little bookmark feature where you can mm -hmm. bookmark folders as you navigate your file system. You can bookmark a location. And so when you launch that console, you can say, go to this bookmark, and it jumps right to that location on the file system. Very nice. It's a neat feature. All of those terminals, they, they, have, they have bright, shiny spots that make them great to use. They usually have a couple of cons that make them not so great. You've just got to find the one that's perfect for you. And it's, it's, it's trial and error. Usually they're very small, so it's easy to install a bunch of them. I, I probably have five different terminals installed here. Uh, you know, just take a look at what you've got and, and find out what one you like and just know that it's pretty easy to move to another one if you choose to. Right, doesn't it? It never hurts to test drive something, right? Do not, you're not locked into it, you don't like it, you delete it and you move on to the next thing. Don, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your expertise on this and imparting that into us. 
But as I've said, we're out of time for this episode. Definitely come back for part two as we look into shells. But as for this episode, we are going to go ahead and sign off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzette. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more on our Linux command line series. And of course, joining us back in the studio, lending his expertise to that topic, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzette. Don, we're so glad to have you yet again today. How's it going? It is going great, Daniel. Ready to dive into the world of terminals and shells. And, and this is part two. You know, if you watch part one, we really spent our time just talking about terminals, right? We, we didn't really delve into a shell at all. We, we saw a shell a few times. We didn't actually work with it. So in this episode, what I want to do is is actually hit the more important part, which what the heck a shell is. And so we're going to see some of the different shells that are available, understand what that difference between a terminal and a shell happens to be, and get in there and get that chance to kind of work with it and start to see some of our first commands. Because for a command line show, we were pretty light on the commands in the last episode. So <laughs> it's probably time to start running some commands. So we're going to get a chance to see all that right here in this episode. All right, Don, this sounds interesting. Uh, let's talk about that. What in the world is a shell? Because I know the, the Linux uninitiated is going... Everybody keeps talking about shells, but no one's telling me what they are exactly. All right. Well, when we work with the, the command line, right, a lot of people will call it a CLI, right? And right. CLI stands for command line interpreter. You got a line on the screen, you type a command, and the operating system has to interpret what you typed into something the computer understands. Because what we type is usually what's considered human readable. I know, I know the commands sometimes <laughs> are wacky and weird and don't make any sense, but they're, they're somewhat human readable. But they're not what the computer wants. The computer wants machine code. You know, that, that's what it wants is the really low-level uh, programming language that none of us can really work with. Uh, n none of us here on yeah. camera, at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, they certainly can. Um, it is very difficult to work with is the point, though. So we have these easier terms, these easier executables that we run and the computer then works with. So the command line interpreter is kind of like a translator, translating between the human and the computer. And that's really what your shell is, is the shell is the interpreter that you're choosing to work with, that you're handing the commands to, and then it's figuring out what to do with those commands. The terminal, what we saw yesterday, or in the, the previous episode, depending on when you watch it, maybe not yesterday, <laughs> uh, the, the terminal is simply a way to see the shell. How can I actually view the shell on my screen? I use a terminal, and it might be a physical hardware terminal like the old dummy terminals or it might be a graphical terminal like gnome term that i'm using here on the screen or xterm or k console any of the various other products that are out there those are just a way to see the shell and the shell is what's really doing the work so your terminal is just bells and whistles just making things look pretty right and and that's really what the last episode centered around is why we didn't have to run any commands because it's all just making it look pretty but the shell itself is all about commands and so when we fire up a terminal, what we see is our actual shell. So if we look at my screen, I've got my GNOME terminal fired up, and here's a command prompt. Here's an entry where I can start to type commands, and I can tell the computer to do something, right? I can tell it, hey, I want to know what my host name is. And so I type in host name CTL, and I press enter, right? When I press enter, that tells the shell to do something. And the shell says, okay, well, what did you type? You typed hostname CTL. What does that mean? All right, well, I've got a binary file over here that has the same name, so that must be what you're calling. So let me go and find that binary and execute it and run it and do whatever it says. And then that binary says, oh, we're going to output on the screen this data. And so then the interpreter says, let me take that data and turn it into a human readable format, not ones and zeros, and let me throw it on the screen. And here it is. I can see my computer is called Don's laptop because I'm very creative with computer names. <laughs> So I can see that information. That's me interacting with the shell. Technically, it's me interacting with the terminal and the shell. The two go together. It's kind of like uh, chocolate and peanut butter in a peanut butter cup. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the two work together to give me that way to interface with the computer. And so I'm accessing it. I'm typing commands. And that's what the shell is doing. So this is the, the Linux shell in this case. 
So Don, the shell is our interpreter. It's, it's the middleman between us and the computer hardware. Is there any other specific things we need to know about the shell? I, I open this black terminal prompt you have open, and isn't there, is there something specific about that that I need to know? Well, you know, on most systems, the shell is the same. So you drop and you'll get a prompt, something like this. Now the prompt can be customized, right? You can tweak and change it. People go crazy with it. Uh, mine is just a default, a default prompt where I've got the username and computer name, followed by the, the file system path that I'm in, followed by a little symbol here that lets me know my privilege level. So a, a dollar sign in this case means I'm just a, a regular old user versus if it was a pound symbol, that would mean that I was an administrative user or the root user, somebody who's got a lot more control over the system. So all of that's being communicated to me via the prompt, but none of that has to be there. You can actually make the prompt completely blank if you want. It, it makes it annoying, yes, but you can does. do that. <laughs> so now you start typing commands and it works. So the prompt is purely optional. But the shell itself, in this case, I'm using a shell that's called Bash. And Bash stands for the Born Again Shell. SH is just shell. Uh, and it is one of a multitude of shells that are available that are out there. Now, in the first episode, we talked about terminals. And I said, hey, just pick the terminal that works for you. Pick the one that you like the best, right? You got a lot of flexibility there. And if I fire up three different terminals, they might all be giving me access to the bash shell. And the bash shell works the same under each one. So it doesn't matter if I use Terminator or Tmux or uh, console or Xterm or Gnome term, it doesn't matter because they're all just giving me the bash shell. But bash is not the only one, right? There's actually many other shells that are available that your system may or may not have. Now, if you're running uh, Red Hat Linux or Fedora, CentOS, uh, a lot of the other distributions like um, Slackware, they all default to the bash shell. So that, that's kind of a common experience that you're going to have. But there are some distros like Debian and Ubuntu that default to a different shell, a shell called Dash. Right now, Dash, which um, uh, I can't remember what that stands for. I think I've got it's Debian that's something. Yeah, Debian <laughs> something shell. Uh, you know, it was created for them, and and they they tweaked it, they changed its behavior a little bit, and so you might drop into a Dash shell, and it looks very very similar. And 99% of the commands are the same, and the way you work with it is the same. But then there's that one percent. But the extra features that they've added that might make it the most amazing shell ever. But it's different than what we're used to. So one of the first things that I want to show you guys here before we kind of like uh, nitpick on, on shells is to figure out which one you're running, okay? Because when you log in, your user account has a default shell. And if you have five different users, you could actually have five different default shells. So different users could have a different experience. So I want to show you guys how to figure that out and determine the shell that you're using. Okay, and there's, there's a couple of commands that we can run that make this really easy. The first command is we need to know what your username is. Now, hopefully you already know what your username is. But if the terminal is already logged in, like on dummy terminals, they're, they're normally already logged in, you might not know. And so we can run the command, who am I, just to, to find out what our username is. So I'm logged in as dpossett. And now that I know my user, I can pull what my default shell is. Now, the default shell is stored alongside your user account in a file on the file system. And we can view that by using the grep command. Grep will search for a string. So I'm going to search for dpossett. So grep dpossett. So search for this string dpossett. And then I'm going to tell it to look in the slash etc slash passwd file. Okay. Uh, there's another command I could use here, which is get ent. G e t e n t is another one that can basically do the same thing that I'm doing here. So what we'll find with, with Linux is that oftentimes there's 10 different ways to do the same task. So I'm just using the grep utility because it's incredibly flexible and I use it a lot. Uh, but I'm searching that file to find information about my user account. And when I do that, it shows my user account. And right here at the end, it tells me what my default shell is. When I log into the system, it's launching slash bin slash bash. I'm launching the bash shell. So that's what I'm in. But you might find where you've changed yours to dash, or maybe not you, maybe the system administrator has changed what the default is, or that distro that you installed uses a different default. And so when you launch a terminal, you might be getting a different shell, and it's important to understand that. If you're trying to do some of the same commands that we do in this series, and you're finding they're not working, it might be that you're in a different shell. So this is an important thing. 
Not all shells are created equally, and they are, by and large, compatible with each other, but some of them have some neat little features that aren't present in the others, and that can, can cause some confusion. All right, Don, well, if there's all these multitudes of different shells, how do we know which shells we have or are supported by our system other than the one that's defaulted? All right, so th there's a, a couple of big ones that are out there, and, and you know, really, if, if you wanted to be the true super Unix guy, way back in the beginning, Unix had one shell, and it was called SH, just shell. That was it. That, that was the shell. And believe it or not, most current modern Linux distros still have that original SH shell available in case you ever want to go for like true compatibility. You can, you can launch that shell and use it. But there are other shells like Dash or ZSH, uh, CSH, TCSH. Each of these are, are different shells that behave a little differently. So for example, um, CSH. CSH is the C shell. Get it? Yeah. C shell. Uh, but, it, but it's actually, <laughs> I see what you did it's, there. <laughs> it's C like the programming language, not C like the C. Right, not S-E-A. Yeah. 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 Not, not S-E-A, because so, the C is not an ocean. But, uh, yeah. but it's C like the programming language. And with the C shell, the idea was that if you were a programmer and you wrote in the C language, that you could actually just, instead of issuing normal commands, you could type C programming characters right here in the prompt, and it would interpret them and run them. And when you made a script, the script was just C code, and it would do a just-in-time comp compilation and actually run it, and it would knock everything out for us, right? So that was the idea behind the C shell. Well, if you're not a developer, if you don't write in C, then that doesn't help you. And so you don't necessarily need the C shell. But we need to know if we have that, if I want to use it, I can always switch, right? There's a neat little command, chsh. And the chsh command, it's short for change shell. And this is a command that we can use to change our default shell. If you don't want to default to bash, you can pick something else. But even if we don't use the change, you can just run chsh in a space dash l. And that dash l will say list the available shells on my system. Okay, And when you do that list, you can see the shells that you've got. And I can see, I actually do have the original Unix sh shell. There it is. Right? I've also got bash, uh, b-a-s-h right there. Uh, that's the default, the one that I'm using right now, the one that most distros use as a default. But I've got others. I've got slash sbin slash no login. Well, that's a special shell that a lot of service accounts will use. If you have a service account, something that's running a, a daemon in the background. It's so like Apache or something like that. Yeah, it, it doesn't need to log in and get a shell. That's something a hacker would use. They, they could take advantage of that. So instead of giving them a shell, it gives them no login. So the service can run. It can do its job, but it can never actually get to an interactive shell to talk to the system. So that's a, a protection mechanism. Uh, now I'm running Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and in Red Hat, they take the slash bin and slash sbin directories and mirror them to slash user, uh, slash bin and slash sbin. So that's why I see each of those twice. I see sh twice, bash twice, no login twice. You probably won't see them twice on your system. That's kind of a, a Red Hat thing. Uh, but then I've got TCSH, which is another shell that's out there. Uh, TCSH is the 10x C shell, uh, which was this guy, the C shell, implemented on the 10x operating system. Now, most of you have probably never heard of the 10x operating <laughs> system, and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> so, but if you are backporting code, or if you've got scripts that were written under 10x, you could run them under the 10x C shell here, and they would run just fine. There's some 10x fanboy out there going, yeah, 10x. <laughs> um, don't quote me on this, but if I remember right, the C shell is not exactly POSIX compliant. Hmm. And the 10x C shell is POSIX compliant. So that's kind of one of the reasons it sticks around. If you've never heard of POSIX, um, it's P-O-S-I-X, like that, POSIX. Um, when AT&T originally created the Unix operating system, they weren't allowed to sell it. They, they couldn't sell Unix because they were going through the whole antitrust, the monopoly stuff. And the government said, look, you are a monopoly in the telecom industry. We will not allow you to become a monopoly in the computer industry as well. So they were not allowed to sell Unix. So instead, what they did is they licensed the Unix technology to other vendors so they can make their own operating systems. So that's where things like 10x came from, and Minix, and uh, BSD, and a number of other operating systems that are out there. They were all licensed versions of Unix. Well, in order to make them all compatible with each other, we had the POSIX compliance. And POSIX compliance was a series of rules that said, if you want to call your operating system Unix, it's got to conform to these rules, otherwise you're not allowed to call it Unix, right? And BSD was one of the first ones to kind of start 
breaking that line. And that's why they said, we're not going to call ourselves Unix anymore. We'll just call it BSD. And, and that's what they did. Eventually, the BSD changes got incorporated back into Unix. And so then they became POSIX compliant yeah. because it was their stuff in there. Uh, to this very day, uh, Mac OS is POSIX compliant. So technically, you can say that your Mac is running Unix if you want. Like, you can say that. Well, in the shell world, some of them are POSIX compliant, some of them aren't. And the ones that aren't can cause problems. You could write a script that works fine on that shell and it won't work fine on other shells. So that's why we have so many choices like this that are available. Uh, and then I have one more shell, Tmux, installed. Tmux is actually not installed on most systems by default, but it's incredibly useful because it allows you to take one shell and split it up into multiple screens. Kind of like the, the demonstration I did with Terminator yesterday, except Terminator is a GUI program. Tmux is not. It works inside of a, a command line session and you can split, like I, I could remote into a server and start creating split screens right from inside of Tmux. Great really for headless stuff. systems, right? Oh yeah, yeah, really good for that stuff. So I, I, I like Tmux, I do use it a lot. Not enough to set it as my default shell though. Yeah. Right. And that's the other thing is you have a default shell, right? I just found out a moment ago that my default shell is slash bin slash bash, right? So whenever I open up a new terminal, that's the shell that I'm going to be in. But I can switch to another shell at any time. If I want, all I have to do is type the name of the other shell that I want. So if I want to run in the old style Unix shell, the original, right? I can just type SH and press enter. And now I'm in that shell. Now, my screen didn't change, which tells me that Red Hat might have actually linked SH to bash. So uh -huh. let's try a different shell. Um, you can always do just slash bin slash SH. That will definitely fire it off. Well, I think it's linked, though, so it'll oh, still just link over. Yeah, let, me, let me do a TCSH. So if I do TCSH and I run that, see how my prompt changed, right? TCSH has a different prompt. It's still got my username and host name, and then the tilde, which is my path, uh, but it's kind of rearranged a little bit differently. And now I'm in this alternate shell. And there might be certain commands that work fine here that don't work in another shell, right? Uh, so that, that's kind of where we are. Now I could actually start doing C... Uh, programming language right here in the prompt and it's going to recognize and understand what I'm doing versus if I was in regular SH it might not recognize some of that. Uh, and when you switch to a shell like this you're in that shell. Every command you run is now in that shell until you type exit to get out of the shell. And so it puts me back. So I basically just exited from TCSH back down to bash. So I, I moved from one shell to the other. Uh, if I go into Tmux I can run that and now I'm inside of Tmux which apparently I've got a, a syntax error. Uh, and so I can get in here, and then I can type exit, and I can get out of that. Uh, well, except for my can. syntax errors, so I'll, I'll control C out of that one. But uh, uh, oh no, actually, I'm I'm still in, in Tmux. Tmux. This yeah. is tricky because it, it it looks like I'm not in Tmux, but I can see my status line down here at the bottom, so I know I'm in this other shell. And so now I can start doing the the crazy things that Tmux can do, like splitting my screen. And now I'm working in two different environments, and I can exit out of those individually. But when I exit out of the final window, it's going to dump back. And now I'm back into just my regular old shell, at which in my case is Bash. So pretty easily uh, able to move from one shell to another if you want it to be temporary. If you want it to be permanent, that's when we actually have to modify our user account to change what our default shell is. But if you just want to try out another shell, it's really easy to do it. And you can install other shells too. Um, I mentioned Dash, which Dash is gaining in popularity because of Ubuntu, which is one of the more widely used distros today. Um, I don't have it installed. Uh, and in fact, it might not even be in the re uh, repositories. Let me, let me see if I can install it real quick. Uh, I will see if I can find that one. And if you, uh, it's not available. So if you can reach out and find the install package for that shell, you can install additional shells and then you can run them and make use of them and, and, and launch them and, and maybe that works out great for you. But if you don't need a shell, then you don't necessarily need to install it. But there are other ones that are out there. It just depends on your distro, what you might find. Uh, so, for example, like if I wanted ZSH, that's not installed by default, but if I take a look, there's a package, so I could install that real quick. Uh, let me just install ZSH, and we'll get that one. And then once I've got it, now anytime that I want to use that shell, I can just jump in and, and fire it up. It was, uh, the package was a whopping 2.4 megabytes in size. So we're not talking about a whole lot here. <laughs> the shells themselves are usually even smaller. The bulk of that file size is usually the help documentation. You know, because these shells were written a long time ago when you didn't have a lot of memory. Uh, but now I can run this, and here I am. I'm in the Z shell, and I'm ready to go and do whatever it is the Z shell. Does. I think it's another derivation of the C shell. Is it? Yeah, it's I just more it. more about being C <laughs> compliant. I mean, apparently uh, people that use Linux 
really like C programming. <laughs> if I uh, if if I remember right, the Z shell was popular amongst a lot of BSD users. Mm. So I, I don't know, you know, where it came from there. But you know, you've got other people out there that are maybe coming from like the Solaris world, mm. right? Where the Solaris operating system, which was BSD based, uh, it had some different shells, and, and so you could certainly add those. Now, for most of us, we just stick with the Bash shell, right? Bash is the most commonly used. Most scripts are written assuming the Bash shell is there, but you certainly don't have to. So you can find one that you like and you can stick with it. Now, how, how do you know that you like one better than the other? If you're just typing commands and they work in any of them, aren't they all the same? What it really comes down to are what are called shell built-ins. When I run a command, a command is normally a binary stored somewhere, right? So I, I ran hostname CTL earlier, right? So, so that was the command I ran to find out what my hostname was. Okay, well, where does that command come from? You can use the which command, which will tell you which files provide that command. And so if I say which hostname CTL, and I run that, I get slash user slash bin slash hostname CTL. That's the binary that powers that. Okay, but there's other commands like the history command. Right? If I type history and I run that, I get a list of all the commands that I've typed since I logged in, or on some systems it actually keeps a file and it might even go further back, it might go back a thousand commands, so over multiple sessions. But I can see the commands that I've typed, right? If I do a which history and I run that, I get an error. It's searched in a bunch of places, so I'm trying to find this command and I can't find it, right? Where, where does that command come from? If there's no binary that's providing that command, where is it? It's coming from our shell. The history command is an example of what's called a shell built-in. A built-in is a command that's not a binary on your file system. It's built into the shell that you're using. And as long as I'm in Bash, I know the built-ins that I've got. I'm used to them. I work in Bash all the time. But if I jump over to ZSH, I don't know the built-ins over there. I don't use that shell very often. And so there might be commands that I'm used to or even commands that I'm using in scripts that aren't available. Or there might be some that are available in the other shell that aren't available here in Bash. That might be the reason why well, I like that other my, shell. My favorite is when it is the same command, but they work kind of differently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that that's always happen. fun. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a, a standard Linux problem. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, or or you could say it's a benefit, right? Yeah. Somebody somebody doesn't like the way something works, so they change it and make it better. Um, if you really want to find out those differences, you'll have to pull up the documentation for the shell. So, for example, I've got the GNU page here for. Um, for the bash shell pulled up and they've got a, a list where you can come in and you can pull up all the born shell built-ins and, and get in there and see which built-ins are, are available and if we take a look you'll see some of them are really like aliases but you'll find other commands in here like cd for changing directory uh exec for running a program exit for getting out of a shell right it, the shell actually has to provide you the function to get out of the shell uh that's important uh, and somewhere in here we'll probably find you know i didn't see history Although I know history is a built-in, <laughs> I didn't, oh, you know what, I'm in uh, Bash, the born again shell. Right. This is the documentation for the original Bash shell, or the born the shell. shell. Yeah. yeah, so it, uh, history must it have been a be new feature, yeah. or, or I'm just missing it here. Um, but but that's, that's the case with these shells, and this is largely the biggest difference, right? There will be other differences like POSIX compliance, but the big difference that affects you, the end user, are these built-ins, right? what's available and what isn't. And you'll have to look at your shell's documentation to find out exactly what it is that, that it provides that you need or, or that it makes your life you know, glorious and, and great. So. All, right, all right, Don, well you did say that you were gonna show us how to actually, we've seen how to list which shells we have available. I actually want to change shells, I've decided, you know what, the 10X shell is the answer to all my prayers. I need that 24 seven, how do I make that change? All right, so if I want to switch my default shell, right? If this is a temporary thing, I just open up my normal shell and I type the name of the other shell and, and that's it, it's temporary, right? And then when I type exit, it's gone. But if I want to make it where every time I launch my terminal that it goes to this other shell, then I need to change my default entry. Now, earlier I found my default entry by looking in the passwd file and we're not allowed to edit that. Right? A root user can edit that file, but a regular user cannot. And you're not supposed to edit it directly anyway. We have a whole suite of utilities that can help us to do that. And as far as the shells are concerned, it's the chsh command. I used it earlier, I just ran it again here, chsh-l to list the available shells. Right? So now I know what's available on my system. Maybe I want to make uh, zsh my default shell. That's the one that I want to go to. Like, I think it's awesome. For 
whatever reason. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I can come in and I can say CHSH dash S, right? Dash L was to list the shell. Dash S is to set the shell. So I'm going to set my shell to uh, slash bin slash ZSH, like that, okay? And it's changing it from my user account, so I've got to provide my password, so I'll punch that in. There we go. And it says that my shell has changed. Okay, now, how do I know it actually changed? I, I can test that. I can launch a new terminal. But before I do that, let me just grep for dpazette in slash etc slash passwd. And when I look in there, I can see that my default shell is now slash bin slash zsh, right? And if I open up a new terminal window, so I'll just go up here to open a new terminal. All right, oops, actually, you know what? I've got to close out of this one. There we go. And if I open up a new terminal, even if I go to like Xterm or somebody else, when I go in, it's going to launch, and it's going to be launching in that ZSH, which I picked a terminal. Post it yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me just do my, my normal terminal. It's not so tiny. Uh, and I come in here. Um, Don, uh, it does look like we're still driving the same car here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of forgot something. Um, so the, the GNOME terminal is actually hard-coded to use Bash, so it's ignoring my default <laughs> login shell. Wasn't and that sweet of him? <laughs> so let me, let me show you guys real quick. It, if, I had, if I had done an actual terminal, right, so if I did like, uh, here, I'll do a control F2, and I, I know this is going to be microscopic, right? So way yeah. up there at the top is really, really tiny, and I can't really do anything about that. But let me just show you real quick. I'm going to log in here, and when I log in, there's that message that ZSH showed to say like, hey, you're in ZSH and here's your shell and you can start to work with it. So I know that it is working. My default shell is ZSH. If I were to SSH into my system, I would get ZSH. The problem here is that GNOME Terminal is ignoring that. So let me show you how to fix that in GNOME Terminal. If this were a server, I wouldn't worry about it because right. I always SSH into a server, I'll get ZSH. But in GNOME Terminal, it's got its own little kind of hard coding. I, I don't know why they do that, but they, they, they certainly do. Uh, but if you go into your profile preferences, you can come in here and you can tell it a command to run when you log in. And see how it's got run a custom command instead of my shell? I can tell it that I want to run ZSH. <laughs> there we go. I can tell it ZSH. I'm, I'm making my own shell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and once I tell it that, now anytime I open up a new terminal... I can come in here and just say I want to open up a new terminal, and now it's defaulting into ZSH. So that kind of solves that problem uh, and gets that set the, the way that I want it. Uh, also, if, if I had been remoting into a server, like if I remote into this one, uh, and oops, if I do my syntax right here, if I had been remoting into this server, then it would have honored it there as well, and I could have logged in, and there's my ZSH shell, and it's observing it there. So be aware that your terminal that you're using could override that default shell. Like in my case, GNOME Terminal did override me, but the default shell was set. I am set for ZSH. I'm not uh, a fan of ZSH. I'm not saying it's bad, just saying I, I never use it, so I don't want to stick with that as my <laughs> default shell. <laughs> so, so I'm going to do a quick chsh-s, and I'm going to put myself back to slash bin slash bash like it used to be. And so I'll put that in there. And then I'm just going to verify that that change st stuck by doing a grep for the dpazet string in slash etc slash passwd. And I can see that I am back to slash bin slash bash, which is where I want to be. And now we're good to go. So those are the, the shells. Now we switch between them. And it's not so bad, right? But you, you do experiment around with it. The other shells are a lot less popular. Bash is the de facto standard, especially when it comes to scripting. Because if you want to write a script and have it run everywhere, everybody supports Bash. But do know that there's other shells like Dash that are gaining in popularity and more and more people are running them. So, so definitely check out the other shells, see if they offer something that you, you might find that uh, really benefits you. All right, Don. Well, this is a great look at what a shell is, right? Hopefully we've answered that question for you if you've never heard before. And what shells are available in our system, how we can switch in between them and make those changes permanent if necessary. Don, thanks for uh, imparting that knowledge onto us. I'd like to always give you the opportunity to <laughs> give us some parting words before we close the show. Anything you got for us? Uh, you know, for those of you that go on to watch our scripting shows, what you'll notice is that in a lot of scripts on the very first line, it'll actually call the interpreter, it'll call a shell, because they don't know which shell you're running when a script runs, and so they almost always call the bash shell. So if you're just getting started with Linux, if you're new to this, I do recommend you stick with the bash shell, at least to start with. But as you become a more advanced user, you may find the other shells can benefit you. So just know that the bash is the standard 
basically because of compatibility, that we want things to be able to run on all the different systems. All right, Don. Well, thanks again for joining us today, and we do thank our audience for watching. Hopefully this has been a very educational and entertaining episode to watch. We've tried real hard to do that for you good folks out there. <laughs> but it is that time, looking at the clock, we've run out of the precious little seconds that make up our episode. We're going to go ahead and sign off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzette. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back talking more about the Linux command line. It has been an interesting conversation thus far. I see no change in that in the near future, that's for <laughs> sure. It is the disembodied uh, laughter you hear off of camera is our good friend, Mr. Don Bazette, joining us today. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going, man? Hey, it is going great, Daniel. Ready to dive right back into the Linux <laughs> command line. And, you know, in the in the upcoming episodes, really the whole rest of this series, we're, what, three episodes in now, yeah. the whole rest of the series, we're going to be opening a fire hose of commands, just, uh, you know, stuff that you can do from the command line. And it can be overwhelming, the amount of commands, and even more so, not just the commands themselves, but all the command line arguments we can provide to change the way the commands work. It's Those are my favorite. A lot. Yeah, it's, it's overwhelming. So before we do that, though, before we break <laughs> out the fire hose and, and let it go, I wanted to take a moment and do an episode just on getting help, right? Uh, how do we find out what commands are available? How do we find out what command line arguments are available? How do we figure out how to use a command? How do we, we figure out if a command even exists, right? So in this episode, we're gonna learn about that, that Linux as, a, as an operating system as a whole has really good documentation on the bulk of the commands. And a lot of that comes from the Unix background. So some of the documentation is really old, but still very, very accurate. We just need to know that it's there. And there's great utilities to help us find things. And so the stuff in this episode is the stuff you want to memorize, that you want to always have committed to memory. You can forget all the other commands. And if you know the commands from this episode, you'll be able to find them, stumble yeah. back upon them, uh, and make some use of it. Uh, so this is stuff that's really critical for the day-to-day -day operation of, of using the Linux command line. Don, it, that is not a joke. I have been using Linux since 1999, I believe. And... I still use all the help features. This is definitely, you're never going to memorize every little switch and option that comes with a command. Heck, I might not even remember exactly what the command is or where it's located or those configuration files. We need to be able to get help with our system because, man, you're, you're going to need it. So this is great stuff. Don, where do we start when it comes to getting help? All right. So some commands, if you just remember their name, they, they have a, a simple thing that you run and, and that's it, right? So like um, if I'm in my shell, like I am right now, and I want to know what folder I'm in. There's a command for that, right? There's the PWD command, or the present working directory. So it's going to show me the directory that I'm in in the file system. And if I run it, I just run the command, and there it is, right? So some commands, it's really just a matter of remembering their name. But a lot of commands will require additional arguments to make them work. You have to provide additional feedback into them. Otherwise, they just don't work by themselves. So for example, the copy command. Copy is CP, right? And if I do copy, it's expecting me to say a source file and a destination file, right? So I might copy file one to file two, right? If I don't give it those arguments, if I just type CP and press enter, it gives me a little bit of help, right? And when I say a little bit, I mean that literally. <laughs> it is a little bit of help. Sometimes they're very, very detailed, but usually it's something like this. And it's telling me, you kind of forgot to provide an operand. You didn't provide the command line options and arguments, so it's not able to do its job, okay? We need to give it some more. So if you've forgotten just the, the arguments, that's not such a big deal, right? You can just run the command, and it'll usually tell you how you can find more help. And in this case, it's telling me that I can run cp-help, all right? Now, when it comes to command line arguments like this, there's actually two different forms for providing it. And you'll see this commonly throughout all the commands that we run. The old style Unix way of doing it was a single dash followed by a single letter. All right. So you might see like CP dash H and that dash H was help. But in the BSD world, they started using words instead. It was a little more user friendly. Right. 
And so here it's, it's help. But we want to make sure that Unix or Linux in this case understands that it's not H-E-L-P, individual letters. That's not four arguments. It's one word called help. And that's where the double dashes come in, the dash dash help. So if I want to learn more about CP, I can run CP dash dash help, and it's going to provide me with that help information. And when I look at the information here, as it goes to tell me how to use the command, it lays it all out for me, and I can start to see it. And here's actually that dash dash help right here. That displays this help, and then it exits. Great. But there's plenty of other commands that I could have run. And as I look down the list, I'll see dash A, dash B, dash D. All of these are options. And when I look at the very top, that's where it gives me my actual syntax, my actual usage. And the usage is made up of a couple of different pieces in this case, right? So let me kind of show you the syntax here of how help documentation is written. That it starts by giving you the command and then everything else that we need to provide to make that command work. If it's in square brackets like this, then it's an optional thing. We don't have to have it. If it's not in square brackets, then you do have to have it. So the CP command has to have a source file and a destination file. It's got to have those two things or it doesn't work, right? The options in dash T, we can do those if we want, but we don't have to, right? And then be careful because there's things like a dash T capital and a dash T lowercase. And sometimes they do the same thing, but a lot of times they do two different things. And if I scroll down here and look at the help, I can see that dash T with a lowercase is specifying a target directory. Oops, sorry. And a dash T with an uppercase is saying no target directory, right? Just treat it as a file, not a directory. Two different things. They're actually the opposite of each other by making one capital and, and one lowercase. So that's a, a big difference. And we find that here in the, the help, okay? Now, this help is not written to be read like a book, right? I, I don't say, boy, I, I want to learn about the copy command. Let me go run cp dash dash help, and I'm just going to read this from the beginning to the end. That's not what this is designed for. This is designed to be a quick reference. All right, I'm trying to fit, what was that little tag I needed to, to specify yeah. a target directory? Is it capital T or capital lowercase t? You know? Yeah, and, and you can scan through this really quick, find what you're looking for, and, and there it is, right? There's that information, right? Uh, and that was just by running dash dash help. On some applications, it's actually not dash dash help. It would be like dash H, the old style. If I do that here, that's an invalid option. Unfortunately, this is not exactly standardized, so not every application follows the same method. Uh, if I take the hostname ctl command and I run dash dash help, I get the help. And if I run dash h, I get the help, right? This one supports both. It supports both modifications of, of dash h, but cp didn't, right? So you might have to stumble through this a few times before you find the right one. And where it gets a little tricky is like with cp, if I just type cp by itself, it told me what to type. Type cp dash dash help. Hostname CTL, though, if I just run hostname CTL, it doesn't need any command line arguments. So if I just run it, it runs and does its thing. So I have to know in the back of my mind that if I want to figure out how this works, I can run it with dash dash help or dash H, or I might have to try them both, right? And some applications go even crazier. And they say, you know, this is a wild case, right? <laughs> uh, and they say, you know what? You type a question mark. If you do hostname CTL space question mark, and we'll display the help. Well, this one doesn't support that. Maybe it's a dash question mark. You might have to try a few different things where you hit on the winner, and it just depends on who wrote that application, which is a frustrating aspect of using this method for help. So this is not normally my go-to when I need help, but it is there. It's built into a lot of commands, and I want you guys to be aware of it, because if you know the command name and you're just trying to figure out the arguments, this can be a pretty easy way to do that. And Don, I'm with you on that as far as this is my, I kind of have some familiarity with the command or whatever it is I'm working with, and I just need that quick reference. Oh, yeah, let me just dash dash help it really quickly. Uh, there, it was capital T. That's what I need to use. But what if I want a more exhaustive help file, something that's going to take me from soup to nuts on how to use this operation? All right, there are a few other ways to get good documentation on this, and the most common way is using the Unix manual system, okay? The manual system is, is 
basically a part of a command that's called man. And when we run that, we can find detailed information about just about any command, right? So if I want to learn more about uh, CP, or I want to learn more about PWD, or one of these other commands, I can just type man, and then the name of the command, so CP, right? I want to see the manual page for CP. And when I run that, here we go, we get output on the screen. And I can see here's the CP command, here's the options for it, and as I start scrolling down, I can see all the other modifiers and additional details. And some of it is really descriptive, really well documented. Sometimes they'll have examples of how you can run the command. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's much abbreviated. In fact, this really doesn't look that much different than the output that I got when I ran uh, cp-help, right? So, so this one, the authors didn't really go too far into adding more to it. But you can see recommendations to other commands and, and various other things we can use to find out information about this utility, right? Now, when I look at this data, I'm, I'm pulling up any number of commands, right? So I can do like man uh, pwd for present working directory, and I can look at its documentation, or man hostname ctl, and now I'm looking at its documentation. And we can go through and we can find out more. Now, with hostname ctl, remember when I ran hostname ctl dash dash help, I got this. It all fits on one screen. Just a simple layout. Here's the arguments we can use. Here's the commands that are available. This is it, right? But when I run man hostname CTL and I pull up the man page, the manual, now I get screens of data, all right, where they really go through and explain exactly how each of these tags work, right? And I, I say they explain exactly how. Sometimes it can be a little cryptic. The people that write these uh, often are, are done on a volunteer basis, and IT people aren't necessarily the most eloquent uh, writers. <laughs> but but well, a lot nice. of times it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I've heard from a lot of people where they say, like, boy, I want to contribute to Linux, but I'm not a developer. I'm not a programmer. I can't write code. So how, how can I contribute to the product? And man pages are a great way to do it. If you're not a programmer, but you're good at English, <laughs> yeah. you know, or you, you could talk to people and people can understand you, then that's a gift. That's a talent in and of itself. And you can go and contribute documentation. And let me tell you, the developers love it when people do that. It's a great way to contribute to the, uh, the open source movement. So, uh, so keep that in mind. But I can really get detailed information here on exactly what I need to know about this, this particular program, how it works. And down at the bottom, I'll usually see references to other commands that get tied into it. So for example, I ran hostname CTL. There's also the hostname command. Well, that, that's pretty similar, isn't it, right? If I run hostname CTL, I see that my computer is called Don's Laptop. But I also see a lot of other stuff in here, like that I'm running Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I see all that stuff. But if I run hostname by itself, oh, I just get the hostname. Well, when would I need that? Maybe I'm running some kind of script that just needs to query the hostname. If I use the hostname command, I just get the hostname. If I do hostname CTL, I might have to use a cut command or, or something to be able to cut out just the part of the data that I want, and it's a lot more work than if I just use hostname. So I can discover additional commands by using the manual pages and finding that out. Now, you might have noticed at the bottom of that, when I looked at hostname CTL, and I was down at the bottom, and it was telling me about the hostname command, which, uh, there it is. See how there's this hostname one, and then there's a hostname five. What's that about? Yeah, what was that about? Well, these numbers on the back side of it identify what kind of man page we're dealing with. Right? There's actually a number of different what there, nine nine different types of man pages. So you can see one through nine. Five is what we're normally seeing. Uh, sorry, uh, one is what we're normally seeing. Right? See so one here for system D or hostname D. One is a normal executable command. Five is a file format. So there's a file on my system called hostname. But there's a command on my system called hostname. Uh, another example of that would be passwd, right? I can run the passwd command if I want to change my password, right? And so now I can go in and I can change what my password is. But there's also the slash etc slash passwd file where the accounts are stored, right? Two different things, they just happen to have the same name. Well, the passwd command, that would be the man page for passwd1, and the passwd file would be passwd5. 
So if I were to pull up the man page for past WD, which one do I get? Well, they go in order of the number, so it starts with one. If there's an executable, they assume that's the information you want. So when I run man past WD, right up at the very top left, right there, see how it says past WD and in parentheses a number one? That lets me know I'm looking at the executables documentation. The other big hint is, is this whole part <laughs> yeah. here, which tells you how to run the command. So, so I see that. And as I read through it, I'm learning about the past WD command. That's great. But down here, we'll find where it will reference other things. And oh, that's interesting. The past WD file. Oh, here it is. Uh, slash etc slash pamd, a, a different one. But it is referencing that this file exists. It's actually not linking to past WD5 at all, which is uh, interesting. You'd think that it would. Hmm. But I know it's there. Right? How do I view that one? Well, when you use that man command, it's defaulting to whatever the, the lowest number available is. One is a command. That's what we expect. I want to see five. And so if I come in here and say man five past WD, that's going to tell it I don't want to learn about the, the program, the executable. I want to learn about the file. Tell me about this past WD file. And when I run that, now I can see up here this is past WD five. It tells me it's the past WD file. And then it goes to describe the file, what it does what it's used for, how it's formatted, how things are arranged, and I can learn all about that file, right? Uh, same thing with hostname. If I do a man5 hostname, I can then learn about that file. It's slash etc slash hostname. Here's what it does. Here's how it's formatted. And here's some other places you can look to learn more about it, right? So that's a big part of it. The other man page types are a lot less common, right? Um, notice on hostname, there's actually a hostname 7, right? Well, one and five are the most common. One is programs, five are files, right? Uh, some of the other ones uh, are like seven is a overview, convention, or miscellaneous. So additional data about that hostname file. And so if I do a man seven hostname, now I can come in like a circle learn of that. Hostname resolution description. So the hostname file is used in DNS resolution. So how does it resolve a name? And then it goes through and it gives out an example. It's actually a decent narrative here on how that one works. So. You can learn a ton with the man commands if you know the name of the program to run. If you know what to look for, you can go in and you can learn everything there is about that command, about that file, about that convention, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to learn. Don, it really seems like man is its own command, and I'm assuming that means there's its own command structure and, <laughs> and a help file goes along with it. You know, there is. You can do a, a man man, and that'll pull up the manual page for the manual pager, right? And so it lays it out here with all the various things you can do with it. And this is a great place to come in and find the nine levels that I was talking about. So I can see one is an executable, five is a file format, seven is miscellaneous. Here they're laid out. So if you ever want to figure out what those numbers are, man, man, we'll tell you. All right. Well, are there any other types of um, maybe uh, help file systems that we can have available in our, in our Linux operating system? Sure. So um, there was a movement a few years ago to replace man. And I say a few years, it's probably been like five or seven years now, um, to replace man because the man page doesn't do uh, cross linking very well. Hmm. So, for example, when I was in the past WD file, it didn't link back to the past WD executable for, for whatever reason, right? So, that, that was a link that should have been there that wasn't. So, there was a movement for a while to, to replace man with a new command, a command called info. Info is almost identical to man, except it has a better way of, of interrelating commands and files and other things to make it easier to, to find stuff that's related. So this was supposed to be the logical successor. It's actually got, um, they call it uh, deep linking, where mm -hmm. they, they link one thing to another by whatever tangential connections they have. Um, it sort of caught on in that almost all documentation has been ported over to info, but most people still don't use it as a matter of course, just because it's been the man command for 30 years now, so it's hard for people to make that change. But the info command is there, and you might have noticed when I had the man page for hostname CTL up, down at the bottom where it had the C also stuff, so here's C also, um, oh, maybe I was wrong on this one. There was one of them that I pulled up earlier in the show where it actually said, hey, if you want to learn more about this, you should look at the info command for it. And so you'll see that sometimes where it will reference uh, an, an info command. Um, you know, let me show you guys a, a quick trick. And, and I was hoping to spot it here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you're in the man page, you can hit the forward slash key on your keyboard, and you can type a word, and it will look to find that word. So if I wanted to look for info, I could just type that, and it'll look for it. And yeah, I got a couple of hits, but those aren't the right ones. And you can just keep hitting forward slash, and it'll keep searching for that term. 
until hopefully you find what you're looking for. And so it must not have been that one. Maybe it was the host name command. It was one of them that I pulled up earlier, and I, I won't bore us by hunting too much more. But uh, but it said, like, you know, you may want to see these other commands, and there's the info command. So if I do info hostname CTL, it's going to pull up the info page. And the info page is a little bit different. You'll notice that it's got like a little uh, uh, status bar down at the bottom. And I can now scroll through and look at, at this information here. Uh, and as we go through, uh, we can find out. And actually, well, what it's showing here is the help file for info. And whoops, <laughs> I'm screwing it up here. It, it's really like a text web browser. Hmm. As you move through, you find links and things. And if you put your cursor on them and press enter, See how it's actually following that link? It's kind of like the old Lynx web browser. So these are all hyperlinked. They're interconnected so you can browse through. And I've gotten way away from a host name CTL at this point. But the info subsystem was supposed to be that new documentation. And, and who knows? Maybe a few years from now this will take over. But the reality is if we want linked documentation like this, you go to the vendor's website and yeah. <laughs> you pull it up from there and, and, and there you go. But we can come through and, and find all sorts of good information here, and it is all cross-linked and, and well-documented and, and so on. So um, as you go through, that's the way that this stuff is, is designed to work. And you'll see here that there's documentation not just for commands, but like the GNUC library. Here's all these different functions and calls that we can make, and then other commands that we keep going. You, you'll find a lot of stuff kind of buried in here, depending on what it is you're trying to do. Now, do know that not everything has documentation in here yet. It is still kind of an evolving thing that we'll see change over time, but uh, but it is available and it is a navigable thing that you find something, you press enter on it, you navigate into it, and now you're learning more about whatever that particular topic is. So the info command is available. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can do info info <laughs> <laughs> and pull up that and start to see a little bit more about what it is and, and how it's designed to, to work and, and so on. So that's the, the info command. I, I don't use it terribly often. Most people don't, but it is there, so I wanted you to be aware of it. All right. Well, Don, I know you got one more help tool for us uh, slated for this episode. Let's go ahead and just dive right into that. All right. So there is a problem here. The man command, and even the info command, assumes that we know the command that we're looking for, right? And I'll tell you guys, my memory is not what it used to be. And there's plenty <laughs> of times where I'm like, man, I want to change my default shell. I can't remember what the command is. So how can I pull up the help documentation if I don't even know what the command is called, right? Well, man isn't going to help me. Info maybe, because info I could, I could kind of browse to and maybe I could stumble upon it, but it would take me a long time. So there's another command called apropos. Apropos, if I can spell it. Uh, A-P-R-O-P-O-S. And what it does, or apropos, or however you're supposed mm -hmm. to say it, uh, it will let you search the help documentation for a term. So I can say, like, I want to change my shell. I can't remember what the command is, but I'm sure it involves a shell. So let me do apropos shell. And when I run that, it's going to give me a list of every command that hit on that word shell. And as I look, a lot of these are not what I want. Okay, end user shell, get user shell. And, and a lot of these are, are like type 3. I'm looking for a command. I'm looking for something that's a type 1. So I can kind of ignore those. But as we start scrolling down, I can hopefully find right here. C-H-S-H, change your login shell. So I didn't remember the name of the command, but now I found it. And once I've found it, then I can use man or info to go in and look at the, the command and figure out what's going on there. Uh, so I can say man, C-H-S-H, and now I actually get what I wanted. But that apropos is really handy for figuring stuff out. I want to add a new user account. Okay, so I might do a apropos user. And so when I run that, I start getting all these lists of commands, and right there, user add. I've got a nice short description, not a big long description or you know, crazy terminology, just create a new user account. And I probably could have been a little more specific and said, like, I, I want to add a user. And now it tries to find it a little bit better, but sometimes less is more. You know, hmm. So by saying add user, it might find things that use the word add, but not the word user, and now I've made my results a little more complex. So you usually want to provide the minimum possible here to search for a command. If I want to change uh, my network interfaces configuration, I might do apropos network. And now I get a list of commands that hit on network. And I can sift through these. And boy, that's actually a lot of commands there. Um, but you know, many of them are, are type 3. So I can ignore those. I'm looking for type 1s. And so I can come down and find the type 1s. I could even grep to, to filter. I think uh, if I remember right, apropos actually has a way to filter that. So if you do man apropos, you can find out its information. 
And you can filter in here by the type. There's a operand for that. I can't remember what it is, though. Um, so that you can say, like, just show me the type ones. Um, for me, so, sometimes I don't remember these things because I just cheat around it. Because like, <laughs> I'll do a apropos network, and then I'll just, like, grep for exactly one what you're or for. something. <laughs> yeah. Like, just give me, oops, i got to escape those. And um, uh, and by doing it that way, you know, now I just find the type ones. And so it's a little bit of a, a cheat. Uh, but there is actually a command line operator that'll that'll do that as well. But here I'm seeing executables that involve the network. And so I can look and start to spot and, and try and find what I'm looking for. Um, now, actually, this is kind of an interesting example because none of these actually do what I want. Well, I guess it's the network manager stuff. That would do it. Yeah. But like... Um, the IP command is not showing up. Hmm. The uh, IF config okay. command no. is not showing up. So some that I know would work are not here in this list. So it's not a perfect system. You've got to kind of work with it. You might have to search for a couple of different terms before you find the command that you're looking for. But if you can't remember the name of the command, apropos, it'll it'll save you. It'll help you find that command, get in there, and, and start to, to locate what you want. Now, Don, our chat room actually shouted out with a little bit of a, a, a neat thing and just typing the word help. Is an interesting, I don't know if you've ever done it, I've never had before. But if you type help, you get this. Oh, so um, this is actually a shell built in. Huh. And it's a great way, if you're using different shells, uh, so if I'm using ZSH or Bash or whatever, we can run help and you can see some of the commands that are kind of built into that shell. We, we talked about those a little bit yeah, in little the, bit. the last one, and I had mentioned just going to the shell documentation. But this is a great way to see it. And, and so you'll see like aliases, these dot or colon, you know, argument. Uh, but then you'll see other commands in here that we use all the time, like exit. I run exit all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not a binary that's on the system, though. If I look for that that command, if I look for exit, it's not on the system. It's built into the shell, so I can see it right there. So if you want to see commands like that that are available, the help command is a, a great way to see that. You can spot it. Uh, most of those do have man pages, though. So if you do, like, man, exit, you'll find some documentation. And here it's seeing, see up here, it doesn't say exit one. Yeah. It says bash built-in one. And so I can see the information there for all of the built-ins lumped into one nice, convenient file. <laughs> it's actually not very convenient at all, which is where that search command comes in really <laughs> handy. Um, this is a, a big file right here. It's quite large. Yeah. But key thing here, everybody forgets stuff, mm -hmm. right? Especially in the command line, there's a lot of commands that you use every single day. And you, you'll remember those, right? But there's commands that you don't run every day, that you run once a month or even once a year. Maybe you just run it one time. And those are ones you're not going to remember. And so that's where Apropos comes in handy. After that, man and info will get you into the documentation. You can learn what you need. And if all of those fail, then there's Google, yeah, right? So, that's right. So, you know, don't don't uh, shy away from the online resources that are out there. A lot of the vendors have great documentation on their websites. Uh, even if you don't run it, the Arch Linux wiki mm, is like some of, the, some of the best documentation that's available. Uh, I go to it all the time, and I hate running yeah, I Arch Linux. It. Yeah. Like, it's a pain to run that operating system, but their documentation is great. So, you know, great place to go and, and find that information. You know, you just use whatever resources available. That's right. There's also the Linux documentation project, very uh, nicely put together. A lot of documentation there as well. Well, Don, I'd like to thank you for helping me help you help them <laughs> help you. yeah <laughs> a lot of help going on today and that's what it was all about we got a lot of resources at our ready so that when we do forget what that command is or we're just not familiar something new we've just downloaded and installed and i need some help with that i now have some good resources in which i can find that help don we do thank you for that and as always any parting words before we go um you know stanley mentioned in the chat room that uh, you know we were showing the info command that there's mm -hmm. a p info command i'm not familiar with that one but he says it's got better linking so there you th go. there's always new documentation sources that come out so be sure to check those thanks for throwing that in there stanley uh you know don't don't shy away from help whenever nope. you can get it <laughs> if you've got a new command definitely try it out but but hopefully you've got enough here at least to get you started as you're learning the command line you'll find you lean on these help documents quite a bit and the man command even today, and I've been using Linux and Unix for a long time. I use man pages every single day. So definitely, you know, make it a part of your, your regular routine. All right. Well, Don, thanks so much for dropping by yet again. And we do thank our audience for watching. But it is that time for us to sign off. We do thank you again for watching. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Vector. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV.
All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode we are back with more in our Linux command line series. It's been so interesting so far. I'm having a great time doing this series because I love me some Linux. And the gentleman standing right here next to me, he loves it probably just as much, if not more, than I do. Mr. Don Bizet, welcome back, sir. How's it going today? It's going good. I thought you were going to try and sell me out as like a you know Mac user. Or oh. <laughs> No, I can't do that to you, man. <laughs> All right, well, we do have a fun episode. If you've been watching this whole series, you know that the first three episodes, we really just kind of spent uh, familiarizing ourselves with, with the command line itself, right? But not actually diving into commands. And so in this episode, we're going to kick that off. We're going to start with actual commands and interacting with the system via the command line. And I thought the best place to start would be navigating the file system, that a lot of the commands we run are going to be very dependent on which folder on the hard drive we happen to be in or which location inside of a directory. Because in the Unix and Linux world, almost everything is represented as a file. So when we interact with things, we're really interacting with files. So in this episode, we're going to take a look at how we can navigate around our folders, how we can find our files and, and see that information. And then we'll build off of that with all the commands that we run throughout the rest of the series. All right, Don, well, let's, let's do that. Let's start right there. I've launched my terminal, I'm in my bash shell, and now I want to start working with, manipulating, moving around inside of the directory structure. How do I do that? All right, so when you log in on pretty much any Linux system, unless somebody's messed with it, you log into what's called your home directory. And the home directory belongs to your user account. So we've got files and folders and things in there that are for you. Not for other users, just for you. It's kind of your private little space on that server or workstation. Every user should have their own home directory where they can put their stuff. But then there's tons of directories that are kind of shared that everybody has access to. Like when we run a command, all the commands have to be stored in a common area so all the users can see them. Otherwise, every time we added a command, everybody would have to have a copy of it. It'd be very inefficient. So that home directory is just yours. And usually it's in the same place on, on most distros, but it can be changed. The, the location of a home directory can be overridden. So the first command I want to show you is how to find your home directory. And so when you log in on a system, like I've logged in here, my shell isn't really all that descriptive about where I'm at. And we'll find out a little bit later. It, it does actually have some good information in here. Um, my shell is telling me, or at least my shell prompt, is telling me that I'm logged in as the deep as that user on Don's laptop. And it's telling me that I'm in the tilde directory, and I'll explain what that tilde is here in a little bit. Uh, but then that's just kind of it, right? I'm, I'm in this, this prompt, and I'm just kind of sitting here. And if I want to find out what directory I'm in, I can type pwd. And when I type that, it's going to show me my present working directory, the directory that I'm in, that I'm executing. Like if I execute a command right now, it's going to execute inside of this directory, which may or may not impact it. Some commands run the same no matter what folder you're in. Other commands run differently depending on what folder you happen to be in. So when I run PWD, it tells me that I'm actually in slash home slash dpzet. That's the folder that I'm in. All right. Now, if we take a look at, at that slash home, right? So what, what does all this mean? Okay. That very first slash, that is the root of the file system, right? The very beginning of where my file system starts. So everything should be inside of slash. Everything starts with a slash. And there might be files in there, or there might be folders. If there's a folder, like here there's a folder called home. I know it's a folder because there's a slash after it as well, right? So slash home slash, and then inside of that is yet another folder called dpzet. Now this one isn't showing a slash because I asked for my present working directory, and it's saying that this is a directory, and so that's where I'm at. But Technically, there is a slash after it to identify that I am in a folder. It's just not displayed on the screen by default. So slash home slash dpzet is the folder that I'm in. If Daniel logged in, he would be in slash home slash and whatever his user account was called. Unless an administrator overrides that. An administrator can change where your home directory is and it could be moved somewhere else. By logging in and immediately running PWD, I can find out where my home folder is. This is the folder that I've got. Right? Now, I know about the folder, but I don't really know what's inside of it. And so if I want to see what's inside of the folder, I will show you what is literally the command I run the most out of any other command, which is ls. ls is short for list. Give me a list of the files that are inside of this folder. And when I run ls, here comes this list. And I see a mixture of things that are displayed here. 
Now, my prompt is colorized. If you're using a graphical user interface, the odds are your prompt is colorized also. If you're using a shell, I mean, a, uh, like a remote shell, SSH, it may or may not be colorized. It might just be black and white, and, and that's that, right? But when they're colorized, they're nice because you can really quickly and easily tell the difference between things. Like here, I've got a downloads folder, all right? But here, I've got file.txt, and I know one's a file because it's white, and I know one's a folder because it's blue. But you have to be careful because just because they have a color here, uh, if I log in without a color, I wouldn't know which one is which. And I potentially could have a file that didn't have an extension. Like here, see, I've got .txt. That's a good indicator that this is a, a, uh, a, a file, file, not a folder. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, I might have a, um, let me just do, um, there. All right. So now I've got one that's just called movies, if I can find it. Where did it go? Middle of the screen. Oh, right, right <laughs> in the middle of the screen. If I look, there's movies. It doesn't have an extension on it. So is it a folder? No, it's just a file. It's just a file. And when we do our normal LS, I'm pulling up a listing of what's in the folder. And I don't really get great indicators aside from the color over whether something's a folder or whether something's a file. But I get a listing to see what's there. And the ls command can be modified quite a bit to show me better data. In fact, normally when I run ls, I do ls followed by dash l. All right? Dash l tells it to give me the long form of the output. Give me detailed information on each item inside of here. And when you do ls dash l, you get the list of those files with a lot more information, right? We get the file sizes. So here's how big each of these files are. We get who owns the file and we get other information. But what's really handy is right at the very beginning, the very first letter, see how some of these start with a D and some start with a dash. If they start with a D, they're a directory, they're a folder. If they start with a dash, they're a file. That's the easiest way to tell. Even, even if I didn't have colors, if I didn't know if there were file extensions or not, if it starts with a D, it's a directory. If it starts with a dash, it's a folder, right? So the ls command can tell us a lot of information. The ls command is actually really, really powerful. There's a ton more it can do. In fact, when I run ls, I normally do ls-lh. These file sizes are kind of annoying, right? So file.txt right here, I can see it is 310,847 bytes in size. Let me do the math on that, Don. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, can, it can be, especially when you have large numbers, right? That can be really difficult to read. Yeah, and, and we don't normally think in terms of bytes. We think in kilobytes or megabytes or right. gigabytes, right? So I can run ls-lh, and that'll make the output human readable, right? Dash h says make it human friendly. And when I run that, I get the same output, but look at the file sizes. Now it's 304K, right? So I know there's 304 kilobytes in size, or it can go to gigabytes or terabytes, petabytes, whatever. Uh, it'll show that on the screen and makes it a lot more readable. So these commands, you kind of need to find out what works best for you and what you're the, the happiest with. But ls-lh is really one of the, the easiest little command sequences to run to see the files and folders and know for a fact whether they are a file or whether they are a folder, uh, and we can see that information there. So easy way to differentiate and see that. So, so far we've seen the pwd command to find out what directory we're in, and we've seen the ls command to list what's inside of that directory. But let's say that I want to move to a different directory. So for example, I've got a, um, I don't know, a, a documents folder here. I want to see what documents I have or I've got downloads, what downloads do I have? I wanna go into that directory and see what's there, okay? Well, there's two ways that I can go about that. One way is I can use the ls command and I can say, show me what's in that directory. I can say ls slash home slash dpossett slash downloads, like that, okay? And when I run that command or documents or whatever folder it is that I'm, I'm wanting to interact with, right? When I run that, it's going to show me what's in that folder, right? I'm not in that folder, but it's looking over to that other location and it's going to tell me what's in there. And so when I run that, I can see where I've got uh, a couple of little files here, you know, for different things, uh, instructions on how to do stuff. I can see what's in there and there's that information, right? Now, the ls command when you run it, by default, it runs in the directory you're in, your present working directory, your PWD. 
So if I run ls by itself, it's going to show me what's in slash home slash dpossess. But by overriding that here, now it's going to show me what's in slash home slash dpossess slash documents. And that's really what I wanted here, right? But if I'm going to be running several commands and I want them all being run inside of slash home slash dpossess slash documents, it makes more sense to change my present working directory, right? And you can do that using the cd command. CD is change directory. I want to change my present working directory to something else. And I could say CD slash home slash dpossess slash documents like that. And now it's going to change it. And my prompt is updated. Not, not every uh, terminal or shell is going to have a different prompt, but this one is updated to show that I'm in the documents folder. But if I don't know that, if my prompt doesn't show it, I can always type PWD and I'll see it right there, that I'm now in slash home slash dpossess slash documents. And now when I do an ls dash lh or, or whatever, I'm seeing the documents that are right here inside of this folder. I don't have to provide the full path anymore because my present directory is now set to this documents folder. Yeah, can you imagine having to type in the full path for everything when, when it came to just using ls? Well, I can't move around. I guess I'm stuck here in my home uh, folder. And if I want to ls something, I have to work my way through it and then type in that path. That, that would get a little crazy. Like Don said, it's better just to move into that directory and then use ls. That way you only have to do it once. Yeah, and you know, when I did that that cd command, that change directory command, it, it kind of looked annoying, right? I got to yeah. type change directory slash home slash dpossess slash documents. Um, there, we don't spell it. Uh, slash documents. It's kind of a long command. I didn't actually have to type all that, right? Let me go back. And let's say I want to get into slash home slash dpossess. So I'm going to type cd slash home slash dpossess. All right. And then I know that documents folder is there. I want to change into it. Instead of typing the full path, I could type cd documents. All right. And what it's going to do is it's going to say, all right, well, you didn't give me a full path. You didn't reference slash as the root and everything underneath it. So I'm assuming that you're telling me there's a folder right here in the present working directory that's called documents. And that's what I want to change into. And so by typing CD documents, I navigate right in there. And I didn't have to type the full path. All right. But if I want to change to a folder that's somewhere completely different on the hard drive, I'm likely going to have to type the whole path. I'm going to have to type CD slash var slash log, because that's where I want to go, into that folder. And then if I want to get home, I've got to do CD slash home slash dpzet, because that's where I wanted to get. Right. So doing that, moving to an entirely different folder, yes, that requires a, a much, much longer string to type, right? But moving to something right here in our own directory is nice and easy. I can just type CD documents or downloads or whatever, and now I'm in that folder, all right? So navigating around like that is pretty straightforward. Um, there are a few other commands that are really handy, like if I want to make a directory, so earlier I, I made a folder called, or I made a file called movies, but it's not actually a folder, right? I, I might want a, a directory, a folder that's called movies. And in my case, I don't have that, right? So, um, so what I can do is I can remove that file that I made. I'm going to do rm, and I'll remove the movies file, and I'm going to run mkdir, right? That's make directory. I'm going to make a directory called movies. And this time, unlike when I made a file earlier, this time it is going to be a directory because I used mkdir. And when I use ls to pull up the listing, there's movies and it's nice and blue this time. So I know mm -hmm. it's a directory. Even if it wasn't colorized, I can do an ls-lh. And I can see that movies has a d at the very beginning, so it is a directory. And I can do cd movies. And now I'm in that folder, and I can start to put data in there and start to work with it. So that's mkdir uh, to make a directory and get that put in place. Okay. Um, the only other one I'm going to mention here is probably not really about navigation, but you will notice that some files are different. Like if you look at this awsdemo.pem, that's a security certificate. Uh, that's a regular file, and it's white. And then I've got this 1920x1080.sh, and it's green. All right, It's green because it's a program. It's been made executable. Files are not executable by default. We have to make them executable. And so there's a command, we'll talk about it in another episode, but it's called chmod, or change mode. And we can change the mode of a file, and we can change it from being a regular file to being an executable file. 
And so that's how some of these end up green like this, is they've had their mode changed to make them executable, which you can spot if you see an X in their permissions like this, the X indicates that it's executable, that it's able to be run like that, and chmod is how we assign that. Other files like that security key, where it's all dashes here, there's no X, it's not executable. So that's another one for manipulating kind of files. Uh, you usually don't have to use that except for certain scenarios. All right, well, Don, uh, one thing I noticed as you were navigating around inside of our, our file system here was that when you went to slash var slash log and you changed, you hit the enter key, your prompt changed to slash var slash log. But when you went to slash home slash depossess, it changed to like the little wavy line, the tilde or mm -hmm. tilde or whatever it's called. What the heck is that all about? All right, so there are a number of aliases that are designed to help us. They're like shortcuts that help us to not have to type so much. And we can take advantage of those. And let me, let me just show you. So the example that Daniel was giving was I had moved into slash var slash log. All right. And when I did that, my prompt shows the full, the full path right there, slash var slash log. Right. I, I can see that. But when I went back to my home directory, it was a tilde. Right, or however you say it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what, what's going on there? Well, there's an alias for tilde that says that's your home directory. It's kind of like a, a shortcut name for your home directory. If I want to get from slash var slash log back to my home directory, there's actually a few different ways to do it, but I could type cd followed by a tilde like that. And when you do that, it takes you right back to your home directory. Now, it doesn't really show it here on the screen, but if I do a pwd, I can see I'm in slash home slash dpzet. The tilde is an alias that gets us back there. In fact, there's another alias that isn't even shown on screen, which is if you just type CD by itself, it'll take you back to your home directory. So if I was in slash var slash log, and I wanted to go back to my home directory, I could just type CD and press enter, and I'm back in my home directory, right? A lot of shells have that as a built-in that lets them change directory right back to your home just by typing CD. But let's say that I was in slash var slash log, and I wanted to change back into my home folder and back into the documents folder. I could type cd slash home slash dpzet slash documents. All right. And hopefully you just witnessed the amount of typos I made there. That was yeah. kind of annoying, right? Uh, I did manage to spell documents right. I could also say cd tilde slash documents. Okay, which means go to my home folder, and inside of the home folder, go to the documents folder. And by running that, I end up right back in my home directory and back in documents. So the tilde is simply an alias, and in my case, it's an alias for slash home slash dpzet. In your case, it'll be for whatever your home directory is set to. And if you aren't certain about your home directory, I said when you first log in, you can just do pwd, that's a dead giveaway. But we can also find it, if you use the grep command, and you look for your username, so I'm going to grep for dpzet, in slash etc slash passwd, that file contains all the information about your user account, including your home directory. And so I can see right here, my home directory is slash home slash dpzet. If it had been moved somewhere else, then it would show up here as being somewhere else. And in our shell episode, we saw this file because it also shows our default shell as well. All right, So we can find that information right there. But the tilde is an alias that sends us back home. And the tilde is actually an alias for whatever's right here in past WD. Now that's not the only alias, there's some other ones. So for example, I'm in the documents folder, okay? I wanna move back to my home folder. Okay, well, I know I can type CD or I can type CD tilde and either one will take me back to my home folder, okay? But what if I was in slash var slash log and in here, maybe even deeper, right? Maybe I'm in the libvert log, uh, whoops, which I don't have permission to be in. Uh, who's somebody that I would have permission? Tune D, there we go. So I'm in slash var slash log slash tune D, right? So this is the, the folder that I'm in. Maybe I wanna get back to slash log, okay? Well, I could type cd slash var slash log, and that would get me there. But I can't type cd tilde, that'll take me home, right? Yeah. That, that doesn't work. I wanna get into slash var slash log. Well, there's an alias that refers to the folder you're in, which in my case would be tune D, or the parent folder above me. And there's an alias that's called dot dot. And the dot dot alias points to the parent folder. There's another alias that's just a single dot that points to the folder that you're in. Now these aliases are hidden, and you don't normally see them. If I do an ls-lh like this, 
I see all the files in here, and I see their information. I'm going to add an A to that. A says, show me all files, including hidden files. Right? I want to see the hidden stuff. Mm -hmm. And when I run that, there's the tune.d.log. But look at these two other values that just showed up, dot and dot dot. Right? The single dot points to this directory right here that I'm in right now. And the dot dot points to the parent, right? the parent folder. And those are handy. Now, we'll, we'll use the dot when we start talking about executing scripts later on. But for right now, the one that I care about is the double dot, because the double dot points to the parent. And so if I want to go from slash var slash log slash tune D to slash var slash log, I can type cd space dot dot. And that moves me into slash var slash log, right? So I can quickly and easily move up one folder. Well, what if I want to do multiple folders, Don? Uh, you can do multiple folders. It, it, this is where you get the uh, diminishing returns. cost of returns yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So um, if I want to get into slash var, I could type cd dot dot slash dot dot. That means go to the parent of this folder and then go to its parent. And I mean, you could do it over and over and over again, parent, 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 yeah. until you get all the way back to the root if you want. But if I just do dot dot slash dot dot, that means go to tune d's parent, which is log, and then go to logs parent, which is var, and I end up in slash var. Right? Now, the reality is, if I were actually in there, uh, so if I was in slash var, slash log, slash tune d, like that, um, cd dot dot slash dot dot, that's five characters. I could have just typed cd slash var, that's only four characters. I had to move my key fingers more on the keyboard, the letters are further apart, but it's not so much it just depends on how great of a typist you are, right? Yeah, yeah it really is. And, and these are all about convenience, right? Because right? the, the Linux kernel itself doesn't use these. These are just for humans. It's for us, mm. right? They have simple aliases for us interacting with the system. But they are there, and you're, you're welcome to take advantage of them. But, uh, you know, they, they do create a uh, uh, kind of an interesting thing. Um, for example, you know, let's say that I was in slash var, and I knew that I wanted to go into slash var slash log slash tune d. Okay, well, I could type cd log and then cd tune d like that, and now I'm in slash var slash log slash tune d. I had to do two commands. Or if I was in slash var, I could have typed cd slash var slash log slash tune d like that, the full path, and gotten in there, right? Or I could have leveraged the single dot alias and said, I want to go to this folder slash log slash tune d. That saved me a whole two letters. That's not a great advance, right? But, you know, it, it can be a little bit useful sometimes. So that's using the single dot alias. So we saw a single dot, a double dot, and the tilde. All aliases for different places. The tilde is the most handy. If you want to get back to your home directory or if you want to reference files in your home directory, that tilde comes in really handy. I might want to copy this log file somewhere. So I could use the cp command. I want to copy tunedd.log, and I want to copy it to my home folder. So I can say I want to cp tune d.log to tilde slash, and I can stop right there and yeah. just copy it to my home folder, or I could even give it a name like tune d.log.back or, or something, and now it's going to copy it, and I'll have a copy of that right there in my home directory, and I didn't have to type the full path. That's where these aliases really come in handy. Ah, man, I can really see using that tilde if my last name is something like Papadopoulos or something. Yeah. In my, well, it's a lot of typing, even though you know your own name. Well, we saw Don struggle with his. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that does happen. That tilde, I, I use that a lot. Now, another thing that I, I haven't seen you do it yet, we can list out just the properties of a single file. And a lot of times, especially when you're working with logs or things that have repetitive nature as far as file naming goes, it can be difficult because now I've got to weed through a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Is there any way we can make that a little easier? Yeah, absolutely. So let's say, um, let's say for example, that I, I want to I want to format a system, and so I know I need to use the mkfs command. Well, it's tucked away in slash user slash bin, or at least I think it is. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm going to change directory into slash user slash bin, and I'm going to try and find this command. Well, there's a lot of commands that are in this folder. I mean, I've got screen after screen after screen of stuff. Okay. So sometimes our directory listings can be really big. Oh my God, I'm yeah, still that's scrolling. A large file. Uh, this is a great example. <laughs> yes. This folder is massive. So if I want to try and find something, th this is not the way to do it, right? This is taking way too long. 
Um, oh, and in the end, it turned out to be the wrong folder because the MKFS stuff is not here. Uh, so, so anyhow, well, let's say I'm trying so to find to Espen uh, or Etsy. Uh, yeah, it must be in the other one. So yeah. I can I can switch into that one. And so there, I'm using my dot dot alias to move up into slash user and then cd into Espen and getting here. This is also a big one. There's a lot of stuff in here, including the commands that I was talking about, all the MKFS oh, commands, right? Yeah. So if I'm just trying to find those MKFS commands, when I run ls, it shows everything, right? Well. There's something that's called a wildcard I can use. And a wildcard says, show me files that match a certain pattern. And I can say, for example, I know the commands start with MKFS, so show me every command that starts with MKFS, or, or maybe just M. Show me every command that starts with M. So I can say LSM and stick an asterisk or a star there. And the asterisk means any string. So it starts with an M followed by any string. And when I run that, I just get the commands to start with M. And man, that makes it a lot easier to find the MKFS stuff, right? Or if I had done LS MKFS star, right? Now I just see the make file system commands. And now I'm getting a much more filtered view. So that little asterisk is pretty darn handy. And it's even handy if the, the command you want to use, maybe you know something that's in the middle of it, right? Like uh, maybe I'm working with a logical volume manager and I need to create something and I can't remember uh, you know, what the first two letters are, but I know it's got the word create in it. So I might do a ls star create star. So it's got something at the beginning, <laughs> it's got something at the end, but the word create is in the middle and I can run that and here I get lv create, pv create, vg create, uh, create crack lib dash dict. Uh, I uh, don't actually, Using oh, that's password, password complexity. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. so, um, uh, so I've got each of these different things here, uh, and they all contain the word create. So it's an easy way to find that. If I had just done ls create, I would have gotten nothing. There's no command called create. And if I had done create star, I would have only gotten the cracklib command because it starts with create. The other commands ended with create. So by doing star create star, I get all of them. So it's a wild card. Anyway. It's a wild card, yeah. And it's the most common wild card, yeah. an asterisk. You could be very specific, though, like... Um, uh, with the, the logical volume manager, uh, maybe I, I want to find LV create and PV create, but not VG create, right? So these two, they both start, well, one starts with L, one starts with P, but then the whole rest of it is the same. Instead of an asterisk, I could do a question mark. And a question mark means any one character, right? Not any number of characters, just one. So I could have any letter followed by V create. And when I run that, I get LV create and PV create, and that's it. I don't get VG create or whatever, because I'm just saying one single letter. And that's handy if, if there's like commands that have a number in it. And so there, there might be a few different variations, and so you can hunt those and find them down uh, like that. Uh, it can be useful sometimes, but far less useful than just doing an asterisk, right? Because I could have done the same thing with an asterisk and found those same commands, but I might have also found something like, um, you know, uh, RMV create or, or yeah. something. You know, so they had more than one letter in there. So the question mark is very similar. But asterisk, asterisk will get any number of, uh, of characters. So Don, I've noticed that as you've uh, been perusing through the file system here on your lovely uh, Linux machine, that you didn't seem to have to do a lot of hunting and, and, <laughs> and fishing for where, where do I want to go again? You seem to almost intuitively know where you wanted to go. There's a good reason for that, right? That's right. Uh, so in, in the Linux world, we have what's called the FHS, so the File System Hierarchy Standard. And almost every distro follows the File System Hierarchy Standard. So I can sit down on a Debian system, on an Ubuntu system, on a Fedora or Red Hat, CentOS, and have a pretty good idea where my files are going to be. Now, I was wrong once, right? <laughs> yeah. but I knew exactly where to go after I was wrong. Yep. So that's the file, file hierarchy system. That's how I knew where to go. And the more you work with Linux, the more you'll get familiarized with that. But just as a quick overview, and I'll put this in the show notes as well so you guys will have it. But as a quick overview, when you look at your root folder, so I'm just going to type cd slash. That takes me to the root of my file system, the very beginning. If I do an ls and take a look at what's in there, I'm going to see some folders. And these folders each have names that are specific to what's contained inside of them. And I have a pretty good idea of where something is going to be because these names are consistent. So I'm running Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You might be running Debian. And if you're doing the same thing as me, you probably see the same folders. Maybe some little variations, but mostly the same. So for example, bin and sbin 
That's for binaries and shared binaries, right? Uh, if you look inside of the user folder, or USR, that's for binaries that have been installed by us as part of the system. And so you'll have slash user slash bin and slash user slash sbin. And, and those are, are available well. Your executables are normally gonna be in one of those four folders. So when I'm looking for a program, I know it's gonna be in one of those four. And in the Red Hat world, sbin and bin are actually linked to slash user slash bin and slash user slash sbin. So that really narrows it down to two folders. For me, I know programs are gonna be in one of those two folders. That's why I didn't have to hunt for that program. Any services that generate files like log files, those will normally go into var, V-A-R, which is for various, so our various files that get stored. And so I know that when I'm looking for logs, slash var, slash log is where to go. Or your print spooler would be slash var, slash spool. Your website would store its web files in slash var, slash uh, www. www. Yep. Yep. So you kind of know those places. You learn them because it's a standard. It's pretty common. Um, some of the other ones, you've got uh, slash proc, which is where a lot of the information about your system is short for processes. Uh, a lot of, of the system statistics will come out of there. Slash etc, that's where the majority of your system configuration is stored. The config files that dictate how Linux is running are stored in slash etc. Um, slash opt are optional binaries, binaries that were not a part of the distro you installed, but were a part of third-party software that you added afterwards. Some systems don't use slash opt, instead they use slash local, which is confusing, uh, but, but it, it does happen. You know, not everybody follows the file system hierarchy, but if they do, you'll have slash opt, and that's where that will be. Um, you know, a couple others that are important, uh, let's see, slash home, right, where our home directories are, that's a pretty handy one, and slash dev, that's where all of our hardware gets detected and mapped. I made the comment earlier that in the Linux world, almost everything is referenced as a file, including all your hardware. If I go into the dev folder and I take a look, I'll see these little names that are all mapping to different hardware on my system. Like my hard drive is an NVMe drive, and so there it is right there. That's my hard drive. Or I've got a second hard drive in here. It should show as SDA. Yep, there it is. There's my SDA hard drive. Now, how did I know SDA was my hard drive? Because I memorized that, right? <laughs> so some of the stuff we have to memorize is not intuitive. Um, some of it is intuitive, though. Like, if you see slash CD-ROM, it's a pretty good yeah. uh, idea that that's probably your CD-ROM. Um, most of mine, well, CPU, I have a pretty good guess what that is, right? <laughs> so each of these are represented, though. And if you learn this, if you get used to this file system, the file system hierarchy standard, FHS, then you'll be able to jump from Linux box to Linux box and even to Unix box. You can jump over to BSD, and a lot of this will be the same. Not everything, but a lot of it will be the same. That certainly makes life easier on us. Well, Don, this has been a great look at the Linux file system, all the ways in which we can move around it, because that can definitely be very helpful. Even create directories to add to the file system if we need to. Now I can create that dash loser and put your home directory there. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a lot of fun for me. Uh, but And also just some of the basic understanding. This is the, the typical template that you'll see as far as a file system goes inside of most Linux distributions. Don, thanks so much. And as always, do you have any parting words of wisdom for us? Uh, you know, just get in there and browse around. You, you'll get used to this pretty quick. Navigating the file system is something you do every day. So these are commands that will get committed to memory really quick, and, and that'll be that. Um, there's aliases and other things you can do to make your job a little easier. A lot of these commands have advanced functions you can do to really kind of crank out some productivity. But just for the basics, ls, cd, couple of aliases, that'll be enough to get you by in the beginning. And these are commands that you'll learn for life, ones that you'll use all the way until you stop using computers. They're, they're that frequently used. All right. Well, Don, thanks again for dropping by. We do thank our audience for watching. But I'm looking at the clock, and it is well past time for us to quit. So thanks again for watching. We're going to go ahead and sign off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizet. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're getting back in the swing of things with more in our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio yet again, you know him, you love him, he's our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzetta. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going today? Hey, it is going great, Danny. Ready to dive right back into the command line. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at working with files, right? In the last episode or earlier ones, we got a chance to look at the ls command and how we could look at the file system. We could navigate the file system and get around. 
But the whole point about the file system is that it's got files in it. So <laughs> we should probably learn a little bit about messing around with those files. So that's what we're going to take a look at right here in this episode. All right, Don, when you say messing around with files, I assume <laughs> you mean manipulating them, looking at them, moving them, doing stuff like that. Absolutely, yeah. And and let, let's start with looking at them, right? Okay. So just, just being able to see the contents of a file is an important thing. Uh, we've already seen the contents of files through various other utilities, like when we ran the man command of you man pages. Uh, manual pages are really just files stored on the hard drive somewhere, and it, it finds them and retrieves them and puts them on the screen. But as you work with the operating system, you're going to want to view files as well, either your own files or configuration files. Maybe I just want to see how the OS is configured. I need to see those files. So we're going to do that uh, right here, and I'll start with one of the oldest Unix commands, one that is present in every operating system. It is the cat command, C-A-T. And what cat does is it lets us take the, the data from inside of a file and display it on the screen, right? We can just take it and, and export it and, and bring it into what's called the standard out, which is your screen. That's what you see. So for example, here on my system, uh, I have a copy of the full text of Moby Dick, which uh, Daniel had suggested. That came from uh, Project <laughs> Gutenberg. Uh, Moby Dick is a massive novel, so I figured this was a, a pretty good example here. Plenty of here. text to work with. Huh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So if I want to read this, if I want to see the data that's inside of that file, I can use the cat command. And I can just say cat Moby Dick, if I can Moby spell disc. it, Moby <laughs> Dick uh, text. There we go. All right. So I can type that in, and it's going to basically use that text file as the input to feed that into the cat command, which will then display it on the screen. All right. So if we want to read it, there we go. And that was it. We just read Moby Dick in record time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I hope you're Superman or something like that, because that was pretty quick flashby. Yeah, that's the thing about the cat command is um, that no no holds barred, right? No, it pulls no punches. It no throws training wheels. All the text right at you all at once. Now, if you've got a file that just contains one or two lines, the cat command is great. It'll show those one or two lines, and that's it. But Moby Dick is thousands of, <laughs> yeah. of pages long or yeah. whatever. It's a massive amount of data, and so while the cat command is handy it can be a little bit on the excessive side. And so while it is a, a very old tool, one that's been around a long time, one that is there to be used, I admittedly don't use it very often because there are other utilities we can use that help with that, right? For example, the more utility. More is just like cat, except it creates little pauses every 24 lines so that you can read the text and then move forward. So it's a little more handy, a little more human, right? The cat command is really useful when we're doing scripting. When I want to take the contents of one file and dump it into another file, I don't need page breaks. That's not a human operation. It's a script doing it. Just give me all the text at once and let me throw it over here. That's what cat does. But as a human, the more command is better. And if I do more and I provide that, uh, I'm going to use tab autocomplete. I cannot <laughs> type today. Yeah. Uh, with the command line, you've got tab autocomplete, which is nice. So you type the first couple of characters and hit tab, and it fills it up the rest <laughs> of the way. So I'll do uh, more Moby Dick text, and this time when I run it, see how it stopped? And here's the very beginning. We get that famous first line, the <clears throat> "Call me Ishmael," right? And, and then here it goes, and, and we get the text. And I can see I'm zero percent of the way through this novel. And if I press the space bar, it jumps to the next page. And the next page, and the next page. And unfortunately, this novel is so long that I'm still 0% of the way through. <laughs> but if I hold that space bar, <laughs> I'm 8%. You're 8%, through. son. <laughs> this this you know, would take a while to yeah. get through. But I can scroll through now, and I get pagination. So when you know you're going to be looking at something that is longer than, than one screen, right, uh, or if you just don't want to scroll back, because I, I do have my scroll back buffer here in my term. Hold on, I was reading that. <laughs> <laughs> So I can always use my scroll back buffer if I've got one. I, I might not have a scroll back buffer if I'm using like the, the physical console of a machine. I wouldn't right. have that. Uh, but this gives me that page break. Every 24 lines I can read, I can advance, and we can move forward. Now, there's really three kind of keystrokes we need to remember with the more command. One is the space bar. That's what I was just using. Every time I hit space, it advances a page. Okay. There's also the enter key. And if I press enter, it's moving one line. If I just want to go ahead one line, it's the enter key. If I want to go a full page or 24 lines, that's space. So enter in space. And if I reach the end of this document, which eventually would happen, then enter or space will actually exit the document. I've reached the end. 
But if I want to get out of it right now, I'm 9% of the way through. I don't want to get the rest of the way. I can just hit Q on the keyboard. And Q will take me out. And now I'm out of the file. And now I'll never learn about what happens to Queequeg's <laughs> and Vicious Soul. So we had space for moving ahead of page, enter for moving ahead of line, and Q for quitting out. Right. If you remember those three things, those are the three most useful things to use inside of the more command. But just think of more as like cat for humans. Cat is great for programmatic operations. More is great for humans. Now, Don, there's a similar command to more called less. Am I um, correct? Yeah, yes, there is. And, and honestly, uh, I use less more, more than, than I use more. more. This yeah. gets really confusing. <laughs> uh, so the more command is, is the original one that adds pagination to pretty much anything. But more has some limitations. For example, more only moves forward, right? So what if I'm, I'm reading Moby Dick? Here, let me, let me clear my screen. And I'm, I'm reading it, and I move forward a few pages, and I'm like, oh, shoot, I want to go back a page. Well, too bad. More <laughs> only goes forward, and that's it. So somebody came up with a new utility, a more on steroids, as they came up with a creative name of less. And unlike the name implies less, actually has more <laughs> features than the more command. So sometimes less is more. Yeah, that's right. I think that's the witty joke that's yeah. supposed to go along with that. Um, but if I do less, and I say less, mobydick.txt, when I pull that up, it looks a lot like more. Okay, it's not giving me my percentage at the bottom, but otherwise it kind of looks the same. And if I hit the space bar, I go forward a page. And if I press enter, I go forward a line. And if I press Q, I exit it. So, so far it's exactly like the more command. Okay, but let me show you the big difference here. If I move forward, I can also move back. I can use my up and down arrow keys to go forward and backwards through this file. All right, so I'm just hitting up and down the, the arrow keys. I can also hit page down and page up, and it's honoring those. More doesn't honor page down and page up. So if you have page up and page down keys on your keyboard, you can hit those and you can move backwards and forwards. So now I just returned all the way back to the top of the document, or I can go forward like that. So I get a lot more flexibility with this command, the ability to easily scroll forwards and backwards, and that makes less a lot more common for me. I'll use it because it gives me the ability to move around in the text like that, uh, and that's a pretty handy thing. Now, less actually added a lot of other features too, features that some of which are implemented more, some aren't. For example, I can do a search if I want to search for a term. So um, when, when we originally pulled this document up before the show, uh, I got it from Project Gutenberg. They're, they're a free service. They take classic literature and they, they turn it into text files, make it available for free. Uh, they had appended, for whatever reason, like 500 lines of text to the beginning of this file that were all just junk. And so I had to find out where the, the, the book actually started. And I remembered it starts with, call me Ishmael, right? That's that famous first line. And so what I did is from the beginning of the, the book, I did a search. I searched for that string. And in both less and more, you can hit the forward slash on your keyboard and now we can do a search. And so I could search for call me Ishmael. And the hardest part there is remembering how to spell Ishmael, mm -hmm. which I'll be honest with you, I didn't remember. So I actually searched for call me. <laughs> <laughs> I searched for. And I searched and it found it. It took me right to that line. Now that, that works in more as well as less. And if I want to search again, like maybe I actually am searching for Ishmael, right? So I, I want to know every time Ishmael is mentioned in the novel, right? And so I do a forward slash, I type Ishmael, and I do a search, and it found him. And then I can search again. I can hit forward slash and press enter, and now it searches again. And it keeps moving forward and forward, and I can search through the whole novel looking for that. I'm, I'm already in chapter 8, chapter 11. We're cruising right through this novel. That's really neat. That works in more. But in less, not only can I search forward, I can search backwards as well. It was a forward slash to search forward. It's a question mark to search backwards. Now, that, that might not sound intuitive. You might say <laughs> yeah. to yourself, why didn't they use the backslash to search backwards? Wouldn't that make sense? And the reason is if you look at your keyboard, at least on a standard US keyboard, the forward slash and the question mark share the same key. So that's why they use it. That becomes your search key. And the default is forward, which is the forward slash, and then the question is backwards. 
Don, I believe a uh, hotkey combination that they give you as well is using the N and U buttons for, so N lets you search down and then U searches up, or yes, is that paging? After, after your first search, right. so you have to do the first you search using search. slash or, or, or question mark, right. and then after that you can continue to use slash and question mark, or you can use N and U, yeah. and, and those will move to the uh, next or previous entry, so you can look and find those. There's a lot of shortcuts that are yeah. available for these things. <laughs> Uh, and, and these programs are a lot more powerful, too. I, I, I'm just showing you some of the, the key features mm -hmm. to get by. Uh, I think the searching forward and backwards is a pretty key feature, though. So, yeah. um, But you'll see here that less is actually a lot more powerful than more. And I know a lot of people who alias it, so anytime they go to run more, it actually runs less instead. Uh, but both commands are pretty standard on, on operating systems these days, and you'll find them uh, just installed by default, right? I didn't have to install more. I didn't install less or cat, for that matter. All of them are there. It's just me making a decision. Do I want the whole volume of text displayed at once? Use cat. Do I just want simple pagination and I'm only moving forward like in a, a log file? Well, more is fine. But if I want full flexibility to move backwards and forward, less is the best one. So all three are available. You kind of choose for your scenario. You really can't go wrong with, with less uh, if it's you. But programmatically, less is really annoying. So programmatically, you'd want to go with cat. Now, Don, what if I have a huge file, much like Moby Dick? Typically, though, in, in, as a user, I've probably got some log files that I need to look through. But if I cat the file, it's going gonna, it's gonna to dump the entire log. It's going to be a, a very large amount to scroll yeah. through. I could use more and less. But what if I just want to see what was the last entry you sure. know, or the last few entries? You know, a, a log file is a great example of that, right? Yeah. So when my system boots up, it generates this big log file. And I might want to see just the first couple of lines or the last couple of lines of the log. You know, show me the, the last things that happened. That uh, I just got an error, so I know the entry is right there at the end. So I could use a command like more or less or cat to view the log and, and see the whole thing. But if I just want to see the beginning or the end, you've got the tail and the head commands, right? Or heads and tails, right? Heads <laughs> and tails. <laughs> head shows you the beginning of a file, and tail shows you the end of a file. And by default, they show you 10 lines, but you can customize that however you want. So if I want to see just the first 10 lines of the Moby Dick file, I could come in here and I could type head mobydick.txt. And when I run that, there's the first 10 lines, and that's it. It stops, right? It ne never even got to call me Ishmael, yeah. right? So, <laughs> so it, uh, it just displayed the first 10 lines, and there it is. Or I can tail and ruin the ending of the story <laughs> and do mobydick.txt. And, uh, and they're, oh, good. It, it's Project Gutenberg. I, I didn't ruin the ending. <laughs> yeah. They've got a, yeah, yeah, a little footer there. So, uh, so I see just the last 10 lines. Well, maybe I want the last 15 lines or, or the first lines until I get to that call me Ishmael, right? Yeah. Well, with each of these, if you, if you take a look at like the, the head command, whoops, uh, if I take a look at its documentation, you'll see that it's got this dash N option where you can specify the number of lines that you want. So I could say head dash n15 mobydick.txt. And now it's going to give me the first 15 lines, and there it is. There's call me Ishmael. Or if I really wanted to be strict and not even get that 15th line, I could drop that down to 14. And now there I am, and I get it, and, and we can kind of roll forward from there. Tail works the same way. I might want to tail the last 50 lines. And you can do that, and you'll get just those last 50, and they'll come up. Now, another neat thing is you can actually combine some of these commands together. And there's times where we might want to do that. I might have a large file like Moby Dick. When I use less on the Moby Dick file, it loads the entire file into memory so that I can scroll through it, right? So the bigger the file, the more of it's going to go into memory. Well, maybe I only want to look at the first 100 lines. I know that head can do that. I can say head dash n 100 for Moby Dick, right? But now I'm not getting my ability to scroll and search. So I, I loaded less in the memory, but I, I didn't, uh, well, I, I loaded less content in yeah. the memory. You gotta be careful here. Um, but I, I kind of lost the ability to, to use scrolling and searching and all that. So I could take the head command or the cat command, and I could take their output and send it to one of the other commands. In the, the Linux and Unix command prompt, you can use the pipe symbol. It's the, the two vertical lines. It's usually right above your enter key and shares the, the backslash key. Uh, you can use the pipe symbol to say, take the output from one command and send it to another command. So I could take the output from head-n100 and I could send it to less. 
And now I get all the advantages of less for the first hundred lines of Moby Dick. So I haven't loaded as much into RAM. And that can be really handy. See how I just reached the end of the file and I'm, I'm not even through chapter one of the book. I'm combining the commands together, right? Uh, and you'll see people who do like where they cat a file and then they redirect it into the more command, right? To say, I want to see the whole file, but I want pagination, so I'll use more to do it, which is really <laughs> redundant because you could just say more uh, for the you know, Moby Dick yeah. file, it's yeah. the same result, right? But, but they work, right? You can take the output from one command and feed it into another, and feeding it into less or feeding it into uh, tail, that, that'll help you to just get the information that you want. So it's a great way to kind of view and, and manipulate that text and see what's going on. All right, Don, well, we've been working with uh, files that we already have on our system. What if I wanted to create my own file? All right, so if I want to create my own file, basically I need to get data in there. And, and we're going to see later on that there's various text editors we can use, like Vim and Nano and all those guys. Uh, but a lot of times the data is coming from somewhere on our system. So I mentioned, for example, that there is a, a log that's generated when my system boots up, right? If I use the D message command, D M E S E. D-M-E-S-G, D-Message. If I run the D-Message command, it shows me my boot log, okay? And it's a lot of data. In fact, a lot of That's this a lot. <laughs> is, this isn't even Wireless my boot. Stuff. This is me bouncing from access point to access point here in the mm -hmm. building. But we've got, I don't know, 14 access points or something. So anytime you move access points, it generates a log message. But somewhere back here in the beginning, I'm going to encounter where my system actually booted up, right? Um, which, you know, it might have been a few days since I rebooted it. <laughs> but here's a great example where my terminal only has a buffer of 10,000 lines. So if I haven't rebooted in a few days, then I might not even be able to scroll all the way back to where this thing started, right? So I might have a problem there. In fact, I could use the uptime command to find out. Um, it's two been days. two days, yeah, two days and an hour since I've rebooted. So I have to go back quite a ways to actually find the boot log, right? But what I could do is I could take that D message output and I could put it into a file and I could then use less and search through it or more or head, tail, I could use all that other stuff on the, the, the data. So I wanna take the output of this command and I wanna send it into a file. And we can do that through a few different means, right? Uh, we can either do it live where the file already exists or we can create files ahead of time and then add the data into them. And it's kind of up to us how we want to, to go about that. But just to show you a quick example here, uh, I'm going to do a D message, and I'm going to use a greater than symbol. And a greater than symbol says, take the output of whatever the first command is, and then stick it somewhere else, right, into a file somewhere else. And so I'm going to take this D message output, and I'm going to put it into bootlog.txt. Okay, so it's going to run. And what do I see on the screen? Nothing, right? Instead of putting this data on my screen, it redirected it. It redirected that output from standard out to this file, bootlog.txt. And if I take a look in my directory, I've now got a bootlog.txt. And if I pull the long output for that, uh, I'm going to make that human readable, it is uh, 336K, not as long as Moby Dick, for mm. the record. But, uh, <laughs> Still <laughs> but it's substantial. <laughs> And now I can come in and I can take the command like less and I could feed into it that bootlog.txt and now it starts from the very beginning. And here is where my computer booted up. I see the Linux kernel initializing right there. And it you know initialized my C groups, the, the processor groups, and then memory is initializing. This is when my computer booted up. I'm right here at the beginning. And I can search through and I can look for things. You know, Maybe I wanna find if there were any errors uh, that occurred. I might be error free. Apparently I am. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'm error free. Uh, but I can search through and look for various things. Maybe I want to find where it mounted a hard drive or something like that. Uh, and so I can search and I can find that. And here it is. And I might be thousands of lines in, but I just jumped to it and got there. So we can pull that information really easily. And I got the data into this file by just doing a redirect. I took the output of one command, D message and I use the greater than symbol and then dump it right into a text file. And this, this text file, this bootlog.txt did not exist. So Linux created it and said, oh, you want this, it's not there, I'll just make that file and put this content inside of it. Yeah, yep, that's, that's basically how it works. And, and so now I've got that file and it's there. Um, 
there are a few other ways that we could have done this to, to get the data in there. Um, and there's, there's other things that I could have output into it. Uh, if I run this command again, it's going to overwrite that bootlog.txt. So what was that? Whatever was in bootlog is going to get overwritten with whatever's in the new dmessage command. Or if I ran something else, you know, maybe I ran uh, uname-a, like that. And the, the uname-a command, if you're not familiar with that one, it just shows what kernel you're running. Right? So if that's all I wanted to know, I didn't have to go to my dmessage for that. I could have pulled it right from uname. Or you can run uname by itself, and it just says you're running Linux, which is pretty pointless. <laughs> um, but if I want uname-a and I send that, into bootlog.txt, the file already exists. So what does it do? It overwrites the file. And so now when I take a look at bootlog.txt, that's all it's got is that one line, that one little entry, and I just lost all the D message stuff that was in there. Okay. So when you do a redirect like this, if the file already exists, you need to make a decision. You might want to overwrite it, in which case you just redirect like I did. But you might want to append and say, I want to add on to the end of that file instead. Okay, And you can do that by doing two, whoops, <laughs> by screwing up the prompt, by doing two greater than signs. Right? By doing this, by saying, and I'll change it so it's D message this time. I'm going to do D message and two greater than symbols, bootlog.txt. That's going to take the D message output and stick it on the end of that file. So don't overwrite it, add to it. And this is oftentimes what we want. And when I run that, again, I don't get any output on my screen. But when I take a look at bootlog.txt, there's the output for uname-a right at the top. And then after that starts the output for the message all right after it. I just appended and added on to it. So uh, a single greater than sign versus a double greater than sign, that's going to move that data and, and get it in there. Well, Don, these redirectors seem pretty handy. Are there any others that we need to be aware of when it comes to redirection? There's a few others that are a little more useful, like uh, in, our, in our scripting series. I know we'll, we'll redirect errors. Uh, when you run a program, there's two different outputs that you get. There's the successful output with data, and then there's the error output if there's a problem, if something goes wrong. And so you might want to redirect just the good stuff or just the error. Well, by default, it is just outputting the good stuff. So when the command runs, the greater than symbol is grabbing the good stuff and putting it where you want it to go, right? That's standard out. But there's standard error also, S-T-D-E-R-R. -R. And standard error is just the errors if you have them. Now, I didn't have any errors, so there was nothing to output, right? If I run D message and I just do the normal thing that I've been doing here so far, that's redirecting the standard out, the good stuff. And if I want the errors, what I need to do is stick a two before it, okay? The first output is the good stuff. The second output are the errors. And if there are any errors, it will take them and dump them into bootlog.txt. Now, when I run that, see how I got stuff on the screen? That's because I didn't redirect the standard out. The standard out still goes to wherever it's supposed to go, which is my screen. Just the errors get redirected. And if I take a look at uh, bootlog.txt, it's now empty because there were no errors. There were no errors to output. But if there were errors, they get saved there. And that's a great way, like when you're running a script, to say, I need to log the errors somewhere else. And you could do that by, by redirecting it this way and dumping it that way. All right. Uh, you know, another thing is that uh, the redirectors, you can flip it around. And instead of taking the output of a command and sending it into a file, I can do the opposite, where I take the contents of a file and I send them into a command. All right. So, for example, the uh, uh, let's say I do, oh, I don't know, uh, ls-lh, right? That shows me all the files that are in my directory, right? Uh, or, or just ls for that matter. And I, I see the files that are in my directory. Well, I might want to take those and alphabetize them. And oh, actually, it won't work here because it's all in it's one line. Alphabetized. And <laughs> it's alphabetized. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, it does alphabetize, doesn't it? So, um, uh, so if I wanted to take this, though, and feed it into some other command, I could take a document, I could take like Moby Dick for that matter, right? And let's say that I wanted to take the contents of Moby Dick and alphabetize it. I, I don't know why you <laughs> want to do this, but uh, you can use the sort command to alphabetize anything, right? So if you, if you look at the syntax for the sort command, it tells you to provide it a file and it'll take that file and it will sort it to match what you, what you need. So for example, if I take, uh, oh here, let's just do like slash user slash bin, right? So here's a bunch of binaries. And they're already alphabetized for me in here, right? But if I take that directory listing and I'm going to 
drop that into a file called binaries.txt. Okay. Well, maybe I I want that. I, I want to be able to see the files that are in there, right? So if I take a look at my new binaries.txt file, here's all the binaries, and they're alphabetized from A to Z. Okay. Well, maybe that's not what I want. Maybe I want it to be from Z to A, right? Well, if I do it from a command, I could say uh, ls slash user slash bin, and I could pipe the output into the sort command, which by default would sort alphabetically. And I could sort it with a dash r to reverse the sort order, and there it goes, right? Uh, and I'd have to scroll back to see it all, but now it was from z to a. The a's were at the end versus if I did sort without the dash r, the z's would be at the end, okay? That's good if you can run the command now. But if somebody gives you a file, you know, the command's already been run. And so you've got this data, this output from a database, and I might want to sort it and change that order. What I could do is I could use the sort command, and I could do a less than symbol and feed in a file like that. I'm going to take that text file and make it input instead of output. Instead of taking the output of a command and saving it, I'm taking the file as an input and feeding it into the command, doing it the other way around. And now I can do that, and it sorts it from A to Z. And I could even go further. We get really crazy with this. Uh, and then I could pipe that into the less command. And now we really get some fun. Right? <laughs> and here's the Zs first going all the way down to the A. And we're kind of three levels deep. right? I redirected the file as input, and then I redirected all of that into the less command. Now you can keep going on this. It's called pipelining. You can keep going adding command after command after command to really create some powerful scenarios. So if you mix all these together, you can really get some great information. The information put the way that you want it to be. Yeah, there's a fun thing. They call them uh, one-liners uh, a lot of times. Uh, there's a site called Bash One-liners, and they just give you crazy one-liners that you can type in on a single <laughs> single line and hit it. It does a lot of amazing, powerful stuff. Very cool. Yeah. Now, Don, I, I know we got a little bit of time left. I don't know if you want to try to finish well, this up or... No, I, I've got a, a couple other things. I want to talk about, like... Copying files, moving files, mm. deleting files, uh, renaming files. I, I also want to talk about um, file expansion, how we can kind of create files. Uh, something I, I kind of missed in my notes. <laughs> we need to cover that. Uh, so let, let's do a part two on this one. Right. And we'll, we'll tackle some of those other elements that all kind of come into this. So really what we did here in this episode was all really just looking at the contents of a file. And, and sure, we created some, but we were really just redirecting content somewhere else. So now I want to talk about how we actually create some files, and, and we'll do that in part two. All right. Well, Don, look forward to that part two. Thanks for joining us today. We do thank you good folks out there for watching. But as the man has said, we are out of time for this episode. So join us back for that part two. I'm going to give you a lot more good stuff when it comes to working with files in the Linux command line. As for us, though, signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, well, guess what? We're back with more Linux command line stuff. Joining us back in the studio yet again, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzette. Don, we're so glad to have you again. How's it going today? It is going great, and, and thank you for the chance to come back and cover all the stuff that I didn't get to in the last episode, which uh, there were a couple of things that we wanted to tackle, but we're, we're going to continue our adventure with manipulating files, right? We spent our time in the last episode reading files, redirecting output, and kind of messing around with them. But there's a lot more that we can do that are basic shell commands. We're going to take a look at them right here in this episode. Now, Don, you made a great point that we were when we were creating our files, we were basically kind of using commands or, or redirecting that output into a file, and that's where the file creation came from. But what if, and, and hang with me here, follow me if you will, <laughs> what if I just want to create a file with a file name, but it's empty? I, I just want an empty file so that I can manipulate it later. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually pretty easy to create a file, and, and usually... Usually we don't just create an empty file. We we use a program that generates data so that we save it. And if we don't have data, there's not really a whole lot of need for a placeholder. But there are times that we want to create placeholders. And usually it's with folders. I want to create a bunch of directories that are there so people can start to put their documents. I might need to set permissions before people put their documents there. So we need to know how to go about 
doing those things? How do we create these files, create these placeholders so we can have permissions set on them ahead of time, right? And one of the easiest ways to do it is using the touch command. Touch is a command that lets you, well, in the past, it was just make a subtle alteration to a file. Every file has a timestamp, right? And the timestamp reflects the last time that it was modified. So for example, if I look in my little lab folder here, I'm gonna do a ls-lh. I want the long output and I want the size as human readable. But when I look, there's this September 21st, 1026 on binaries and September 21st, 1024 on bootlog, right? What that means is that these files were last modified on September 21st at 1024 and 1026 versus the Moby Dick file that was modified much earlier at 953, right? Those are the timestamps. And the touch command allows you to touch a file, which doesn't actually change it, but it does update the timestamp to now, right? That was its original intent. But we can actually use the touch command to create our own files as well. So maybe I want to start creating some memos and I want Daniel to be able to come in and edit the memos as well. So I need to set some permissions on them ahead of time before I've actually put anything in there. So I might want to create a file called memo.txt, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll throw that in there. And, and you know, let me, let me make a, a quick clarifying statement here. Uh, Stanley in the chat room had a good comment. I, I keep doing file extensions, which is really a carryover to the old Microsoft days, but it, uh, most people do them. Remember that in the Linux and Unix world, we're not beholden to file extensions. You don't have to have them. That we typically do them as a, a way to let people know what the type of data is in the file, but it's it actually courtesy. has no bearing. It's what? a courtesy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, because a lot of times up. we're like, what kind of file is this? What do I open it with? So those extensions can help us. Yeah, because there is a risk that you know, maybe it's not a text file at all. Maybe right. it's a binary. And if I open that, it's going to cause various problems. And so uh, by placing an extension on that, we, we've kind of got that note. Uh, and what, what Stanley in the chat room was mentioning was that if we don't have an extension, it, it still works, but you can use the file command to see what kind of data is in there. So if I do like file mobydick.txt, it tells me it's ASCII text. If it tells me it's a binary, I don't want to go messing with the file. The file needs to be left alone, but if it tells me it's text, then it's okay to manipulate. So, uh, but anyhow, I, I do the extensions. Most people do just because it's that, that kind of flag to let people know what's in there. So when I ran touch memo.txt, what it did is it made a completely empty file called memo.txt, all right? And if I do the ls-lh and look at it right there, I can tell that it's completely empty. There's nothing in it, it's got a zero byte size. In fact, if I were to use that file command on it and run it against it, it can't tell me whether it's a binary or not because it's completely empty. So it just tells me, hey, it's empty. You can do whatever you want with this file, right? So I just created a placeholder by using that touch command. And now I can manipulate that file however I need to. I can uh, you know, set permissions or whatever, and then we can flow data into it and get it in there. Now, the touch command by itself is really, really simple. It used to provide a file name yeah. and that's it. But you can take advantage of some other bash technologies here to really do some fun stuff. So for example, um, let's say that I wanted to create five memos. Memo1.txt, memo2.txt, memo3.txt, memo4.txt, memo5.txt. I could run each one of those. I could say touch and then each entry. Or in the bash prompt, we can actually do what's called expansion, where I can send it one command that's then run multiple ways depending on a, a field of values, right? And I know that sounds confusing. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. I could say touch memo and then do a curly brace, which is the little squiggly bracket or whatever on your keyboard, I'll do a curly brace. And I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then I'll close that uh, curly brace and I'll put .txt. Okay. What's going to happen is Bash is going to see that. My shell is going to see the curly braces and say, wait a minute, this isn't the name of the file anymore. This is an expansion. What Don is actually saying is memo1.txt, memo2.txt, memo3.txt. It's going to interpret that and it's going to run it. I ran one command it's actually gonna run it five times, though assuming I did it right. And so if I take a look, sure enough, there I've got memo one through memo five. If I, let me get that as a list. So I can see each one was created and they're right there in place. So if I'm creating placeholder directories or placeholder files like this, usually we're creating a lot of them and a simple expansion like this can be really, really handy. I mean, you can even get really advanced. You can do more than one expansion, right? Um, maybe I'm creating schedules for three people. So I'm gonna do uh, me, Daniel, and Ronnie. 
and I want to have a morning and an afternoon schedule for everybody. So I want Don dash morning, Don dash afternoon, Ronnie dash morning, Ronnie dash afternoon. So that would be a, a lot of files to create. If there's two schedules and three people, it'd be six files I've got to create. But I could do it all right here in one command. I could say touch, and then I'm going to do Don, Ronnie, Daniel. Right there's my first expansion, right? And then I'm going to say dash and a second expansion where I'll say morning, afternoon, right? And then if I want to stick a, an extension on there or, or whatever, I can, I can leave it off. Uh, and it'll create those, and it's going to run the commands. It'll take it and run Don dash morning, Don dash afternoon. Then it'll do Ronnie dash morning, Ronnie dash afternoon. Then it'll do Daniel dash morning, Daniel dash afternoon. More than one expansion happening here at the same time. And when I run that and take a look at it, there I can see the two Daniel schedules, the two Don schedules, and the two Ronnie schedules all created in place. And that's doing what's called an expansion. Uh, I'm, I'm expanding text inside of a command into more than one command. And that really does save us time. I'm doing it here with the touch command. You can do this with really any command. Any time that you're manipulating multiple files, expansion can really save you a lot of effort uh, to be able to grab those files and act upon them. Um, I kind of did it the hard way, like when I made those memos, where I did memo uh, one through five, I listed each one individually. It does support ranges. So like if I wanted to create six through nine, I could come in here and say uh, memo six dash, or sorry, dot dot nine. You do double dots to indicate the, uh, the range. And by doing that, I don't have to list every number in between, right? Uh, so now it's going to be a range of numbers that it'll create. And when I do that and take a look at it, now I've got six through nine created. And by doing a range, you could go into the hundreds of thousands and it would whip out a thousand files just like that. Uh, you know, really, really easy. All the other commands we're going to see in this episode, like copy and move and stuff, they work with these expansions as well. So this is a really handy technique to learn to make it easy to work with large amounts of files. All right, Don, well, let's, let's go down that road. Let's talk about copying files. We've created some files. We know how to make that happen. It's pretty simple, and you've given us some really great power in which to make uh, making multiple files very, very easy. Let's say I've plugged in a USB drive. I've made some files here, and I, I want to make a backup of them. I want to copy them to my USB drive. How would I do that? All right, so the files we've made so far are empty, which is pretty lame. Yeah. So normally, <laughs> we want to make a file that has some data in it, and a lot of times we're getting that data from somewhere else. And so the copy command can be used to reach out and grab that data from somewhere else and place it into our file. The copy command is pretty straightforward. The command itself is actually CP, right? Uh, in the original Unix days, they would just take a verb and drop the vowels out of it. And, you know, Y sometimes counts as a vowel. So the O and the Y disappear and you get CP. They didn't always do that. So, like, when you want to make a directory, they didn't just do MD. It's M-K-D-I-R. The yeah. I is still there. So it's not always that way. But the original commands are usually just two letters like this, CP. And if I want to copy a file, I then specify the source of the data and then the destination. So maybe I want to copy mobydick.txt into, uh, you know, just a file.txt, right? The source is mobydick.txt. The destination is file.txt. And so when I run that, it's just going to copy one to the other. So now I have two copies of Moby Dick. And if I do ls-lh, I can see Moby Dick right here at 1.2 megs. And I can see file.txt here at 1.2 megs also. Now, from that respect, it's pretty simple. But let's think back to our navigating the file system episode. Because normally, the file that you're copying is going to be copied to somewhere else. I'm copying from one location to another location. So I might want to make a backup of a log file that's available somewhere. So maybe I want to edit it. I don't want to edit a real log file. So if I get into like slash var slash log, and I look around in here for a, a log file, like the, the messages file, or actually I probably don't have access to that. Uh, let me make sure that it's a file I have access to here, dmessage, right? I could do cp dmessage because I'm in this folder, and then I might want to copy that, whoops, I might want to hold the right key here. <laughs> I might want to copy that to my home folder, and I could type that out, you know, slash home, slash dpossess, slash lab, slash bootlog.txt, right? I'm copying from the source location to the destination. And remember that all the aliases that you have work. So instead of slash home, slash dpossess, I could have done tilde, 
slash lab slash bootlog.txt, and that's going to copy it and paste it there, right? I was able to say that I was copying D message because there's a file called D message right here, and I just happened to already be in that folder. I was in that directory. But what if I wasn't? If I wasn't in that directory, if I was somewhere else, like in my home directory, then I would need to do full paths for these guys. I would need to say that I'm copying slash var slash log slash D message, right? Or D message dot old, whichever one I was grabbing, I'll do D message. And I want to send it to tilde slash lab slash bootlog dot txt. And I can run that and it copies it over. Okay. Now, quick note here, each time that I copied it, I've been overwriting the same file each time. It never warned me, did it? Right? Copy does not warn you. It just overwrites. So be careful with that. If you're trying to append, this is not the way that you do it. Or if you don't know if there's data there or not, you should go ahead and, and check before you do this. It doesn't give you a warning. It assumes that you know what you're doing. <laughs> and, and that's not always the case. And I do know some people who actually take a, a safety measure. There's a, a command line argument with copy. I think it's dash I. Let's find it here real quick. Yeah, dash I. It's interactive, right? That makes it prompt before overwrite. And so a lot of administrators, people who perform sensitive uh, actions, a lot of times they will alias the CP command to always use dash I. And when you do that, if the file already exists, it'll warn you and it'll say, ooh, are you sure you want to overwrite this? And maybe you are. Yeah, yeah I know what I'm doing. Yes, stop asking me. <laughs> or maybe you didn't. And you're yeah. like, oh, well, I need to double check that. And you can say no. It gives you that chance to stop. But CP by default does not uh, give you that warning. Yeah, I think that's a really great option, especially because when you're typing, it's really easy to uh, what we like to call fat finger and, and do the wrong thing. So just having that little extra set of training wheels on, make sure that you don't overwrite a file that you don't want overwritten. Uh, can definitely be very helpful. But we've talked about comping files. What if I'm like, okay, this file is great, but it doesn't belong here. I need to move it somewhere else. I want to move the file and not just copy and have two versions of it. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a good point, right? When we copy a file, uh, you end up with two copies, right? right. Well, not really two copies. You end up with an original and one copy, right? So you, you end up with two Duplicate. Yeah. I don't know, whatever the right terminology. You get two files, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I want to move it somewhere else, that's a different story, right? So uh, let's say that I have an all new lab. So I'm going to make a directory called lab2. And my files are in just lab, right? So my files are right here. I want these to be in lab2 instead, but I don't want them to stay here. I want to move them over to lab2. Well, instead of CP, we just use the move command, MV, right? And after that, the syntax is really the same. I want to move these files to another location. Now, when you move, you typically are specifying a directory as a destination, right? Especially if you're moving more than one file. If I want to move all of these files, right, I can say MV star. I want to move everything in this folder. And I want to send that to tilde slash lab two, right? And I have to be careful here. Because how does the system know if lab2 is a folder or if lab2 is a file? Do I want to move all these into a file called lab2? It doesn't necessarily know. If I want to move it into a folder, I need to make sure I throw a trailing slash on there. And now it knows, oh, oh, you're not talking about a file called lab2. You're talking about a folder called lab2. You want to move everything in this folder over into this other folder. Or I could say uh, an individual file, right, if I wanted to move binaries dot text. I could just move that one. I want to move the whole thing. So I'm going to move everything in here into lab two. And when I run that, now the lab folder is empty. LS returns nothing. But if I pull a directory listing for lab two, there's all the files, right? So I've only got one copy of these files. They've been moved over to the other location and that's where they are. Now, a couple of, of interesting kind of sides on this. First off, move is great for moving things to other directories, but you can also use move to rename a file. In the, the Unix and Linux world, there is no rename command, right? In, um, in Windows, it's a, I think it's actually called rename, rename. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. So you have a command line utility there. In the Unix and Linux world, we don't need that because you can just use move, right? If I want to rename, I've got memo.txt. Maybe I want that to be memo0.txt, right? It's the, the very first one. So I want it to be memo0. So I could say move 
memo.txt to memo zero dot text, right? I'm moving the file. The old file goes away, the one that was called memo.txt, and the new file is now called memo zero dot text. So I'm basically renaming a file by using move. But in the file system, I'm technically moving it to a new location, and it just happens to have a new name in that new location. But now if I take a look at what's in here, I've got that memo zero, and the one that's just plain old memo.txt is gone. And this whole time, I've been copying and moving files, but we can copy and move directories as well, right? So for example, um, let's say I got rid of the lab folder. So I just did a rmdir to remove directory. I removed the lab folder. And I've got the lab2 folder that has all of my files. And I decide, huh, that was kind of dumb. So I, I want to <laughs> rename it back to just lab again, OK? Or I want to move it somewhere else on my hard drive. Well, you can use the move command, and you can move a folder, right? I can say I want to move tilde slash lab2 to tilde slash lab, right? So I'm moving that one. And actually, I'm already in the folder, so I could have just said like that without a path at all. I'm, I'm a bit of a... Uh, uh, a stickler for path names. And the reason is I, I started, my, my Unix experience really started on Solaris. And in the Solaris world, it was really particular about paths. So like if you wanted to move something that was in the folder that you were in, you actually had to say like dot slash so that it would really know what you're talking about. I'm talking about something right here in this folder, not something in the path that's stored somewhere else on my hard drive. I'm being really particular. So I, I, I out of habit, it, it's actually hard for me to break that. Old habits uh, die hard, yeah. they say, Don. <laughs> so a lot of times I'll type paths when I don't necessarily need them. But here, if I want to move lab2 to lab, I can just do that. And when I look, there it is. It's moved it, and it's brought that over. Okay. Now, this can be a little problematic sometimes. For example, with the copy command, if I have multiple directories inside of something. So for example, inside of lab, whoops, inside of the lab folder, maybe I have another directory called test1 or test2, right? And inside of test one, I might have a bunch of, of files, right? So I'll do files one dot dot twenty dot txt, right? And so I've got all these files inside of here. And then I've got files inside of lab. And if I want to copy all of those, so maybe I have some kind of a, a, a directory that's, you know, lab dot backup. And so I want to have a backup of all of my lab files right here, okay? Well, when I do CP and I go to copy a folder, it's not going to get those subfolders. It's not going to get those items underneath it. I need to tell it that I want it to do that. And in the copy command, you have a, a tag, or a command line argument, which is a, a dash R. And if we find it right here, dash R, it makes it recursive. In other words, don't just get the parent directory get the directories inside of it, get all the stuff that's inside, follow that tree all the way down to get what's inside of there. And that recursion is really handy when you're doing a backup like this. I might want to do a CP of tilde slash lab, and I might want to copy that to tilde slash lab dot backup. Okay? But when I do it, I want that to be recursive. So I'm going to add a dash R to make sure it gets the subfolders as well. And when I run that and I look inside of my backup, oh shoot, I grabbed the lab <laughs> file itself, sorry. Um, I specified slash lab literally, and I, I meant to do a slash star after that to get everything that's inside of it, which I, I did not do. So anyhow, now I have a, again. <laughs> a lab, which I can move these to fix it or, or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, but now there they are, and the subfolder went along with it, and it got everything that was inside of that, okay? So uh, what, what I should have done in that command, there's a few ways to run it, right? And, and what I should have done is said that I want to copy from what's in that folder to in this other folder. And you can do that by doing a slash star like that, saying get all the contents of the folder. But I copied the folder oh. itself, and so that's why it, it kind of put it inside of this other one. Uh, so I should have done a slash star in this case. Uh, that would have got it, brought it over, as well as all the subdirectories and put things where I actually wanted them to be, which was right here. So little little things like that, right? Just a subtle positioning of a character. Yeah. You leave one thing out, and it actually performs quite a different task. It's kind of funny. It, it really, 
uh, happens a lot because, like uh, we talked about fat fingering, guess what? That's what's going on here. You just get a little bit rushed and you're thinking, oh man, I've, now I've created a bunch of files I don't actually need or, uh, you know, oh, I gotta, it's the wrong name. I could do renaming, but sometimes I just like, you know what? I just wanna start from scratch. Let me blow that away. I wanna delete the files. Or it's just information that I no longer need for whatever reason. I don't wanna delete the files, Don. Can you show us how we can delete files? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, following our two letter commands, uh, we've got RM for remove. So we had CP for copy, MV for move, RM for remove or, or delete. Uh, so I can say RM and then a file. So maybe I want to get rid of memo.txt or memo0. I'll do memo0.txt. And so I'm going to remove that one. And now when I pull up my listing, memo0 is gone, right? RM just worked. Now, when you go to remove files, you do have to be a little bit careful. You can remove many files at once. I can say rm star, and that'll delete it all, right? Um, when I do that, it's going to delete, and see how it got some errors? rm doesn't work so well on directories, right? It throws an error. It says, ah, oh, you can't remove that. It's a directory. There might be stuff inside of it. And if I pull up a listing, though, it did get rid of everything else. All that's left are the directories. Mm -hmm. that, that's good, right? But how do I get rid of a directory if it's got stuff inside it? Well, technically, you could go inside the directory, delete everything from inside of there and come out. You could use the rmdir command, which is remove directory, right? If I do that, if I try and remove directory lab, it's not empty. So now I have to go into the directory, remove some items, come out of the directory, use rmdir to, to delete the directory, and, and then go from there. It's a, it's a lot of work, okay? So what we can do is we can change the rm command a little bit to make it a bit more aggressive and say, I don't care what those files are, delete them, right? If you do rm-r, remember what rm-r did for CP? It made it recursive. It went into subfolders, right? I can do that with rm-r, right? I can say rm-r lab, right? And now it's going to go and it doesn't complain about it being a directory, right? It says, okay, I'm, I'm fine with that being a directory, but it... Or no, yeah, so sorry, it's not an exception, but yeah. in this case, I don't have the exception. So yeah, so it works, it removes it, and there we go. There is an exception. Every now and then you can hit where there's like a, a protected file or something that stops you from being able to delete it. And it didn't happen for me. I, I thought it was going to, and it didn't. Uh, so rm-r worked perfect. But if you hit one of those exceptions where there there's files under there that maybe you're the owner of, but the permissions have been changed to read only or something like that, it might stop you. And if you ever encounter that, you can change the command just a little bit. Uh, you know, maybe I want to get rid of uh, test one and two, so I'm, I'm going to use an expansion so that I can delete test one and test two at the same time. Or you could actually write them out. I could say test one and test two like that. It, it works either way. Um, but the expansion just a little bit short. I think it's like one keystroke short. <laughs> so, so, uh, so if I want to remove those, you can do an rm-rf, and that f says to force it. Now, this is one we have to be careful with because basically we're taking off the, the safety gloves here. And it's saying, I don't care what I encounter underneath. As long as you're the owner or you have the permission to mess with it, we're going to toast it and get it out of there. So that's what rm-rf does. This is the command that I run when I want to just get something gone and I don't want to be bothered with you know error messages. Like, <laughs> just do it. Get rid of it. Uh, and when I run that, it's going to go through and purge it. And now all of those folders are gone. Okay, so dash R made it recursive. That's what got me around the directory problem. Dash RF made it force and, and just get past any kind of blocks to say we're going to remove. Now, we do still have that permission. You can't delete something you don't have permission to. So force isn't magic. It's just there's some things that you may have set yourself to have read-only permission, and that, that's what it'll get around. So a uh, couple of different manipulations there on that RM command to remove the data and get it out of there. All right, Don. Well, we've gotten through a litany of a very basic but very crucial items of manipulating files, working with files. We've copied, we've uh, moved them, we've deleted them, we've done a lot of stuff. You've shown us expansion, which was a great thing because it hel helps us uh, minimize the amount of typing and time that it's going to take to make a lot of stuff or, and, and, or just move stuff or whatever it is we're doing. As you say, it works so ubiquitously through our Bash system. Uh, it can be very helpful in a lot of great places. Is there anything else you want to uh, enlighten our audience with before we go? We're running short on time. Well, I, I know I've made this comment in some of the other episodes, but you know we've really just scratched the tip of the iceberg, mm. right? It's kind of an introductory, getting used to it. So uh, there are a ton of other commands that are out there that are incredibly useful that you use all the time. Um, but these are kind of the core ones, the base ones, the ones that you're expected to know. And, and more importantly, because they're core utilities, these are present 
everywhere. So if you go to a BSD machine or a Linux machine, if it's Ubuntu or Fedora or Red Hat, if you go to a Solaris machine, uh, Oracle Linux, whatever, these commands are there. These same commands, the same way that we manipulate things. So this is a, a consistent set of core utilities uh, that you'll always have. The fancier bells and whistles are great, but you don't necessarily always have those. So this is kind of that starting point uh, for manipulating files. All right, great stuff, Don. We do appreciate your time and effort into this show and all the great uh, examples that you show us, the demonstrations, they were really well executed and explained. And that's that's the important part. Hopefully you guys out there that are watching this are like, man, I'm eating this up. I can I can run me some Linux now. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the purpose of why we're doing this for you folks out there. Don, thanks again for joining us. And we do thank you for watching. But looking at the clock, we have dwindled down to nothing yet again for another show. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazette. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we are back with more in our Linux command line series, and it's definitely been an interesting conversation so far. Joining us back to continue that talk, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzette. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going today? It is going great. Ready to dive right back into the world of the Linux command line, and in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at how to manage processes, right? And processes are all those programs that we run. Linux is a true multitasking operating system, which it used to be a really big deal mm -hmm. in, the, in the 80s. But uh, <laughs> in today's age, we just expect it to have it, that our system can run more than one program at once. But the, the, the power that we get from that brings a, a little bit of a flip side, which is that if you get too much running, your system performance can start to be affected. So in this episode, we're going to get a chance to see how to determine what all is running on our system, be able to see if it is impacting us or if we're perfectly within the bounds of our hardware, and then see how we can kind of recover from it in the event that we are consuming too many resources. So all that laid out right here in this episode. All right, Don. Well, let's do that. Let's start at the very beginning. I've got processes running in my Linux uh, system. I want to see what they are and what the heck is going on with them. Where do I begin there? All right. So in the, in the Unix world, there was a command that was introduced a long, long time ago called PS. And the PS command would just show you all of your processes. Unfortunately, the PS command, it, it's, it's critical. It's a core utility. It's part of every distro, um, but it's evolved a lot over the years. And so the way it gets used is kind of strange because there's the original Unix way, there's the BSD way, there's the newer GNU version, and, and so there's all sorts of changes and manipulations. So what I'm going to show you here in the show is, is one way of using the PS utility, but know that there's more than one way. And if you read the man file for it, it's almost like a history documentary <laughs> on, on this, this command's mutations through the years. Uh, but I'll just use the standard Linux way of, of kind of manipulating with it to look at our processes. But if I'm at a, a command prompt like this, and I run PS, that's going to show me the processes for my session. And so my session currently has two processes. One is the PS command, which I was just running, and the other one is the bash command, which I'm in right now. That's my shell, right? So that's what I'm seeing. That's my session, right? But the key thing to remember here is that the PS command by default is just showing you the processes for your session. What if you have more than one session, right? What if I whip open another tab and I'm going to fire up the midnight commander, right? So I'm running the midnight commander in this other tab and I come back to my first tab and I run PS. No midnight commander, right? And that's because it's in a different session. It's running somewhere else, right? If I had run it here in this shell, and then like hidden it, thrown it in the background or, or something of that nature, right? Um, if I had run it that way, then it would show here in this list. So PS by itself is not that incredibly useful. Instead, we're normally gonna add some command line arguments to expand that out, all right? And probably one of the most important ones is dash A, right? PS dash A says show me all processes, not just the ones tied to this session. And when I run PS dash A, I can see Midnight Commander right there, right, MC. And I can see PS, right, the, the, the process command that I ran. Um, so I can see those. Now notice how bash disappeared, right? And that's because when I start modifying the way that PS behaves, 
Now I'm getting into that area of, oh, are you running it the BSD way or the Unix way or the Linux way? I'm running it the Linux way now. And in the Linux way, they don't show processes that are, are basically like uh, uh, startup or init processes. And, and your bash shell, in this case, would be one of those. So it's getting left off. So I actually need to modify this just a little bit more to make it show other things like that by adding in, uh, for example, an X to show a little bit more. <laughs> and we'll start to see processes that are tied to the system. And somewhere in all of this, my bash instance will show up in here too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot, right? Uh, the other problem here is I'm now seeing that X technically says, show me everything that's not bound to a TTY, which would be a, a shell session. Uh, so I'm seeing a ton of system processes, which are, are not necessarily things that I'm running. There's things in here that are being run by the root user, or maybe other users on my system, which hopefully there aren't any. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, things are being run by other people. So I normally add one more thing to this. I, I typically run ps-aux like this, and that u says, show me the username as well, right? It actually does a little more. In addition to the username, it'll show things like the uh, uh, processor utilization and, and stuff. So you get an idea of, of who's really consuming resources on your system. And when I run that, now I get a nice big layout here. And right here, I just looked out and saw it, I could find dpzet bash, right? There's my bash process running. And I can start to see all these other things that I happen to be running that aren't necessarily a part of my shell. Now, the PS output, it can be really big. It can be hard to find. I got lucky here and found that bash instance. But I could have come in and Pipe the output of that into grep. You know, grep lets you search for a string and find it. I could have searched for the word bash and said, you know, find this particular process. And when I run that, there's more than one. And there's more than one because, well, one is going to be my search, the actual grep command right there. But the other ones, I've got more than one terminal open in different places. And so they're each kind of showing up here. And I can see them and, and kind of find where they are. Now I, I've, I've located them a lot more easily. Uh, I could have done the same thing searching by username and said, you know, show me everything that DPZ is running, and now it's all the processes that are tied to me. So I get much greater output. The PS command went from being this <laughs> to being all that above it, right? It all comes down to those command line arguments and having the right extensions to use to get the output that you want to be able to see uh, what's running in the background. Now, Don, PS also allows us to kind of, uh, sometimes processes have our, our are a bundle of processes or, oh, yeah. or things like that. We can even flesh that out as well, can't we? Sure. So a, a lot of these processes are interrelated, yeah. right? And, and we kind of saw that um, when, well, like here, where I've got PS running, and PS is technically running in the bash shell. If I were to kill the bash shell, what do you think is going to happen to the, the PS command? Bye -bye. It, <laughs> it's going to go away. They're, they're related, right? It's like a parent child. Bash is the parent. PS is a child underneath it. We don't see that normally. When I, when I run ps-aux, I just see a list. Here's all the processes. Good luck, right? But if we add a little bit to that, I'm going to add dash dash forest. That says arrange things in a tree format, right? There's actually a command called tree. It's useful in the file system. You can see the, the tree that builds up a, a folder. But here it can take the processes and arrange them as trees. And then when it puts them all together, you've got forest. That's where the term comes from. So by saying dash dash forest, now I start to see how these processes are related. And so I can see, for example, I've got the GNOME terminal server. And inside of that, I've got bash. And inside of that, I've got ps dash aux dash dash forest. They're related. They're tied to each other. I start to see that hierarchy. And the little lines here help me to see that relationship and how that branches out. This is the exact command and interface that I just used as part of my example. But you can see there's a lot of other stuff on the system that is related like that. Things that are just running in the background. Some that go pretty deep right here. Like here, the, the GDM, which when I press power on my laptop and it boots up and I get to a login screen, that login screen is being rendered by GDM. And then GDM is launching my window manager, which is GNOME. And so that's where I see my GNOME session and the GNOME shell and all the other things. That's all part of my GUI. I can see it all right here nested out and see that relationship. If I were to kill the GDM, everything underneath it would fall. My system would become unusable. I'd have to reboot or drop to a text-based shell, a TTY. So, um, uh, so that kind of helps us to see that. But it's kind of a neat little option. That dash dash forest really gives you an idea of what is tied 
to, to everything else. Now, Don, when you did the, uh, the, the process, you did the PS command, and then you piped it into grip because you were looking for a specific string. This is a very common practice because of the immense output that can come from doing the PS dash AUX uh, <laughs> portion yeah. of the proceedings. Uh, isn't there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they, they've actually created a tool that said, you know what, since this has done so much, let's just make a tool that does that, right? Yeah, it, there actually is. It, it, it's not on every system, but on a lot of them, they, they recognize we do this so much, they created a utility called PSGREP, right? And, or I'm sorry, PGREP. And uh, what PGREP does is it's grep for processes, right? So PS is like the process show command, and, and PGREP would then search it. So the example that Daniel was mentioning, I did PS-AUX, and then I gripped for bash, right? Boy, I'm having a hard time typing that. <laughs> uh, so I, I searched for bash. And when I ran it, I found it, and there we go, right? If your system has it, well, we can check for that, right? I'll do a which pgrep just to see. I, I do have it in slash user slash bin slash pgrep. I could have just run pgrep bash, and it'll search for that process. Now, when it searches, it found four processes called bash. And it gives me the process ID. See, like this one here is ID 1187. And up here, I can see 1187. And down here, I've got 1317. Up here, I've got 1317. So it found the same processes. One of them, this guy right here, 2135, isn't present anymore. And that means it's not running anymore. In fact, if you look, it actually wasn't bash in the first place. It was grep that was looking for the word bash. Uh, so that one's gone. Or 866, this one was actually run by root. And that's why I'm not seeing it here. PGREP is looking for me, my processes. What processes do I have? And this is really handy because I might have launched uh, Midnight Commander somewhere, and I've lost it. I, I don't know where it is. It's gone. I want to get rid of it. I could come in and I could do a PGREP for Midnight Commander, and now it's going to show me, oh, there's, there's two process IDs. I've actually got two copies of it running. Well, Midnight Commander, it's actually the two windows. But, uh, but anyhow, so I, I can see it's running, and I can go in and I can clear those out and get rid of them if need be. But that's what the pgrep command does. Uh, don't be shocked if you don't have it on your system. Not every system does, but most of them do. It's a kind of a handy way to do it. And if you pull up the documentation for pgrep, you'll see that it's got a lot of options you can specify as well to be able to get a little more information out of it, right? Because normally we're just getting the process ID, but you can tell it to show a little bit more uh, and, and show extra information. See, like here we've got the... Uh, 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 list full, which would actually show the whole command that was run and not just the executable or, or whatever. Uh, each of these add more information to that command line to, to be able to see more about it than just a process ID. So it is available and you can certainly use it. Now, Don, interesting thing is uh, talking about processes, anybody coming from the Windows world is probably familiar with the task manager. You open that thing up and it shows you all the currently running processes, how much CPU uses they're taking up, memory uses, that type of thing. Do we have anything that's similar to that inside of our Linux systems? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, what you're describing in the Windows world being a graphical, graphical, right? Yeah. And, and hey, on your Linux distro, you probably have what's called the system monitor. And if you fire that up, you get a list of processes and even, you know, pretty pictures. Mm. So here's my CPU usage and all it that. That's lovely. Um, <laughs> that's cool and all, but we've got to remember the name of this show, right? This is the Linux command line show. So if I don't have that stuff, I've got to do something right here from the command line. And if I want to monitor performance on my system, one of the best commands that we can use is the top command. Top is a neat utility that's built into to almost every distro, so that the, the odds are you have it. And if you run top, you get a, I don't want to call it a graphical representation, <laughs> but it, at least a, a really neat, active layout of the processes that are running on your system. Well, well formatted. And, yeah, it is well, well formatted. It, it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> And so I get this list of all sorts of information, and it's live, right? This wasn't just a one-time display. See how my screen is updating as things are, are being run, and it's showing those processes sorted by CPU utilization, right? So right now I can see that X is consuming 2% of my CPU. X is the Xorg Windows system that I'm running, so that's my, my GUI. That's why we don't usually run a GUI on servers. You don't want to waste 2% of your CPU or, or whatever. Um, I've got my file sync is consuming 0.7%, my GNOME terminal is 1.7, my GNOME terminal is running top. And if I look down a little bit further, uh, top just appeared for a brief moment there, uh, they're at 0.3% of my CPU. It takes CPU power to generate the data for monitoring the CPU utilization. So top is really handy, 
This list here is pretty cool because you see the processes, but what's above it is even more cool, uh, at least, whoops, in my opinion, because you see all sorts of cool stuff here, like your uptime. My laptop has been up for two days and two and a half hours. Right? You can see your average load. So how much uh, uh, CPU you've been eating up over a certain period of time. You can see how many tasks you're running, how much memory you've got available, how much memory you're actually consuming. It's all laid out right here in a pretty easy to read system. So this is a nice way to be able to see that uh, and, and understand what's going on. Now, when we pull this up, uh, there's actually some keys that we can hit to, uh, to change what we're looking at. Um, so some of those, for example, it's, it's sorted by process, uh, by CPU, by default. Maybe I'm, I'm running low on memory. So I wanna see who's eating up all the memory on my system. If you do a capital M, it'll change the sort order to sort by memory, right? So capital M for memory. Now I can see that my, my file synchronization utility is eating the most memory on my system, 0.3% CPU. Uh, but if I was sorted by CPU, which is a, a capital P, now it's back to sorted by CPU, and I can see that GNOME Shell was the, the top or, or whatever, you know, constantly changing. So capital M and capital P are a quick way to move between them, right? But another thing we can do is if I've got a process that's gone rogue, that is consuming 100% of my CPU, that is really tying down my performance, you can type K. K says that we're going to send a kill signal to that process. And it defaults to whoever's at the top. Well, it's funny for me because the top one right now is top. I just happen to catch it. <laughs> yeah. So it's offering to kill itself. <laughs> it's probably a moral, ethical thing here. <laughs> but if it's not the very top one that you want to kill, you can find the process ID. The process ID is over here on the left side. And you can take that number and you can just type it in. So if I wanted to kill process ID 1817, which was one of my bash shells, I could type that and press enter and it would kill it. And that would stop that rogue application from eating up my CPU. It, it doesn't solve the problem. It solves the symptom, right? There's obviously a problem. Why was that application consuming 100% of my CPU? I'd need to go and figure that out. But at least this gets us out of the woods you know, for, the, for the main issue for right now. And then we kind of figure it out from there. Now, I aborted just by hitting escape, so you know I, I didn't actually want it to, to uh, stay in there. Uh, and we can get out of this with Control-C. Control-C will break out of it, and now I'm, I'm back out and ready to go about my business on, on my system. But capital P and capital M, those are the two to remember to switch between CPU and memory for your sort order. Now, Don, I typically, when I run top, it's because it's updating so quickly, <laughs> I'll see, oh, there's the thing, but I couldn't, where's the PID? Oh, oh there it is again. Well, oh. And it goes a little too fast sometimes. I want to get a more static. I want it to update, but I need a little more time to digest what it is it's giving me. Is there any way I can slow that update down? Uh, you can you can pause the screen. Hmm. Uh, you can freeze it. Uh, but there's also like command line options that you can use to do delays. Uh, and I'll do that a lot where I'll do top and then I will uh, do like a dash D, which sets how often the screen updates. And so I might set it to 10 just every 10 seconds. The default was pretty quick. You guys saw it. Uh, one second, I think. Something pretty short, yeah. So I can do a top dash D10. That creates that delay and says, don't refresh, but every 10 seconds. It buys, buys me a little more time. Uh, you can do 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or, or even longer. Uh, and now you get the same output, but it's just updating less frequently so that we don't get kind of overwhelmed with that data. That's a good way to do it. Um, also, if you know exactly what you're looking for, you could get really specific. So for example, if I did a P grip for Midnight Commander, um, and so I wanted to monitor process 1291, I could come in and I could say top dash P 1291, and now it's gonna run and I only see that process. So now I'm not getting overwhelmed with a thousand processes, I'm just seeing the one that I actually wanted to monitor, and I'm watching it. This is actually the wrong one, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, this is one of my Red Hat uh, that must be like the DRM that Red Hat has. Uh, let's do the other one, 1313. Lucky number 1313. There we there go. That's is. the actual Midnight Commander. And so I can see how much CPU and how much memory is consuming. So it is important to double check. Yeah. <laughs> the other right one. In my case, PGREP actually gave me a, an ID for something unrelated. Uh, it must have just had MC in the mm. command name, uh, but wasn't the actual Midnight Commander. So you got to be careful with that. Now, one of the ways I've used this uh, in, in my experience has been I need to find the process ID because a lot of times web browsers, they're notorious for this. You've launched your web browser, you've maybe got a little too much action going on, and your web browser's hung. It's, it's, it's kind of not responding. You're hitting the X and it's not responding. 
I can drop to a terminal and make these things disappear. We saw a little bit of that using <laughs> top, uh, but there's other ways to kill processes as well. Yeah, so in the, in the top command, it gave, gave me the option to hit K to kill a process, and then you type the process ID. And what it's doing is in the background, it's actually running a command called kill, right? Uh, kind of aggressive. So uh, if we take a, a look at the <laughs> documentation for kill, I'll just do a man kill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least it's anyhow. not the other way around. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what you'll see here is the kill command is pretty simple, right? You say kill, and then you specify a process ID, and it kills it. And there's a lot of other options here where we can change the way the kill works. So you can in change the way that is actually killing the process. So you can tell it to simulate an error. Or you can tell it to, tell, to just restart the process. Or you can tell it to act like it crashed. You know, make the program think it crashed, and then it resets. There's all sorts of different things you can send. And for developers, they'll use this frequently to test out uh, various scenarios to make sure their applications can recover. But for us, if I've got an application like Midnight Commander that's just running, and, and maybe it's just going crazy, right? So um, I do a ps-aux, I grep for Midnight Commander, and there it is. And oh, yeah, see that RHS? Yep, there that it one, is. it just has MC in the name. So that's why it came up earlier. But here's that Midnight Commander, process 1313, 13, and I decide I don't want that one running anymore. I could do a kill 1313, 13, like that. And it's going to send a signal to it telling it that the process has ended, right? It's going to terminate it, it's what's called a SIG term. Um, I could do a, uh, you know, one of the other different modes. Uh, you just do like a, well, they all have a number coded yeah. to them, right? So if you do a kill dash L, you get a list of the numbers, right? Uh, so I don't have these memorized, and uh, I don't feel bad about that because there's a ton of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so you see all the different numbers here, uh, but some of these are telling it like, it's an aborted operation, right? So cancel the operation you're performing right now. Most applications will recover from that and just retry their operation. Sig term, which is buried in here somewhere, uh, is telling it to terminate, to actually end and, and stop running. Uh, and that's normally what we want. You've also got sig kill, where it knows that we're manually killing it versus thinking there was some kind of error. There's sig term number 15. 15, yep. yep. So um, 1, 9, and 15 are probably the most common. Uh, and nine, that sig kill is the default. That's what we're sending it. Uh, but we could say kill dash nine, and now we know we're sending it a sig kill, or a, si a kill dash 15, and now we know we're sending it a sig term. But for most of us, if we just want to kill it, right, uh, we just want to get it out of there, I see that process ID 1313 running, right? Actually, let me change this. So I'm just searching for that one process. Uh, so there it is. And then if I do a kill 1313, that's going to terminate it. And now when I pull up that listing, all I get is my grep command. The actual process is gone. And if I switch over to my tab, Midnight Commander, it's still running, sort of. Look at that little note down there at the bottom. Terminated. Terminated. Okay. And it's actually returned me to my prompt, but the screen hasn't refreshed. So there we go. And it can't refresh because it's terminated. The process itself is already dead, so it's not able to, to reload. So that's it, though. Now we're, we're back in business. And that process is no longer taking over my system. So that's the, the kill command. It's a pretty handy one, especially when you know that process ID. Now, Don, what if I don't know the process ID? For whatever reason, I couldn't grab that. Is there anything I can do? Yeah, you, you can. Um, if you don't know the process ID, if you just know the application name, hmm. or, or let me give you a different scenario, right? It, you mentioned web browsers. I did. Right? Web browsers say, boy, what a pain in the butt. <laughs> um, web browsers crash a lot. And sometimes we don't realize how often they crash. But web browsers crash a lot and they go crazy a lot and consume memory a lot and so most vendors like firefox and, and uh, google chrome uh, they make each tab run in its own process so that's awesome if if uh, chrome starts going nuts on my system i might have 15 processes to kill and that's really annoying so instead of killing by a process number we can kill by a name and we can say, I'm going to look for any occurrence of this name and kill them. you got to be really careful with it, though, because like in my Midnight Commander example, there was more than one process that had MC in it. So we've got to be a little careful. But if I were to fire up something like Chromium, and so here we go, and maybe I'll go to CNN.com, I'll go to ITPro.TV, I'll go to Fox News. We'll be fair and balanced, right? we got to get all of it. Uh, so I'm pulling up all these different web pages, right? Each one is technically a different process. And so when I come back here and I do a PS-AUX and I start looking around, I can find Chromium in here and look at that, right? It, it's a bunch of different processes. So if I want to kill them all, right, 
<laughs> really aggressive. Instead of that. I want to kill them all. So uh, it's a Mattel gal. Yeah, yeah. So I can come in here and I can use the kill all command followed by a name instead. And so I can look for that name. I'm going to do a kill all chromium like that. And it's going to look for it. Now notice how I got process not found, right? And that's because it's not called chromium. It's called chromium dash browser, if I remember right. Oop, it isn't. Shoot. It's not. Yeah, no, I really got to figure out what this thing is is called. Um, and, you know, I think my problem is that I'm getting scrolled off the edge of the screen to see what the actual executable is named. So let me, uh, let me pull this up. Uh, normally what I would do is just export this like a, oh, actually I could export it to less, couldn't I? Yeah. If I pipe that to less. Because less will let you scroll left and right and see the rest of it. And I can search for, for old Chromium. And we're going to find out what that thing is actually called. Um, oh, it is called Chromium-Browser. Chromium dash browser. Hmm, that's interesting. It didn't pull the name. So did I spell it wrong? <laughs> it doesn't help yeah, me with that. No. But uh, yeah, there it is. Chromium. We'll do full path. Maybe that'll make it happy. And grab that. All right. And we'll do a kill all. And we'll feed that in there. There we there go. go. Um, so you must have hit some kind of duplicate for some reason. But uh, by doing it that way, it's going to say, I'm not just looking for a single process ID. I'm looking for every instance of Chromium-Browser. And we're going to knock that out. Uh, and, and, and as well as the child processes that might spawn. Because a web browser can spawn plugins and extensions and other things. It'll kill all those too uh, and, and nail them and, and knock them out. So now when I come in and I take a look and see... If I have any Chromium instances, I don't. Okay, I just have that grab. It killed them and knocked them all out. So if you don't know the number, you can use a name. If you know the name, that was my mm. challenge. Uh, or if there's just <laughs> more than one process, you can kill them all by using that kill all command. Really handy one to do right there. All right, Don. Well, you've given us a great uh, uh, a bite of, of food when it comes to working with the processes inside of our Linux system. We now know how to find them, list them, work through them, see who's running what, and if need be, take the old uh, <laughs> uh, the old heater to a process that's gone rogue on us, because that does happen from time to time. So it's really great that we have the ability to make them stop and work with our system, make it do what we need it to do. Don, anything that you want to part us with before we go? Yeah, you know, the commands you saw here, they're pretty much present on every system, but there are other ones that are out there. I know Daniel and I were talking before the show. I use top just because what I'm used to. It's been around forever. Daniel uses HTOP, uh, which is present in most distros. Let me show you real quick. You know, the, the top that I was using is just black and white. You know, here's the data, whatever. Uh, if you have HTOP on your system, you can run it. It looks pretty. Look at that. <laughs> it's, it's the same data. It's just being rendered in a, a pretty format, so people like it. Uh, it's got a lot more options. You see down there the F keys that you can hit to do all sorts of things. So don't think that, that top and kill and kill all are the only ones that are out there. There's plenty of other different techniques. You know, find the ones that you like, the ones that you want to use, uh, but just know that there are a ton of different ways. But you can always count on top being there, and you can always count on, on kill and kill all being there. The rest of them may or may not always be there for you when you're working on a server. All right. Well, Don, thanks so much for dropping by today and teaching us how to work with our processes inside of our Linux command line area. But it does look like we are out of time for this episode. We do thank you good folks out there for watching as well. But I guess it's that time for us to sign off. For IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazette. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we are back with more in our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio yet again, our good friend, Mr. Don Pazette. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going today? Hey, it is going great, Daniel. Ready to dive right back into the world of Linux command prompt. And in this episode, we are focusing on storage, right? We're going to be taking a look at, at how we can identify disks on our systems, how we can uh, connect and even use them, and once they're there, <laughs> how we can monitor them to see whether they're full or what's eating up all of our space, because that's generally what happens. So we'll get a chance to see that and do it all right from the command line. Now, Don, I know that in this modern day and age, most of the time you plug in some sort of external drive, maybe a USB thumb drive or hard drive, or even if you put in an internal drive, 
a lot of times there's some auto configuration anymore, but that's not always the case. And it can okay. be some consternation there when trying to get that kind of thing up and running. Can we start there with, I've got a drive, I'm slapping it in, I want to make it work in my system. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to, to your point, if you're running an, a, a Linux install that has a graphical user interface, the odds are it's got auto mount installed, right? Um, Ubuntu does it, Fedora does it, even the, the slightly older stalwarts like Red Hat, they do it, you know, it, it's automatic mounting. If you have a GUI, they assume that it's an end user using the system and that you're going to want access to a disk <laughs> that you just plug in or something of that nature. But if you're on a server and it's got no GUI, well, servers don't auto mount. And there's a few reasons for that. One, we're not normally adding removable storage to a server. And two, there are a number of attacks that can take place thanks to automatic mounting of removable storage. So on a server, it's normally disabled for security reasons, right? But to Daniel's point, if I take my a USB hard drive right here. <laughs> Look at that. Right? So if I take this USB hard drive and I want to plug it in and make use of it, I, I might not have to use the command line at all, right? So I can take this guy in here. Let me, I'll get into my file manager. And so you can see on the left side here kind of what, what I've got on my, my systems and folders and notes and things like that. And when I come in and plug this drive in, uh, if I can find my USB port, there we go. Uh, it's going to detect that drive and it'll show up here in my left side navigation bar. It's automatically mounting. And I'm, I'm stalling here. There we go. There go. <laughs> <laughs> Have me Takes worry a for just a moment. <laughs> but there we go. I see this one terabyte volume just magically appeared, and I've got a bunch of Fedora images that are on there. And so there it is, right? I can use it. I'm mounting a disk is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> and when I'm done with it, I don't just unplug that cable and walk away. I, I hit the little eject button right there, and it ejects. And now, as soon as that disappears, it's safe to take it off the machine. And now it's, it's, it's done, right? So that's automatic mounting, and that's nice. But if you're working from the command line, that automatic mounting might not happen, right? So we've got to get in and make sure that we mount this ourselves and, and do it by hand, right, the old-fashioned way. And this way works everywhere versus auto mount, which only works when auto mount's enabled. So the key secret here is that we're going to be using a command called mount. And the mount command will let us bring a disk online to use it. And if you just run the mount command by itself, it'll list all the disks that you presently have mounted. Now, don't be surprised if you see a lot of stuff here because you might only have one physical disk, but the odds are it's broken up into four or five partitions, and each partition can be mounted to a different mount point. And then if you're running something like the Logical Volume Manager, you might even have more, which are virtual entries, and you'll see I, I am. So I've got these slash dev, slash mapper, slash blah, blah, blah. That is the Logical Volume Manager that's created these fake volumes. And by doing that, they can be resized. You have all sorts of other magic and stuff. But for a traditional disk, it'll show up in here as a very simple entry that'll just show what the disk's name is and what folder it's mounted on. So, for example, if I look through here and find something like slash sys, right? Slash sys is just a real simple line right here. The system file system, which is where the, the kernel is stored, is mounted right there inside of slash sys, and uh, there it is. It's available versus some of these other lines that actually wrap around the screen they're so long, uh, you know, like tempfs here that's wrapping around, where these are temporary file systems that are just stored in, in RAM that'll go away later on when you reboot or, or whatever, so they kind of come and go. Uh, they're transient file systems, right? But when I plug in my USB drive, I want to make use of it. I want to mount it and bring it online, and right now it's not online. I can't get to it, all right? The first trick to mounting a disk is figuring out what the disk is called. Every disk has a name. It's assigned a name. And, and if you look inside of the slash dev folder, inside of slash dev, you have a file representation of all of your hardware. And when you plug in that removable disk, it appears in here somewhere. Okay. Now, I'm being a little vague on, on this because I don't necessarily know what the name of a disk is going to be when I plug it in. For example, my laptop has an NVMe disk in it. And so I see that right here, NVMe 0. And then on that disk, there are partitions. And so I see NVMe 0, N1, P1, P2, P3. There's three partitions on that disk. I have a second hard drive in my laptop, which was labeled SDA. Okay, Why SDA instead of NVMe blah, blah, blah? And that's because it's a SATA disk. It's a you know, serial ATA and not an NVMe. So it's been given a different name. Well, my USB drive that I just plugged in, it's a SATA disk as well. And so I already had SDA. When I plugged this disk in, it became SDB. All right. 
And then on it, I've got one partition, which is SDB1. So now I know its name. But be careful. If you're on a server with 50 hard drives, it's really easy to pick the wrong one. And let's say I'm about to format the drive to get it ready. Uh, I don't want to format yeah. <laughs> my, you know, the wrong drive by accident. Like If I formatted my SDA1 drive, I'd be really sad. Yeah. That would be video footage we'd want to keep. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've got stuff that's on there. That, granted, I backed it up, but it would annoy the heck out of me if I deleted it. SDB, though, that, that USB drive, I don't care about the data on it. Yeah. You erase it, I'll be fine. So making sure we know the right one. And the way I do this uh, with removable media to be certain is you can unplug the removable media and then plug it back in, and it'll be the last entries in your log file. When your system boots up, it generates a, a boot log, and you can view that with the D message command. And when you add removable media, it shows up. And so I can see all these messages right here for SDB and SDB1 right there. There's where it was auto-mounted, right, to become available for us. But I can see that that disk is named SDB1, or SDB at least, right? So now I know what that disk is called. And if I'm not certain, I could always unplug it and plug it back in. You could do a journal CTL. If you're on a system D system, you could do journal CTL dash F, and it'll follow that log file. And you can unplug it and plug it back in, and you'll see the, the log messages appear. So if I unplug it, right, there's a little message that's popped up telling me a USB device was removed. And then if I plug it back in, which I can do, there we go, I start to see log messages come up, and I'll see where it's picked up the device, and it's telling me the name. You know, it's a Western Digital Elements disk, and it just assigned it that name of SDB. So now I know I'm working with the right disk. And in the background, it's auto-mounting, so let me uh, eject it. Or actually, yeah, I guess it didn't auto-mount. Well, we'll yeah. wait. It takes some time. So, uh, so anyhow, now I know I'm working with the right disk. That's really important, right? There's a lot of ways to see the disks that are attached to your system, uh, like the lsblk command. lsblk is nice because it lists the block devices on your system. So I can see NVMe 0N1, SDB, SDA, and I can see the partitions underneath them. And if they're mounted, I can see where they're mounted to. So, for example, my SDA disk, or SDA1, is mounted to slash MNT slash storage. I can browse that folder, and that's where that disk is. But I can see that SDB1, on the other hand, is not mounted anywhere, right? It's just sitting there, and it's available. So LSBLK is, is pretty handy to be able to see that. But now, if I want to take advantage of this disk, i got to bring it online. I, I've got to mount it and make it available. And we'll use the mount command for that. Now, we do need to be a little bit careful on this, because technically, administrators are the only people allowed to mount a disk. The auto mount service does it as, on an administrator's behalf. But as a regular user, you're not typically allowed to mount things. So you've got to make sure you have the permissions. If you're logged in as the root user, you can do this all day long, and it's no big deal. If you're logged in as a regular end user, though, you may need to elevate your privileges to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and do a sudo s, and that's going to give me a shell that's running as the super user, running as the root. So now when I run that, not much has changed on my screen, but if I do a who am I, See how I'm, I'm now root? So the commands that I'm running are being run as root. And I don't have to do a root shell. I could actually just use the sudo for every command that I run. If I do a who am I, I see I'm dpzzed. If I do a sudo who am I, I'm now root, right? So I can run these commands with elevated privileges, and with the mount command, we'll want to do that. All right, now, before I can mount the disk, I have to figure out where I want to mount it to, right? I've got a disk, which I know now is slash dev slash sdb1. I need to attach it somewhere in the file system to get there. And that somewhere needs to exist ahead of time, right? <laughs> you can't just make it up on the fly, though? Yeah, well, I mean, you, you, I guess you, you sort sure. of could, but you've got to make the directory. Right. So there has to be at least a little bit of forethought. So I'm going to get into that MNT folder, right? And, and that's where I have my other disk mounted that's called storage. So I'm going to make a new directory in there, and I'll, I'll sudo this. So I'm going to make a directory, and I'm going to call it USB-storage, or I might make it prettier. It just depends on what mood I'm in. Uh, and so I'll make a directory that's called USB storage. And there we go. So now I've got that folder. And if I navigate into that folder, there's, there's nothing in it, right? It's, a, whoops, it's an empty folder. I, I just made it. But I can now attach that external disk to this folder, and we'll have access to it. Right? So I can say sudo mount slash dev slash sdb1, right? You mount the partition, not the disk. And so if there's five partitions, I'll do five mount commands and mount each one. 
I'm mounting slash dev slash SDB1, and I want to attach that to slash MNT slash USB dash storage, that folder. Okay. Now, let's just assume for a moment that there was some data inside of that folder. Okay. When I mount to that folder, the data doesn't get deleted. The data stays there. I just can't get to it anymore. Because anytime I try and go to that folder, I'm being sent to my USB drive. But when I unmount, the data will still be there waiting for me. Now, while that is the case, you really don't normally do that kind of thing, right? You want the directory to be an empty directory. And now that I'm mounted to it, it was empty a moment ago. Now when I take a look, it's still empty. Mm -hmm. What the heck happened? Well, I made a amateur mistake here, which is I was in the folder when I did the mount command. So it doesn't like that so much. And in fact, I think I'll have to unmount. Oh, nope, I didn't. I just, just have to kind of refresh by going out and back in. Right, because I was already in there. I was technically still in the folder, not in the mounted location. And so when I did a CD dot dot to move up, that took me out of the original folder. And now when I change directory right back into USB storage, it's following that mount point and taking me right to that removable media. And now when I pull up that directory listing, there's all the stuff, right? Uh, and if I do a, uh, an unmount, if I remove the disk, then it comes out and I'll be back in the original folder, which may or may not have data in it, right? Now, unmounting a disk is pretty easy. You can use the umount command. Uh, some operating systems actually have it uh, as a secondary command called unmount or even a, uh, uh, an alias for unmount that points to umount, but the actual command is umount. And so I can say sudo umount, and I can tell it what I want to unmount. And I can unmount either by the folder or by the drive. So I could unmount and, and do this to slash dev slash sdb1, and it would know what I'm talking about. Or I could say slash mnt slash usb storage, and it would know what I'm talking about. It would go and it would unmount that. Now, I tried to unmount it while I was in the folder. And so I get a warning saying, hey, it's, it's in use, it's busy, all right? And that's good because we don't want to unmount something while we're still writing to it, right? If we were halfway through a write, we'd get corrupted data. So it's warning me, it's giving me a little safety net. And if I get out of that folder and rerun that umount command, now it's gonna unmount it and take that disk offline, which I can verify with the lsblk command. And I can look and I see that sdb1 is not mounted anywhere. And if I remount it, let me get back here and remount it. I thought it would be faster to pull it up from history. <laughs> there we go. Now I can run lsblk again. And now I can see right there that it is mounted to slash mnt slash usb dash storage. So pretty easy to mount. Now, this used to be a lot harder because you used to have to know what the file system was. And you had to provide that. And you still can. You can do a dash t and then the type of file system that's on there. But uh, Linux kernels oh, for the last like three or four years have auto-detected what that file system is, and so we don't have to provide it anymore. It makes life a lot more simple. Yeah, and we're all more thankful and better off for it. So thank you, Linux kernel people out there, for adding that support. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good thing. Now, Don, uh, this is an interesting thing, right? Mounting, it's, it's not too difficult. We just have to have our mount point, know what our device is, put the two together, and voila, we have a lovely drive that is now ready to be used inside of our system. But there is... There's a little caveat to this, and that is if we reboot our machine, <laughs> that's not going to persist, is it? That's right. Yeah, this, this is a temporary thing, mm -hmm. right? If I reboot, the system forgets about that drive, right? And, and if I, uh, uh, even if I like unplug it and plug it back in, it, it doesn't automatically mount it, right? I've got to go in and manually do that. If we want it to be a little more automated, we can tell the system when it boots up to look for this disk, and if it's there, go ahead and mount it, right? The operating system maintains a file. Uh, let me show you the file. It is, uh, I'll just cat it, it's slash etc slash fstab, right, uh, which is file system table. And it's just a simple text file, and it lists each of the disks that it's going to mount when the system boots up. So when my system boots up, it's looking for these disks and mounting them. So here I've got slash dev slash sda1, right, that's my, my other internal hard drive. And when it boots up, it's going to look for that disk. And if it finds it, it's going to mount it to slash MNT slash storage. Right? That's where it's going to attach it. And then I can see some of the other basic information about it. There's a lot of options and, and things that are, are tied to it. Uh, and then it goes on to, to say, I want to mount this disk. So let's say that I wanted to mount this USB disk every time I booted. Well, I actually wouldn't because it's a USB disk. right? It, it's not always going to be attached. So I don't want to mount it at boot time. But let's just say that I did. 
And if I wanted to, I could edit that file. Now, you do have to be an administrator to edit that file. So I'm going to use sudo again, and I'll say sudo, and I'll use vi to edit slash etc slash fstab. You can use you know whatever text editor it is you're happy with. Uh, and so we can go into that file, and I'm just going to add a new line right here to the end, and I'm going to give it the bare minimum information to get this thing mounted, right? So at a minimum, we need to tell it what device to look for. I'm looking for slash dev slash sdb1, okay? And if I find that device, I want to mount it somewhere. And I'm going to mount it to slash mnt slash USB dash storage. That's where I want it to go. All right. Now, I use tabs to separate that out. In the olden days, these files always looked nice and neat, right? And they used tabs to separate them out. But when things like LVM came along, the LVM titles are really long. Or disks that are mounted with a UUID, they're really long as well. And it messes up the formatting. So I still try and follow it just because I'm, I'm used to it. But it doesn't really matter. You just have to have a minimum of one space after the, the drive and then the mount point. Okay. Uh, the next thing I need to provide is what the file system is. And in the olden days, this was really important. You had to put the file system. If it was XFS, you had to put XFS. If it was EXT4, you had to put EXT4 or 3 or whatever file system it was. But on pretty much any new stuff, you could use the auto flag here, and it'll automatically figure it out. Now, I know that mine is EXT4 because I'm the one who formatted it. Uh, if I didn't know, I could use uh, FDisk or other utilities to be able to see what that file system was. Uh, or I could mount it with auto and then look at the mount output, and it would tell me what the file system was there, too. There are a few different ways to do it. But, uh, but in my case, I know that it's EXT4, so I'm going to provide that. All right. The next couple of parts are where things get a little bit on the interesting side. Right? Uh, if you look at the ones above me, like this one here, my home directory, it's XFS is the file system. And then it just says defaults right after it. Right? There's a number of options you can provide when you mount a disk. And you can tell it to do things like, uh, you know, maybe you want to mount it read only. And if you want to mount it read only, well, you can provide that as an option right here. And you can put RO. And now it's going to boot, and nobody will be able to write to it. They'll be able to read to it, and that's it. There's a ton of other options that are available that change performance and how we write. But usually, we just say defaults for typical storage like this. And then the last two numbers are probably the weirdest ones. Notice how they all have a 0, 0 after them. That's actually not normal. Normally, you'll see a couple that are uh, like a 0, 1 or uh, a 0, 2, right? The first number, that 0, uh, is actually kind of obsolete now. There used to be a command called dump, and you could use the dump command to back up a partition, and we've got tons of other ways to do that now, and, and the dump command is ancient, and I, I don't know anybody who still uses that. But basically what this first one would do is it would say, if you use the dump command, it will dump any drive that has a 1 for this value and make a backup of it. And so you'd say, I want to back up these drives, so I'll make these 1s, and that's it. But if you don't use the dump command, these numbers are completely useless, and so you'll usually see a 0 in that first entry. The second entry is a little more important. It says, periodically, when the system boots up, it's going to run a file system check. It's going to look for corruption on the disk and try and fix it. Okay? And if it finds it, great, it'll fix it. Well, what order does it check in? If you've got a zero, it says, don't do the check. Don't, don't bother checking this file system. All right? If it's got a one, it means that this will be the first partition that's checked. And then if it's a two, it'll mean it's second. Well, I should clarify that a little bit. You should only have one disk that has a 1, right? And it should be where your, your boot files are stored, right? That's the one that needs to be, you can't boot unless you have the kernel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so the one that's got the kernel and the one that you know, is your primary system partition, that's what should be checked first. And then everything else should have a 2, right? So that there's no 3, 4, 5, it's just, everything else should be a 2. So that, does that mean that it doesn't matter what order those are checked in? It's, it only, the only order that matters is that first one. Right, and, and it's because, like, if, I, if my storage disk doesn't mount, I can still boot my system. Right. But if my system disk doesn't mount, I, I can't boot the system anymore. So that's really what the differentiation is here. So you have zero, one, or two. Zero means don't do a check. We'll do it manually. One means go ahead and do the check first, and two just means do it after anything with a one is done. Right. Now, mine, you'll notice most of mine are disabled. This is my actual laptop, so you might be wondering, <laughs> why do I disable that? And it's because I use XFS, and XFS has its own maintenance plan. So the file system check here, FSCK, really is expecting you to have an EXT file system. So if you have EXT 2, 3, or 4, which are all really common, you'll see uh, zero ones and 2s in here. All right. Well, Don, it's very uh, interesting stuff. Now that we've got this thing, now if, we, if we've set this, we write this file, 
once we reboot, this will all stay persistent. Right, yep, and, and anytime it sees that disk at boot time, it'll mount it. Doesn't make a difference after boot time. The FSTAB file is only read during the boot or when you run the mount command. And so if I run mount, it can actually look at the FSTAB file and mount anything that isn't already mounted and, and bring that up. Uh, so you can certainly go that route. But yeah, this is what it would take to make it persistent across boots. All right. Well, now we've got some drives. We've actually got them mounted. We've, we've made that permanent. So I've loaded my disk. I'm, I'm going through life, and I said, you know what? I need to check how much space, because sometimes I might be working with large files, ISOs, things of that nature. Then it'd be quite large. And after a while, I've done it plenty of times, filled up my drive, yeah. with that, and then go, eh, not enough uh, disk space. I get a little prompt or something. How do I keep an eye on that, especially if I'm working with like a headless system? All right, we got two really handy commands here to be able to see the disk, and, and the, the best command really is DF, right? Uh, DS, DF, which is like disk-free, uh, something like that. You know, these old Unix yeah. acronyms. But, uh, <laughs> if you run DF, it gives you a list of all your mount points and what their storage is. Now, I, I rarely run DF by itself because it gives you all the sizes in 1K blocks, which are not very convenient. So I normally do DF-H, so I get human-readable sizes that make a little more sense. So you can see, like, the root of my file system is a 64-gig drive. I'm currently using a whopping 10 gigs of it, so I've got 55 gigs free, and I'm only using 16%. But I can scan down this really quick, and I can see, for example, here, my storage disk is 35% full. All right, well, you know, I'm, I'm eating up a lot of that storage. I wonder what it is that's eating up that storage. Well... I don't know. DF <laughs> doesn't show me that, right? DF is really good at giving me my overall high-level view, but it doesn't really go beyond that. So if I just want a quick glimpse across all my partitions, uh, which may include external disks, like down here I can see the external one that we just mounted. Uh, if we just want to get a quick view, DF is really good for that. We can see it. But it doesn't necessarily give us that drill down to then go and find out what's eating up our space. So, Don, what do we do to make that happen? Well, we, we bring in another command, ah. which is, uh, is named actually very similar. Uh, so D DF was really about free disk space. There's DU, which is about utilization. All right. Now, the DU command, if you just run it by itself, it looks at the folder that you're in. And oh, I've got some permission to permission here, so let me, let me yeah. switch over to my own <laughs> folder here. Uh, and you can pull it up, and it will give you a, a layout of everything. And, and look what it does. See how it, it breaks down into all the subfolders, and it really dives in there. Uh, and it can, you know, really give you, I don't know, a, a ton uh, information of... Information overload. <laughs> yeah, a, a ton of information that's hard to deal with. So I, I, I rarely run DU by itself. Uh, instead, I normally modify it a good bit. And so let, let's take, for example, my, my internal drive, this slash MNT slash storage, which DF-H told me a moment ago is 35% full. All right, well, why is it 35% full? I want to find out who's eating up so much space, because maybe I thought it was empty, or maybe... Maybe I'm at 99% full, and so I just need to find out where that space is being consumed. So I can jump in there with DU. And with DU, you can actually point it at another location. So I can say DU slash MNT slash storage. And so now it's going to point over there. But if I just run that, man, it's going to hit that whole drive. And I, I've got a ton of stuff over there, uh, really important stuff like Zork. Uh, and so I, <laughs> I can see all that information right there. And, uh, and it gives it to me, and it gives it to me in these, you know, uh, byte values yeah. and stuff. So let, let's, make this a, <laughs> let's make it a little more friendly, right? So I'm going to take this, I'm going to add a little bit more to it, right? Uh, I'm going to add dash CHD, first off, there's a, a couple of options, right? So um, dash C is me telling it I want to get a grand total. Give me a, a summary of the amount of storage at the end, right? Dash H, I want it to be human readable. I, I want it to have sizes like gigabyte and megabyte and kilobyte, not just straight up bytes. So make it a little more easier to read. And then D, I want to set a depth. I don't want it to go into every subfolder, right? On this disk, I've only got a couple of folders that are present. And I just want to know which folder is eating the most space. You know, if I go into my storage disk, I've got my Google Drive, my ISOs, QEMU, I've got shared VMs. I just want to know which folder is eating up that space. So dash D lets you set a depth, and you need to follow it by a number. I want to go one folder deep, and that's it. So this would be dash D1, and since I'm combining my letters, it's dash CHD1. And, uh, and the way I remember this is, uh, 
Daniel, do you ever see the movie Chud? Chud. I, Chud. I, I, when you wrote CHD, I thought, <laughs> Chud. <laughs> it's a terrible B-horror film from the 80s. The Don the, loves. <laughs> it's how I remember disc utilization. Like, what is eating up all my space? See, it had, Chud. It had its purpose, Don. It had <laughs> so, its purpose. <laughs> that's my mnemonic on this one. So, so anyhow, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do uh, DU, and I'll do dash CHD1 slash MNT slash storage, and it's going to lay the folders out for me, right? And when I run that... Now, this is a heck of a lot more useful to me, right? Because I can see my Google Drive is eating up 1.7 gigs. I can see that my ISOs are eating up 114 gigs. I, I got a lot of ISO images. Uh, my profile is 4.5 gigs. I've got show notes at 4.3 gigs. Uh, my VMs, looks like they're the winner, at 141 gigs. So I've got virtual machines that are consuming the most space. And from here, we can start drilling down and say, okay, well, which VM? So let me go ahead and look inside of the VMs folder. And now I can look in here, and I can see that uh, looks like, who's our winner on this one? I guess uh, the Windows VM. I got a Windows it's VM a Lab DC01. Oh, no, Mac OS. Lab DC01? Oh, yeah. that oh, no, that's 28 gigs. Looking over it, yeah. yeah. Um, Mac OS at 28 gigs. So I got a, a Mac virtual machine, and it's at 28 gigs in size. So now I've identified who's eating up that space. I might have to run the command a few times before I finally get all the way down to the level where I, I'm able to identify it, but I am able to see it and, and drill down with that. So... DF is great for a quick view. DU is really useful when we actually need to find out what's consuming our storage. Well, Don, I wish I would have had this episode back when I first started with Linux because it takes you a little while usually to fill up your drive and where you're actually needing these types of things in some real, like, emergency way. And then you're like, I don't know how to check for this. Yeah. This would have been fantastic. And it was a great demonstration showing us how we can mount our drives, how we can permanently make that happen and then start looking at utilization when it comes to what is actually going on inside of those drives. Don did a fantastic job with these demonstrations today. I appreciate it. Uh, but looking at the clock over here, and it has sorely run out of time for us today. <laughs> I do like to give you a chance to add anything to the show before we close it. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot more commands involved yeah. with storage, but the ones you've seen here are pretty basic. And uh, I'll just say that I was pretty shocked that Zork wasn't what was actually <laughs> eating up all my disk space. Yeah, that's like a whole whopping 16K or something. <laughs> <laughs> but these are pretty handy commands. And, you know, Daniel, you mentioned, like, you wish you would have known that earlier. There's a lot of stuff that can happen, usually centering around log files, mm -hmm. where some service starts crashing on your system or some daemon is restarting, and it floods your log files and fills up your hard drives. And DU is a great way to find that. So a wonderful troubleshooting tool, not just an informational tool. All right. Well, Don, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time, and we appreciate our audience out there for watching. But as I've said, we've run out of time for this episode. Come back for more, though. We've got plenty to come. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazette. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we have a treat for you. We're doing Linux and our command line Linux stuff. That's what we've been working on. Don's laughing at me because I'm butchering our uh, our intro here. But that's what we're doing, and joining us today, the laughter is coming from Mr. Don. Is that Don, welcome to the show. How are you, Mr. Funny Man? Hey, I'm doing great, and now that we've set the bar at that high level of quality, I know I can live up to it. That's right. Uh, well, I like to help episode. you out. Yeah. We're going to be finding files, and, and this is a, a fun episode for me because I lose stuff all the time. I can't remember where I put things in the file system, and then i got to find them. And uh, in the, the Linux world, we actually have a ton of ways to find it almost all of which are faster than the GUI, right? In the GUI, you have the ability, usually through whatever your file manager is, like Nautilus, where you can go in and do a search and they'll find files, but they're all slow. I've tried them all, they're all slow. I don't know why, they just are. But when you go to the command line, we have a virtual cornucopia of utilities that we can <laughs> use to, to locate files and locate information across the drive. And so I want to walk you through a handful of those all of which have saved my bacon at some point or another <laughs> in my career. So we'll get a chance to see them right here in this episode. All right, Don. Well, let's pick the first fruit out of that veritable cornucopia. Uh, what are we going to do? All right. Let's start off with the which command, which 
Uh, if you, so top hat, pointy <laughs> broom. Right? We're gonna burn it Pulse in the <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, This is going off the rails. We are having so, fun. <laughs> so uh, if you've watched all of these episodes, I've actually already used the witch command in some other episodes, like when we were setting our shells. If I wanted to set my default shell, I needed to know where the shell was stored. You might have a utility that you run, that you run all the time, but you have no idea where it is on the file system. Thanks to the the search path, it finds things for me. So maybe, for example, I. I start using the nano text editor. This is where you know I'm lying because I never it's use it. Because you don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go to my command line here, and I'm just going to run nano, and there it is, the nano text editor. It's amazing. Now, <laughs> where did that come from? Where is that executable actually stored? And you can use the which command, which is not W-I-T-C-H, but <laughs> W-H-I-C-H, and I can say which nano. And it'll tell me. It'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's in slash user slash bin slash nano. That's where it's at. So now I've found that binary. And the which command works great when I'm looking for binary executables like this. Right? But it's not perfect. What the which command does is it looks for the very first match. In other words, there could be more than one copy of nano on my disk, or nano could have other supporting files on the disk, and which won't find them. Right? It finds the very first one and returns it. That means it goes quick, which is nice, and it's usually going to find the right one, but occasionally it doesn't. So it's not perfect, but if you're in a hurry, like, like in the, the shell episode, I just need to know where the shell was, and the first one's going to be the right hit. That's what I want, and I use that which command. But you can also do where is. Probably the first full-on appropriately named Unix <laughs> command that we'll ever see. They didn't drop the vowels or anything. It's nah. just, where is? And then you can type something. So I said, where is nano? And when I run that, this one gives me more than one hit. Okay? So it shows, if we look at the output here, it shows the search term that I used, nano. Right? And it found slash user slash bin slash nano. That was the first hit. But then it found slash user slash share slash nano. The heck's that all about? Well, I have a second copy of that binary. Apparently, I didn't know that prior to this very second. <laughs> I've got a second copy of that binary. And maybe I did that on purpose. Maybe some software did it. Maybe that's just a link. That might not even be a real file. I'd have to go and check it out. But it also found the man page for nano.1.gz, right? It's gzipped and archived. But notice how the file extension didn't count against the name here. It found it, and it returned it. So where is is a much more thorough kind of search. So in that shell episode where I said like which bash and I found that it was slash user slash bin slash bash, I could have also done where is bash and it would have looked and found it. And it finds that same file as well as the man file for it. We locate it and we can spot it. So those two commands are pretty interchangeable. It's just whether or not you want to get the first hit and run with it uh, or if you want to get more. It's like uh, when you go to Google and they've got the are you feeling lucky button. Yeah. Which is the I'm feeling lucky button, and then where is is the uh, give me the I don't know, Yahoo results or something. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> deluge. Now, Don, was that will that work with uh, things like we used stars and periods and stuff? It's kind of like wild cards in other episodes. If I just run bash and I know bash is like in the command that I'm looking for, but it's not the command I'm looking for, does that work? Yeah. Or does it, it just look for proper it, commands? It will actually do it. And so, like, if I do which star bash star. It will try it, but it doesn't work, right? So <laughs> it's one of those things where you can do it, but it doesn't work. And if you look, I just ran that and see how it says uh, it looked for it. And it did run the command, right? But it wasn't able to find the literal star bash star. Like it, it treated those stars as being literal. And I can't remember, but I think where is is the same way. Let's, let's give it a shot here. And yeah, see, it just kind of poo-pooed that one. So, it, you know, it didn't find it there. So wildcards don't work so well. It expects you to know the name of the command. And if you don't know the name of the command, well, that's where we can go to, like, uh, apropos or, you know, one of right. those other commands to be able to find it and then go and, and actually locate the file. So wildcard is not, not so friendly on this one. All right. Well, Don, sometimes I've run into this. I've tried to use a which. I've tried to use where is. And I know it exists on the system, but it comes back with nothing. All right. Um, is there any, what, what is that about? There, there's one big scenario where that normally happens, and it's with what are called shell built-in commands. So there's some commands like exit. If I type exit right now, I know that it works. In bash, it'll exit and take me out of the bash shell, right? But if I do a which exit, it doesn't find it. It says no exit in, and then it lists out all the folders that it searched in. Or if I do a where is exit, it doesn't find it, right? Well, actually, it did. If, 
found the really? uh, man pages, apparently, oh, but oh, not yeah. the actual, like there's no binary in this list. These are all man pages for the exit command, right? So where is did a better job? Right. But it still didn't actually find the command. Where the heck is that command coming from? Well, I know that it's a shell built in. So it's built into the bash shell. So bash is the actual executable, not exit. And that's why it's not showing up. But if you didn't know that, a quick way to verify is to use the type command. If you do type and then you type a command, if I say like type ls, it tells me that ls is a command. Well, in my case, ls is more than a command. ls is an alias. In Red Hat, they've aliased ls to actually run ls dash dash color equals auto. And that's why when I run ls, it's all nice and pretty with colors, mm -hmm. right? Because they, they've aliased that. But if I do a type cp, well, that's just the copy command. It's slash user slash bin slash cp, right? That's where it's coming from. It's just a regular old binary. But if I do type exit, it's going to tell me that's not a binary on the file system. It's a shell built in. So if we can't find a binary, there's a chance that it's a built-in, that it's coming from somewhere else. And if you do type followed by the name of the command that you're issuing, you can find that out pretty easily. So it's a neat command to figure out why you've got this, in theory, invisible command. But it works, but we just can't find it. Type will tell us. Well, this is great. Now I can, I can find out where all my commands are coming from, or at least most of them, the vast majority, with these uh, three simple commands. Very, very nice for me. But I also have files that I lose. I'm like you, Don. I lose stuff all the time. I'm like, where the heck did I put that stinking file? Where's that directory? Where's this? Where's that? And I need, I need to find files. Yeah. Uh, let's dive into that. How do we start finding files? All right. So we've been finding commands so far, yeah. but finding a file is different. So for example, I've got this file right here, passlist.txt, right? So let's say I, I didn't know where that was. And I, actually, I did a bad job. I stuck it in my home directory, not in my documents folder. So this is a, an example of a file that I would lose. So <laughs> if I can't remember where I put this thing, I can search for it, right? And there's a few different ways to search for a, a file on your system, but one of the best ways is by using the locate command. Locate is a really cool command that will very, very quickly scan across your system to be able to find out where that file is. So I could say locate passlist.txt, and it immediately returns slash home slash dpossess slash passlist.txt. Or if I look for... Uh, you know, like a readme. I'm looking for readme files. And here's all these readme files. And notice how it's not counting extensions. It's, it's looking like it's finding these readme.txt and so on. And it's finding a ton of these spread all across the place. And so I can look in and try and find the, the one that I'm hunting uh, and, and locate that to, to read it. So locate's big advantage is that it's just so fast. It yeah. finds that data really quickly and returns it. This is faster than the GUI does. And it's obviously looking for that string of text that you give it, regardless of where it exists. So if it has .txt after it, maybe it yeah. something before it. It's looking for the, that actual string of characters, right? Yep, and, and while it seems like it's all sunshine and rainbows, it is the greatest command ever. Yeah. Why not use it always? It does actually have one little, little negative to it. The way that it searches so fast is that it has pre-indexed all of your files ahead of time, right? So it's built a database of all the files in your file system. And so when I run the locate command, it's not actually scanning across all my disks. It's just looking at this database. And that's why it's so fast. When you use the GUI, it's not normally using the, uh, a database. It's, it's actually looking and parsing through all the files. And that takes time. This is fast because it's got a database. But as a result, the database can be missing something. So for example, if I create a file uh, you know, like a test123.txt in my home directory, and then I do a locate for test123.txt, it didn't find it, right? And the reason is I just made that file, and it's not in the database yet. And you'll have to look at your system. Most systems have a, a cron job that runs uh, periodically that will update the locate database. And it might be tied to your user, or if you're the administrator, you can look inside of a slash etc slash cron. But even for you as a user, you could do like cron tab dash e to look at your cron jobs. And I don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not updating my database. So when's it going to update? Well, whenever the system decides that it's time to update. So if you want to run locate and know that you're looking at everything, you'll need to update that database by running update db. All right. And I'm pretty sure you need to be an administrator for that. So I'm going to sudo update db. And it's going to run. And that service kicks off in the background. And it's now indexing my disks. Now, the larger your disks, the more data you have, the longer this will take. The faster your disks, the smaller they are, the faster this will go. Um, my disks aren't that large. And they're, they're SSD. So it should go pretty quick. 
And if I repeat that locate, there we go, now it found it, all right? So understand that locate is really fast because it's using potentially outdated information. So if you want to guarantee that you're scanning everything, make sure you run update DB first, and then you can do locate. You'll find that stuff really fast. Don, love the locate command. Ever since I've uh, discovered it, it's been a great thing for me. Uh, but there's also the granddaddy of all finding utilities inside of our system, which is good old find, right? Yep, the, the find command. The find command is like the original way of, of searching for this stuff. And with find, we don't have a database. We don't have some kind of uh, precognition or anything. It just says, <laughs> you know, screw it. I'm going to scan the whole file system, and I'll find every file that matches your criteria. And, and if it takes me an hour to do it, it'll take an hour to do it, right? <laughs> That's just how it is. Find will scan through looking at every single file until it finds what you tell it to look for. The nice thing about the find command is it doesn't need updates. You know it's always looking at the current data. It's slower, but you get this better search. And with find, we can tell it to look for all sorts of things. Now, my normal method for using find is to come in and tell it uh, that I want to search. I'll say find, and then you tell it where. So I might want to search my home directory. So I'll say tilde slash, or I'm in my home directory. I could say dot slash, I guess. But I want to search this directory, and then I'm going to search by name. So I'll do dash name, and then the name uh, that I, I want to find. In, in my case, I want to look for passlist.txt, and I'll run that, and it'll scan through my home directory, and it'll find it. Okay, That's the, the most basic form of the find command. You basically give it two things. right? The first thing is the directory you want to search, and then after that, the criteria you're looking for. And in this example, I use name as what I was looking for. But, I mean, you can look for other things. The find command is actually really powerful. You can search based on file permissions. You can search based on file size, right? Maybe I, I want to look inside of a, a folder and find any file that's over a, a certain size, right? So um, in the last episode, we found where I had some, some ISO images that were uh, eating up a lot of space, right? So if I go into slash MNT slash storage slash ISOs, I've got a bunch of ISO images, right? All these different software that I work with, and they're all occupying space. And I might say to myself, man, I bet some of these are just bigger than they should be. I, I want to see anyone that's over four gigs in size. And if it's over four gigs in size, I probably need to evaluate whether or not I really need to keep that disk. And so I could do, I'm, I could have just done an LS. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> look, right? But if I wanted to search across my entire disk and, and find files everywhere that were over four gigs in size, maybe I'm running low on disk space. I just want to search everywhere. I could say find, and then I could point to where I wanted it to go. Like, I could just go to the root mm. if I wanted, right? I'm not going to do that. I'll do slash mount slash storage slash ISOs. All right, I want to look in that folder. And then instead of dash name, I'm going to do dash size. And when I specify dash size, I need to tell it what I'm looking for. And dash size, it actually, actually defaults to a specific size. And, you know, I, I don't know, a specific size. So I want it to be dynamic. I'm going to use the plus sign so it knows that I'm talking about files greater than a particular size. You can do a minus, and that would be files smaller than a certain size. And I'll say 4G like that. So it knows that I'm looking for files over 4 gigs in size. So you can do 4M, it would be 4 megs, uh, 4K, 4 kilobytes. Uh, for bytes, it's actually 4C. I don't know why it's C instead of B, but, but it is. That's right. so, um, so you do have some, some different ones. You can look at the, the man page for find, and you'll see where they lay out all the different stuff. But, uh, but I'm going to look through here, and it's going to return any ISO that I have that's over 4 gigs. And while the directory had a lot of ISOs, there's only about 10 here that are over 4 gigs. Most of them are, are Mac ones. Uh, but uh, I've got a Red Hat one that's over 4 gigs, and a uh, good old CentOS. Uh, no Ubuntu, no. which I usually make fun of for being bloated, but uh -huh. their ISO images are smaller. So, <laughs> <laughs> so who's right now? That's uh, right. Me. Eat it, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so that's the find command. I did name. I did size. I, you can do a lot more. Uh, you can do permissions. You can use ands and ors. I could say, like, if the size was over 4 gigs and the name ended in .iso. Right? I, I could be really specific. So you can, you can do notations like that to really get it specific and kind of tailor what it is you're looking for and, and get that information back. Um, one warning about the find command. If I want to, like, let's say I just want to find ISO images on my, my disk and I want to find them anywhere, right? I could do a find slash dash name star dot ISO, like that, right? I'm looking for anything that ends in ISO. When I run that, as a regular user, I don't have permission to a lot of folders. And so I'm going to start getting messages uh, that come up and, oops, uh, screw that up. 
dash name and uh, do I have to quote that? I don't think I have to quote it. But yeah, I think you do have to quote it actually. All right. Well, there we go. Uh, so it starts scanning across, and you'll see where it found the ISOs. Oh, and, and I did that kind of quick. I put single ticks around the star dot ISO so it knew what I was talking about there. So that, that's what fixed my little error there. But uh, uh, but you'll see where it did find the ISOs. So that was good, right? It found some in the trash. It found some in slash mount slash storage slash ISO. That's good. But I got a lot of permission denied messages, right? Because as a regular user, there's a lot of stuff that you don't have permission to. And so you get an error for every one of those. And I actually got a lot of errors. So when I run the find command like that, a lot of times I'll redirect the errors to just throw them away. Like, don't, don't give me the errors. Just show me the good stuff. And if you want to redirect errors, you can stick a two greater than. That redirects standard error. And you can redirect it. Just chuck it into, like, slash dev slash null, uh, which is, like, the, the black hole of Linux. It I, says, I was sure it was called the bit bucket. The bit bucket, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember that description too, where you just take the bits and you chuck them over there and they go away. So by doing this, I'm just redirecting the errors, and all I should be left with is the good stuff. So if you ever search the whole file system, I recommend you add this little bit onto the end, and that'll make it a lot neater. And now I just get the ISOs and see how all those errors are gone. I, I still don't have permission to those folders. That didn't change. But at least I, I'm not you know overwhelmed with them. And now I see all those ISOs that it found, and I can locate them. And uh, you know, do whatever it is. That <laughs> well, Don, I noticed that when I do finds, especially when I'm working with the find command, you get a lot of that type of output. The real power comes in when I'm looking for something specific. I'm not a hundred percent on what exactly I'm looking for, but I know some portion of it or something to that effect. I'll typically work with the grep command as well to help me weed down exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, you know, grep is really handy because it can look inside of files, right? Everything that I've done this whole episode, right, we're almost at the end now, and in this whole episode, I've been searching based on file name, right? What if we don't know the file name, like yeah. Daniel said? Or what if it's not the file name that matters? Maybe I know. Maybe I've got 20 right. files. I know their names. I just want to know which files contain a certain value, right? I'm looking for something like that. You can use grep, and grep will search inside of files and start to locate that information. So, for example, um, in my home directory, I might have uh, a couple of files, right? Like, uh, here, let's kind of make this a little bit smaller. And, uh, and I will make uh, a couple of files. And so I've got test1, 2, and 3.txt, right? Uh, so there they are. And I might edit, uh, we'll do test2, and I'm going to insert a string, right? So I'll just type string, right? So, so there's my, my string. And then I might edit some of the other files, like file three, and it doesn't have a string, or it's got some other word like uh, uh, test, or, you know, whatever it is that's inside of it. Uh, maybe file one has a couple of terms in it, right? So it's got this is, wow, I can't even spell this. <laughs> this is a string, whatever, right? Uh, so if I wanted to find files that contained the word string, I can use grep for that. Now, grep, it can run against binaries as well as text files. And so I don't normally want to search binaries. I wouldn't want to search my ISO folder <laughs> for a string. It'll take a long time, first off. But also, it's not going to return me good results. But when you're dealing with text files, uh, especially like configuration files, I do this inside of slash etc all the time, where I'm like, I need the configuration file for Apache. But I can't remember what it's called. Is it, is it httpd.com or is it uh, apache.com, apache2.com? I don't know. Let, let me search for SSL because I know it'll, it'll <laughs> turn up in, in the file yeah. and, and we can and return it like that. Uh, grep can do that. And the way the grep command works is, is you run, well, grep, and then you follow it by what you're going to search for. So I'm going to search for the word string. Right? That's what I'm looking for. But you might be looking for something else. You might be looking for uh, Apache or whatever. You type whatever search string it is that you want. And then you tell it where to look. All right? So I might want it to look right here in the test folder, which is the, the current directory that I'm in. So I can type dot slash or I could do tilde slash test or, or whatever. Look in that folder, search the files, and tell me which ones contain the word string. And when I run that, I get oops, that it's a directory. So I need to actually add a slash so that I, I know it's a directory. Darn it, the slash star, so that it knows to look at all the files inside of that directory. There we go. <laughs> we'll get it. You can do it, Doc. <laughs> I know. And so it looked, and it found test one, it found test two, and it didn't find test three. Test three didn't contain the word string. Test one and test two did. In fact, let me edit 
uh, test one. And on that line that's got the string, let me turn that into a sentence, right? So like this is a string, isn't it awesome? There we go. And now it's a, a full on string, okay? And now when I rerun that search, what it's returning is not just that it found the word, it's returning the entire line that it found it on. Now, I'm on Red Hat, and Red Hat colorizes grep. Uh, Ubuntu does mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Fedora does too. So it's actually highlighting it in red for me. The default for grep is not to do that, though. So if your distro is doing it, great. But on a normal system, it'll just come up as black and white. But you see it. Like, here's the whole sentence, that line that it found the string on. So now I can quickly locate which file it is that contains the data that I want. Now, the search that I did is only searching the files right here in this folder. And oftentimes you'll want to search subfolders as well. And so if I want to look in subfolders, I need to change grep just a little bit by adding dash r. And that's going to make it do a recursive search. It'll search in this folder and any subfolder it finds underneath. And now you can look across your entire file system if you want to, right? We could change this to, uh, if we really want to do a crazy slash star. And now it's going to search the whole file system and try and, and locate uh, anything that contains that word string in it and, and see where it goes from there. So you can certainly do that. It will take a long time. You'll get a ton of errors, so you'll want to redirect that error output like I showed you a moment ago, uh, but it'll hunt through and it will find it. And I'm starting to see a pattern with that dash R showing up everywhere when it comes to recursiveness. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's nice that it's consistent. Mm -hmm. Some commands do expect it to be a capital R, which is annoying, That's but true. for most of them it's just a lowercase r uh, and you'll get it there. Um, you know, a couple other little command options that I use with grep. Uh, if color is turned off by default, you can actually add a, uh, uh, an I, the letter I. Uh, that'll tell it to colorize. And so it, or no, sorry, it's not. It's a dash dash color. There mm -hmm. we go. So if it's not displaying with color, I could come in and say, I mean, not search the whole system. <laughs> Probably uh, a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So it would be dash dash color like that. And then we would search, and then it would know to colorize it and show it. So if it wasn't coloring for you. Um, the I that I mentioned is another one that's kind of handy. Because what it does is it makes it case insensitive, right? Let's uh, let me show you an example here. If I edit, um, uh, we'll do test. So what was it test two? I'm going to take that string and I'm going to make it a capital S, right? And when I do that search and I come in and I look for it, see how it didn't find test two anymore? Because the string started with a capital S. It's case sensitive. So if you add an I, that makes it case insensitive. And when I run that. Now it finds test two again. And that's really handy, especially in config files where you don't know whether it's, maybe it's all caps, all lowercase, maybe the first letter's capitalized. We don't know. Uh, and I can really help with that. All right. Well, Don, we've gone through many, many ways in which we can look through our file system, find binaries, find files, find actual pieces of strings that we're looking for inside of uh, specific files that we might not know the names of. Very, very handy stuff. Is there any other finding utilities or finding tricks and tips that you have for us? Uh, you know, sometimes you, you don't want to find something. Huh? Maybe I, I, I want to search for files that don't contain a string. It's not, not as common, but maybe. Uh, and with grep, you can do a dash V, and dash V is like the exclusion. We don't want to search for a particular string. Uh, and, and then you'll return the files that don't have it. That, that can be useful. Uh, maybe I want files that don't end in dot .back or something, and, yeah. and grep can turn those up. So uh, just be aware, sometimes it's not searching for something. It's searching for the absence of something. And, and most of these commands support that as well. Great. That's, it's kind of like building a whitelist versus a blacklist, depending on what's going to overwhelm the other. Sometimes you meet right in the middle, and it's just choose whatever you like. <laughs> yeah. Very fun stuff. But now, hopefully, if you felt a little lost at sea when it comes to looking for things inside of a of just a, inside of a terminal, inside of a console, and you're like, man, I, I would love to be able to find that. Hopefully this episode has helped you out with that. Don, I think you did a fantastic job of showing us many of the options that we have for locating items inside of our, our Linux systems. So I think, I think you've equipped our audience out there, and we appreciate <laughs> that. Thanks for joining us again, and we do thank our audience, as always, for joining us as well. We do appreciate your viewership, but it's that time for us to sign off. For IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don You're watching IT Pro TV. All right.
right, greetings everyone and welcome to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host Daniel Lowry and in today's episode, well guess what, we're back with more on our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio, the man, the myth, the legend, you know him as Don Pizet. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going today? <laughs> Great. Now i got this high bar to live That's up right. to. Uh, Let's see it. Make <laughs> the magic happen. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I am glad to be back. You know, in this episode, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, each episode, I've kind of picked a, a single topic to, to address and shown a series of commands that are all related to one topic. And then I kind of got to the bottom of my command barrel and said, <laughs> here's... Here's stuff that's really important that I think people need to know, but it's just not necessarily related. So this is going to be our grab bag episode or potpourri potluck, I don't know, whatever, our mixed nuts bag of <laughs> commands uh, that I think are handy to know that to make your command line experience a lot more friendly. So, um, yeah, I don't have some great summary here. Just yeah, We're going to yeah. cover a bunch of junk, uh, a bunch of useful technologies useful, yes. right here in this episode. Well, Don, this is going to be a real fun for me as the host because it's you, they don't really connect. <laughs> they're, they're all very disjointed. So I'm just going to kind of tee you up for each one of our topics that we have. All and right. you'll take it away from there. First one's going to be foreground and background processes. Very important thing and can really be helpful for us, right? Absolutely. Yep. So, uh, you know, the, the Linux operating system or the kernel is a uh, uh, multitasking operating system at heart. It can run more than one application at the same time. And via the GUI, we do that easy. There's a bunch of windows, right? But you can actually multitask from the command line as well. And it's a, a, a far less used technique, but it is actually really useful, especially if you're SSH'd into a system and you've only got one shell, but you want to run more than one program, it can be a little tricky. So there are built-in commands we can use to actually run more than one thing at a time. So let me show you, for example, uh, I'm in my terminal here. And if I run something like the Midnight Commander, right? I run MC, fire up the Midnight Commander, it goes full screen. It takes over my, my shell. So now my entire session is occupied by this one program. Blue awesomeness. Uh, it is. I, I like being a computer. But, uh, so I'm in here. I'm working. It's great. There we go. Right? But maybe I really quick just want to see what my IP address is. Okay? Well, I know that if, if I were in my regular command prompt, I could run IP ADDR. Right? And there's actually a way to run a command here in Midnight Commander, which I can't remember. But, uh, uh, but wouldn't it be nice if, just like in a GUI, if I could just minimize this window for a moment? run my other command, and then bring this window back up. But it's not a window. It's a full screen application. It's running and it's taking my session. So what you can do is you can stuff this application in the background by hitting Control Z. Control Z, uh, some people call it the sleep combination. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's like a sleep number bed. Uh, <laughs> I'll just hit Control Z, and the application goes in the background. Okay, So it's now hiding in the background for me. And I can recover it whenever I'm ready. But I can drop in here. Now I can do an IP ADDR. I can see my IP address. And then when I'm ready to pull that application back up, I can. And the way you do that is by knowing the job number. Each application that you run is treated as a job for your session. And it gets stuffed in the background. And if you run the jobs command, you'll see the jobs that you've got. Now I've only got one, so I knew it was job number one. But you could have three or four different programs that you've been launching and using. You know, maybe I launch into Nano, which actually is it. I don't think Nano lets me do the Control-Z combination. Uh, but maybe I'm in Vim, and I stuff that one in the background. And you know, any other applications I can think of, even simple applications like FTP, which I don't have installed. Uh, <laughs> applications like that, you can stuff them in the background. And when you run jobs, there they are. Right Now, some applications keep running in the background. Most applications stop. They just freeze, right? What is Midnight Commander going to do when it's sitting there in the background? It's going to do nothing. So it stops. It's still running. It's still consuming memory, but it's not consuming CPU. It's saving resources. Sometimes we do want them to keep running, and I'll show you some tricks with that. But here, it stopped, and I can pull it back up by just doing a percent and then the number of the job that I want to recover. So if I want to go back into Midnight Commander, I would type percent one, and now I'm back into Midnight Commander. And I hit Control Z, and I could type percent two, and now I'm back into Vim, right? So I'm able to quickly move between these applications without actually closing them. They're still running. I could be in Vim and have not saved my file yet, and just park it in the background with Control Z, jump over to Midnight Commander, do whatever it is that I need, and then come back again very easily. So I'm multitasking with these applications. Even though I'm just in a single shell, I'm able to do that. Now. I mentioned how they're, they're in the background, but they're stopped, and that's usually a good thing. But maybe I'm doing something like running Apache, right? I want to fire up a web server, but not 
I don't want it to be a daemon that runs every time my computer boots up. I just want to run it right now, right? And so you can run HTTPD D, and it'll run just one time, right? As opposed to running as a service. But if I run it and I stick it in the background, it's going to stop. And that's not so good, right? So if I want to run it and have it keep running, what I need to do is hit Control Z to stick it in the background, and then you can type BG. And BG will say, take that background task and let it run in the background. Okay, let it run and keep doing its thing. Now, I, I did Midnight Commander. It, Midnight Commander doesn't support running in the background, so it just stopped immediately again. Uh, but I can look at my jobs, and, and there they are. And so you might have one in the background that says running. And I might have that web server that's now running, and it's a temporary thing. It's in the background, and that's that. All right. When you use Control Z, though, the default is to stop, and you use BG to then stick it back there. Uh, you can use FG, which is foreground. I don't normally use this one, but FG will bring the application back into the foreground again and take you right back into it. So there I am. I usually use the percent and then a number because if you have multiple programs you want to pick, and with FG, well, you could do FG followed by a number, uh, but it's just faster to do a percent. Yeah. So. I typically am only running one thing in the background if I'm doing this, so FG works quickly for me. Mm -hmm. But if I do have those multiple processes, then, yeah, I go percent style. Yep. And there's actually another alias that makes this even easier. If I'm, if I'm doing something like uh, Apache and I want to run it in the background and I'm doing HTTPD dash D like that, so I'm going to run it and I want it to go into the background, but I want it to keep running, I can do that all at once just by running it and typing in ampersand. Ampersand means go ahead and run and then just get out of my way, right? <laughs> uh, and you would do this any time that you called, like maybe you called a GUI utility from the command line, right? If I'm in the command line and I launch gedit, right? That's a graphical editor. So it's going to launch the window. But look at my shell back here. In my shell, it's taken over by gedit, right? It, it's locked this shell for me. And the application is running, and if I close it, then I get my shell back again. But if I ran gedit followed by an ampersand, that means run the program, stick it in the background, but keep it running. And now it runs, and so there's my, my, my uh, gedit. It's working. I can type in it, you know, the Great American Novel or whatever. Uh, and back here, I have my shell again, and I can keep working. And if I look at my jobs, there's gedit, and see how gedit shows as running? It's not stopped like the other ones. It's running. It's doing its job even though it's in the background, right? So using Control-Z will stick it in the background, and it will freeze it. It'll stop it. BG would start it running again if it supports that. Or you can just straight up run it and stick it in the background like this. I could do a percent three and switch over to that one, except it's a graphical utility. So if I do that, it doesn't quite work. And now my shell is taken over, right? And if I do a control Z, see how it stopped? And so that's not necessarily a good thing, right? It stopped even though I've got it open back here. And if I try and type, it's actually not responding to me typing. I've frozen it now, which is not so good. Uh, and I can use BG. And I don't know if you saw, but all of a sudden my letters appeared as soon as I ran BG to start it back up again. And if I look at the jobs, there it is, and it's running, and it's working. So uh, it was kind of a, a series of commands there, right? So there was Control-Z to stick something in the background, or the ampersand to just run it in the background from the beginning, and then BG and FG to uh, start something running in the background or bring it to the foreground again. And then there was the percent numbers to pick from a job. So that's kind of the, the little multitasking system that's built into every Linux distro that's out there and, and really every Unix and, and BSD one as well. Uh, so a great way to do that all right from the command line. Don, I like how you framed it as uh, basically the command line version of minimizing and maximizing, just getting things out of our way so we can do other things and, and have our tasks. And then when we're ready for it, bring it right back up. Very, very helpful thing. This is something that you're actually probably going to engage in with quite some frequency. So... Get familiar with those commands so that you can do that whenever you need it. Now, Don, moving on, we're talking about just odds and ends. Another one that you've got uh, put down in our notes here is chaining commands. And this is actually super helpful because I don't want to type in a command, hit enter, type a command, enter, or have a command take over my shell. Well, I've got to put that in the background. I just want to put them all together and let them run and be done with it. Yeah, absolutely. In, in, in other episodes, I talk about pipelining commands where you take the output for one command and you feed it into another command, right? So like uh, if I just run dmessage, and when I run this, uh, if we take a look at my computer, when I run dmessage, it's going to give me a flood of data, right? And so I might pipe the output of one command into the next command. Like I might pipe that into more, and now I get paginated output, right? 
That's the two commands working together. But sometimes I don't want them to work together. I just want to run two completely different, unrelated commands, and I just want to run them all in one line, right? And so you can do that by chaining them, and we chain by using a semicolon. So for example, maybe I want to get information about this system. Uh, I, I, this is the first time I've logged into the laptop, I want to know about it. So I want to run uname-a to be able to find what kernel it's running. And then I want to run hostname to find out what its hostname is, right? Or, or maybe hostname CTL to get even better information, right? Uh, and then I want to run IP ADDR to find out what IP address it is, right? Each of these are valid commands that I could run by themselves. But I'm separating them with semicolons. And the semicolons are telling the command line, don't run these together, run them one at a time. They're independent commands, they're independent from each other. And when I run that, I get my output. And right here in the first line, that is uname-a's output. And then right after that, I get hostname CTL's output. And right after that, I get IP ADDR's output. It ran each command in the order that I typed them. That's command chaining. And so if you've got two things that you know you're going to do, for example, um, maybe I just installed Apache, and I know that I want to enable the daemon so that it'll start at boot time, and I want to start the daemon so it'll start right now. You could say system CTL enable HTTPD, and then a semicolon system CTL start HTTPD. That will tell it start up when the system boots and start it right now. Right um, now, there's other shortcuts that make that easier, but, but this is a way that I would do: just run the two commands. I know I'm going to run them anyway, but here I can put them on one command. Really handy when you're scripting and automating and shrink the size of your script files a good bit by chaining commands together like this. Now, Donna, a lot of times when I'm typing commands, and if anybody out there has worked in Linux in any stretch of the imagination for any length of time, you'll notice a lot of commands tend to take up a lot of space. And then <laughs> they'll wrap around down to below. And if you're chaining commands together, God help you, right? Because it just gets, it gets a little too difficult to read. It's almost obfuscated to our, our human acumen, right, to see sure. it and go, what is this? Is there a way that we can break that up to see those easier? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, take a command like user add. Right? I, I want to add a new user to my system. And so when I start to run this, uh, you know, I need to specify a lot of data, like where's their home directory. So um, I'm going to create a, a user called John Doe. Right? So I'll say uh, dash D slash home slash J Doe. Right? That's going to be where their home directory is. And then I might specify when their account expires. Uh, so I would say that it's going to be 01 slash 01 slash 2018. Right? So it's going to expire on January 1st. And I keep going on. I, I want to put them in a group. I'll call the group J Doe. I might have some secondary groups like uh, ADM or wheel, you know, whatever, which I can't spell, um, <laughs> whatever it is that I, I want to stick them in. Uh, so I provide those. And then I keep going, right? Maybe I want to do a, a password. So I'll provide the password. I'll do password123 because I'm all about security. Uh, and then I'll do maybe what shell they're going to use. They're going to use slash bin slash ZSH. And then maybe I'll do a, a user ID. I'll hard set that, 1001. And, oh, a username, they probably need that, so I'll throw that here in the end. This command got so long that it's wrapped around my screen. Okay, this is the right command, this is yeah. it, but it's wrapped around the screen and it's getting kind of hard to deal with, right? So when you're dealing with a, a, a large command like this, it can actually be a lot easier to break it up into multiple lines. And so what you can do is anytime you want to break to another line, you just add a backslash like this. And that tells the shell, hey, I'm going to move on to this next line. Normally, when you press enter, it runs a command. But when I press enter this time, see what it did? I'm still in the first prompt. I'm not in a new prompt. I'm still continuing the command that I just ran. And I like to do this with each command line argument. So I can say dash D. This is going to be the home directory, right? So that'll be slash home slash J Doe. And then I'll do another backslash. And now I can do the next argument. The next argument was dash E. When's it going to expire? And so I'll put in the expiration date and another backslash, right? Uh, and then we'll, you know, just kind of keep running with that dash G for J Doe. That was the group that I wanted him to be in. And I, I won't do them all, but you guys see where I can, I kind of break them up on a line. This makes it a little more manageable, a little easier to see on the screen. In a script, you wouldn't care how long the command was. But when you're doing it by hand, sometimes in a terminal, you just don't have a lot of screen real estate. This makes life a lot easier. And I can do that. And when I get to a line and I don't put a backslash, that's when it's going to step in and it's actually going to run the command. And so when I do that one, now it knows, oh, time to run the command. Okay. And it tried to run the jdo command 
And when it did, it, it sought permission denied, right? Because I didn't sue to it. I didn't run it as administrator. But if I hit my up arrow to bring up my history, look at that. It's all one line, right? It processes it as one line. So this is simply a visual change. By doing those backslashes like that, it's a visual thing to help us as humans to get that data entry put in there and get it right and make it look nice. The computer, it's going to string it all together in one line and then run it. So that's, that's basically a multi-line command. Uh, Don, I love that to death. That is great. And I really like the way that you do it with the, every option has its own line. It really makes it easy to, to follow and read what exactly you're trying to do. And then if you, you make any mistakes, you just look back at your output. Now, we talk about that. You, you, you said this. If I go back to my history, that history is a very, it seems like a mundane thing, but it's actually very important and very helpful. And there's a lot of powerful ways in which we can use our history, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you, we haven't really talked about history no. in, uh, in all these episodes, so let's talk about it now. Um, when you type a command, the shell remembers it. It remembers your command. It maintains a history of all the commands that you've typed. And you can just easily use your keyboard to view that history. You can press up, the up arrow, and you're scrolling backwards through all the commands that you've run. Or you can press down, and now you're scrolling forward. So you can scroll back and forth through all the commands you've run that session, right? It's a nice way if you maybe had a little typo, you can just hit that up arrow, and then you can go and fix the typo, and then you're back in business. Uh, maybe you're in a shell that doesn't support uh, arrow keys, right? There's some that don't, uh, especially when you're remoting into a terminal. Uh, so there's some keyboard shortcuts for this as well. You can do Control P and Control N. Control P for the previous command, Control N for the next command. So previous and next kind of makes sense, which is odd. Uh, <laughs> so the Control P and Control N to be able to scroll back and forth between those and be able to see everything that you run before. But I'll tell you, one of the most handy ways to do this is to actually just type history. That's the history command, and it will show you all of the commands that you've typed. And so we can see from the beginning of the episode where I started running Midnight Commander and, and Nano and, and all those and putting them in the background, I can see where I did that. And then we can see where I started running uname and chaining commands and then the multi-line command, which doesn't show as multi-line because the, the system strung it all together. But I can see everything that I typed right there to be able to look at it and recall it and get that information. So the history command is a great way to view that. But we can go even further with it, right? With the history command, I'm not just limited to being able to scroll up and scroll down like that. If I want to try and run a command again, like maybe I want to try and add jdoe again, all right, what you can do from your command line is you can type an exclamation point, and the exclamation point lets the system know that you want to work with the history command, all right? And then you can type the number of a previous command. So that user add command for me was command number 28. So if I do an exclamation point and then type 28, it's going to rerun that line, and it shows me the line. It shows me the command that it ran, and then I got permission denied again because I'm not an administrator. But it ran it, so I can easily do that with any of them. If I want to view my jobs, that was number 13, right? So I can say exclamation point 13, and that lists my jobs. Or, or whatever else it is that I want to do. I want to launch gedit again. I can do exclamation point 16, and there it goes, launching gedit just like we did before. So being able to view that history and recall those commands is pretty nice. It saves you a lot of typing, and it does give you a chance to go in there and, and fix typos that you might have had or, or whatever. Yeah, Don, speaking of saving typing, here's one of my – I do this all the time, and I always want to flog myself for doing it because I can't believe I never remember to do this. When I need to run elevated privileges, I'll type in these long commands for whatever it is I'm doing, and I forgot to put sudo, right? I just forgot. I hit enter. And now I have to type it in again. Or I've got to up to my last history and then move over. I can use some command shortcuts if I know them, but mm -hmm. probably just using arrow to arrow over this massive command. So I can type sudo in again. There's a, a neat little shortcut built in, and it saves my bacon all the time. I'll, <laughs> let, you, I'll let you hammer it home. Sure. So, uh, so let's say I had a command that I wanted to run as, as an administrator, and I, I didn't, right? So I, maybe uh, I'll just run who am I to, to illustrate the point. Uh, and so when I run it, it, it runs as me, right? And, oh. I got a job ending there. There we go. Uh, so I run who am I, and, and it shows it's running as deep as that. I'm like, oh, shoot, I meant to run that as an administrator, right? Well, I could press the up arrow, and, or, you know, we'll, we'll take that user ad because that one's actually long, right? So I run it, I get an error, right? I could press the up arrow and then hold the left arrow to scroll back, right? Or, or maybe I'm a keyboard junkie, so I do Control P to get the previous command, and then you've got Control A to jump to the beginning. Mm. That's nice if I remember it, and I can say sudo, right? But what's even better is... In the history world, 
if you do exclamation point, exclamation point, that reruns your previous command. So I had user add as my previous command. So if I do exclamation point, exclamation point, it reruns it. Even better though, I could type sudo exclamation, exclamation. Now it's going to rerun that same command, but it's going to run it as root. So for example, if I do who am I, that ran as dpossess. But if I do sudo exclamation, exclamation, it's going to rerun who am I, and it runs it as root. So real quick way, if you get, no matter how long your command was, it could wrap around the screen five times, and you just do sudo bang bang, and then there we go, and it runs with those elevated privileges. So really handy way to do that uh, in a neat way. It, you can also use this if you like forget an argument, like mm -hmm. I want to run uname dash a, I, I want to see what kernel I'm running, and instead I, I just run uname, whoops, I, I forgot <laughs> the dash a, so I, I need to add dash a to it. Uh, and so if I want to do that, I could just say exclamation point, exclamation point, dash a. So run the same command I just ran, but add a dash a to the end, and now I get the output that I want. So quick, easy way to interact with that. And you can do that with any of the history commands. So if I'm looking at my history, and I see where I ran uh, D message, right, it was number 25, right? So if I were to, to call up number 25 like this, there's D message, right? But oh, I really wanted to pipe that into less. Well, I could just say exclamation point 25, and then pipe that into less. And so now I'm going to rerun that same command. And that's useful if you run one and you don't realize it's going to be a flood of information. You can just say, oh, let me quit that. And then I'll rerun it like that and then pipe that into less or, or wherever it is that you want it to go. Quick way to, to easily redo that. So really neat stuff there when it comes to manipulating your history. Uh, now, go ahead. Uh, let me just add one quick thing about this. History is tied to your session. And so if I close my session, this history goes away. And when I log in again, I get an all new session which means an all-new history. Some distros have started writing your history to a file, right? If you look in your home directory, if you do like an ls-la, and look, you may have a file in there called .bash underscore history. There's mine right there, okay? And as you run your history commands, or as you run your commands, when you log out, a lot of operating systems will start to write to that file. So when you log in the next time, your history is still there. That's kind of nice, okay? So some of them don't do it automatically, though. And you can make the system do it by saying history dash w. Dash w is for write. I want to write my history to a file. And that's going to make sure that it gets committed so that the next time I log in, the very first command I could run is history, and all of my previous commands would pop up and show up there. So history dash w, really handy for that. All right, Don. Well, that moves us into the last thing that we have for the show. Very interesting. I think this is one of the crowning jewels of working in the Linux system, and it's because Linux is meant to be very configurable, right? It's meant to be the way you like it. And a lot of times, and I, I, you've talked about this as well, uh, things like ls command, I want to add certain options, or I always add those options. Mm -hmm. And Linux, they give us the ability to make it to where it always runs that option through a a little command that they give us, correct? Absolutely, yeah. You know, we have aliases mm -hmm. where you can create your own custom name for any command, right? I, I used to do this for the ones that I would always type wrong. There were, there were some that <laughs> yeah. I would just always spell them wrong. So, uh, you know, in the in the Unix world, it's an old command now, but you used to have ifconfig, which uh, is still there, ifconfig. Uh, if you work in the Windows world, the command is ipconfig. And I would move between Windows and Linux so much that sometimes I would screw up. So I started creating an alias so that anytime I ran ipconfig, it would just call ifconfig and, and save me the screw up. Um, it doesn't matter now because the ifconfig is going away. Uh, but you can create aliases to map any name to any command. Uh, and, and it's pretty handy. What you do is you just type alias and then the command that you want to overwrite. Okay. So for example, I might want to overwrite uh, if or not ifconfig, ipconfig, right? So that's the command that I keep running. I want it to run as ifconfig. And so then you can say equals and a single tick for a quote mark and whatever command you want it to actually run. So I want it to run ifconfig instead, right? So now when I screw up and type the wrong thing, it's going to make me type the right thing. Now before I do that, let me just clear that out. I'm going to run ipconfig, command not found, right? It doesn't exist in Linux. Then I'm going to run alias, ipconfig equals ifconfig. And now when I run ipconfig, it says, oh, you meant to run ifconfig, and it runs it. That's one example of using an alias. I, 
over the years, you learn your commands, you stop screwing up, so you don't need it that way. <laughs> but where I use it are uh, command line arguments, right? Like I, I rarely want just ls. I almost always want ls-lah, right? I want the long output, I want to show all files, even hidden files, and I want it to be human readable file sizes. That's what I want, lah, right? So I have to type that every time, and that's annoying, right? I could just say alias ls equals, and then I'll do a single tick, and tell it that I actually mean that to be ls-lah, right? And when I do that, now whenever I run ls, it actually runs it the way that I wanted it to. And it lays it out here, and I see all the files and information laid out nice and neat. And I, I might even want to go a little bit further and add like a dash dash color equals auto, because I lost my coloring in that one. Uh, and so I can add that to it, or, or whatever else it is that I need to make that alias work the way that I want. And now when I look at it, I get long output, and it's nice and colorized, and all I had to run was ls. Right? Now, quick word of, of, of caution about this. Aliases are a temporary thing. So the moment I log out, the aliases go away. We're going to do another episode on environment variables and how we can make these things persist between sessions. But just using the alias command like this is temporary. So you really want to put it into a login script so that every time you log in, the aliases are recreated. And you already have some of those, whether you know it or not. If you just run the alias command, It'll show you any aliases you've already got. And you'll see the ones that I made. There's the, uh, uh, the alias for IP config right there. But there's other aliases like egrep and fgrep. I didn't make those. But the system has them anyway. They've been created. Uh, and that's because somebody at Red Hat, in my case, decided to go ahead and put those there. If you're running Ubuntu, you may see different ones. If you're running Debian, you'll see different ones just based on uh, you know, whatever it is that, that was set up for your system. Well, Don, you named this uh, other useful commands, and uh, is definitely what it is. There's a lot of great useful commands that are inside of our Linux systems. They're going to help us navigate, help us get around the place a whole lot easier, empower us to use the system in uh, a, a better way that's more convenient, more efficient. So we just have to be aware of those things that are in there. And Don, you did a fantastic job of showing us today some of those commands that lie, are lurking around inside of our Linux box. Don, any parting words before we close the show today? Well, I tried to cover a lot of stuff that I use, you know, things that, that make my life a little better. Um, be careful as you, as you start to find tools and utilities that you really enjoy. I always try and stick with ones that are standard, that are core utilities, ones that I know are going to be there no matter what system I get on. When you start creating a bunch of aliases, what happens when you go to a system that doesn't have those aliases? Now that that's gone, and you can have a really hard time. So I try not to rely on them too much, or if you do rely on them a lot, start carrying a thumb drive with a little script <laughs> file that creates those aliases real quick. Uh, or, or something of that nature, but you don't want to lean on them too much. But there are a ton of built-in utilities that really can help you and make that command line environment a lot more friendly to use. So just explore around, mess around with them, you'll find that uh, it's actually pretty neat what you can do in there. Well, words of wisdom from Don Pizzette. Uh, my party boards would be check the man files for each one of these commands. <laughs> they have a lot of great information inside of them. They might do something you ever even realized they could do and make your whole lot, life a whole lot easier. I know I found that to be true for myself. Don, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time and effort as always. And as always, we appreciate you good folks out there for watching. But looking at the clock, we have exhausted the time for yet another great show. Thanks for joining us. Signing off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.